Chapter 1. Aiden Strong. Aiden's PV. The thing with shock is that it leaves you mute, reaction-wise. You're hit with this intense focus on nothing. Instead of your brain not computing, it computes everything till the end result is nothing. My name is Aiden Strong and I am not crazy. My name is Aiden Strong and I am not crazy. My name is Aiden Strong and I. Duck. A body tackled me out of the way of an attack that left the wooden crates behind me a mess of wrecked goods. Is that a cabbage? Who puts a cabbage? The cabbage was stepped on by a scaly foot and a packet with a white substance spilled out. Cocaine. Oh. I felt something roughly pull me up and throw me behind it. Get out of here. You idiot. Run. The young boy who said that was dressed in a very familiar outfit. Red, green, black, and yellow. Robin. I muttered. Yes. I don't have the time to sign you an autograph, and that will probably never happen if you get yourself killed. Full clarity finally hit me like an 18-wheeler. Oh god, that's Killer Croc. I scrambled back in fear as the Batman ducked a hasty haymaker that broke through the concrete pillar of the warehouse we were in and in a swift action planted a device on Croc's chest. Batman then flipped over him. There was an explosion and Croc was launched off right into a kick on the small of the back from the Dark Knight. I had the time to gawk at the expert display in gymnastics before going right back to panicking when. Gah. Stay still you little shit. A hail of bullets escaped the firearms of a few generic thugs hiding behind a black SUV. I counted four with three more unconscious right next to them. I crouched right behind an empty container and closed my ears. I had never heard gunshots before. What? The? Fuck dot is. Happening. There was a loud snarl and growl and I saw Croc's body sail over my head to grasp at the rafters of the warehouse. Another loud sound was the clang on the container itself as Batman jumped off it and shot a line. A swing later and he followed Killer Croc outside the building. I scampered up and ran off towards the entrance to the building. And immediately shouted in fright when a bullet hit the ground right in front of me. My shirt was grabbed from behind and I flailed in fear before my back hit the container I had been hiding behind it before. You're seriously still here? You must have a death wish. There was a continuous spray of bullets that hit the container. Stop, stop, you fools. Don't finish your mags before we get the boy wonder. The same guy with the gun who had talked earlier said. Stay here and don't move. I have a few suckers to educate on why guns and foolish hands is wrong. Robin told me with a small upturn on his lips. I nodded dumbly and he patted my shoulder before throwing a few birdarangs on the only source of light in the warehouse. The light bulb shattered and the whole building was plunged into darkness, the only source of light being the moon shining through the hole made by Killer Croc while escaping Batman. Smart guy. I glanced around trying to widen my eyes and see. Robin had disappeared and a few seconds later the sound of birdarangs cutting through the air, shouts of people cursing out and bodies hitting the ground and more gunshots ringing out was all I could hear. A few more bodies hit the ground until I saw a lone man running towards the entrance of the warehouse. I looked back and saw nothing but darkness. Logic dictates that you stay with the good guys, Aiden. Robin is terrifying, but he's not going to hurt you like he did those men. Please don't. I ignored my own advice and found myself running desperately towards the entrance door, right before the guy in front of me fell down from a birdarang hitting his trouser on the side and then digging into the concrete, effectively taking him down. What level of skill did it take for someone to do something like that? No, no, I'm out. I increased my running speed much to the shouts of my savior. Wait, don't. The penguin. I didn't listen and just ran. The road to my salvation was so near and then I rushed through it to freedom only to step right in front of almost a dozen guns. Pointed. Straight. At. Me. My hands came up quicker than my brain could register. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. A guy stepped forward and stared at me. He was dressed in a fancy suit with a pistol in hand. You're not Bats or his little sidekick. Who the fuck are you? My huh. Name is Aiden Strong, sir. And, and I don't know how I got here. I was watching a movie in my apartment, and then the next thing I know, I'm in a warehouse dodging bullets and watching a showdown between Killer Croc and the frickin' Batman. There was a brief silence as he nodded holstered the gun on his hip and lit up a cigarette. The smoke twisted in the air slowly, while he took in a slow but long drag. I believe you. A couple of tears escaped my eyes as the feeling of relief overwhelmed me. But I still can't let you go. Sorry, kid. Penguin wants everything happening here to be hush-hush. Quicker than my eyes could see the gun was back in his hand, and I didn't hear the blast but more like felt it. A cold feeling spread through my chest as I spared an incredulous look at the growing spot of red soaking my blue, Ghostbusters t-shirt and blood. Something warm rose up uncontrollably through my throat, and I knelt as my vision got hazy. The last thing I saw wasn't my murderer, nor was it Robin or Batman. It was a pulsing white light, beating like a heart, everything having faded from my sight. I reached out with my hand. It was so beautiful. I wish I could hold it. Robin's POV. Damn it. Batman is gonna kill me for this. Robin thought while fighting the last of the mooks so that he could go after the civilian that had appeared from nowhere during the fight with Killer Croc and the Penguin Gang. Something was going down, Robin's detective mind told him. Penguin wasn't one to work with high-profile villains like Killer Croc. A clown dressed in Superman colors and wearing a power armor would have been more discreet than Croc, that's for sure. So whatever the smuggled goods were, they were enough for the Penguin to bring in muscle of Killer Croc's caliber. That's bad. Robin smashed a knee on the goon's face and followed it up with a sweep that brought the guy to the floor with a thud. 
A zip tie appeared in hand in a practiced motion and the guy was immobilized quickly. Then Robin was off. He arrived just as a shot rang out. Cursing, he jumped behind the few crates on the entrance and watched as the young man he'd been trying to save fell to his knees. Robin's eyes widened in horror. No. There he is, boss. A voice shouted and was immediately followed by a storm of bullets that made Robin roll away. He was mad. At the situation, Bruce for insisting on chasing after Killer Croc, Penguin for being the cause of this entire thing, the dead boy who had probably just been a little older than him and most of all, he was mad at himself. Robin threw a few smoke pellets on the ground and during the confusion, a few birdarangs shot out of the obscure position. Unfortunately, the birdarangs were accurately shot out of the air and Robin settled on a terrifying conclusion that made him eliminate any lines of sights to his position. The only sniper who could shoot like that despite the smoke was Deadshot. Deadshot was under Penguin's payroll too? Damn it. Deadshot wasn't a C-lister like the goons in the Penguin mob. Deadshot was deadly. Let's box him in. Bring out the grenade launcher. Our backup will make sure we get him this time. What? Grenade launcher? What about the goods in the warehouse? Of course. Robin almost smacked himself for his stupidity. Penguin would want to erase all evidence of his involvement. The smell of gunpowder filled the air and Robin started getting worried. He couldn't leave his hiding place because Deadshot would no doubt tag him. He needed a distraction. As if to answer his prayers, a whoosh of air exploded outside the warehouse. The gust cleared out the smoke and sent men flying away from its epicenter. Then the shout started. Guns began spitting out bullets as everything descended into chaos. Robin ran out of the building and barely avoided a huge piece of rock from smashing into him. He rolled away and escaped the flames licking his cape. His costume might have been highly resistant, but he didn't want to bet on just how resistant. He flipped away, rebounded from the wall to jump on a streetlight then shot a hook line to the next building over. The line pulled on his body, but the trajectory was thrown off when a huge gust of wind magnitudes bigger than the last one carried him away. His young body hit the wall and breath left his lungs. His eyes watched on in shock as the boy from before floated in the air. A bubble of air enclosed his body, with rings of water, stones and fire surrounding the air bubble. Gone was the brown eyes and in their place were glowing white orbs. Men were cowering behind overturned cars. Some were bleeding. One was smashed to pulp by a rock and two others were burnt beyond recognition. Robin realized offhandedly that those men were dead. That man never killed, no matter who the villain was or what they'd done. He broke bones but never killed. Ball rose up, and he vomited on the ground next to him. Anger marred the features on the now alive boy, and when he raised his hand hell was unleashed. The Avatar had arrived in D.C. Chapter 2. The Justice League. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. I came to with a groan of pain. My throat felt parched and scratchy. I fluttered my eyes open and winced at the bright lights. Here you go. A soft voice said and a glass of water was added to my hand. I immediately brought it my mouth and took a mouthful of the precious natural liquid. Hey hey easy. The glass was only taken from my hands after I was done with it. Having fought valiantly and stubbornly without any pleading or begging. Let no one tell you otherwise. After I was done with the water, I looked at the other occupant in the room and gaped at just how beautiful she was. Huh. Hi. I lamely said. If this is how angels wake people up in heaven then thank God I was religious. The woman was blonde, with black lipstick, a black costume, and, wait, black canary? I asked tentatively, my brain finally catching up. I was having some heavy suspicions on who she actually was. She nodded and rose up from the chair. I'm glad to see you're awake. Do you remember anything? My heart started hammering in my chest as I processed the implications of standing, well more like lying in front of a fictional character. Her question also triggered my most recent memories and I started breathing heavily. I was in a fictional world. I was in, crap, I was in D.C. Going by the looks of Canary and her voice, Robin's relatively young age and snarky attitude, I must be in Young Justice. A half-forgotten cartoon I'd watched out of boredom. All things considered it wasn't the worst of all DC universes, so I was relatively safe. For now that is. Can I use the bathroom? I asked her, and she nodded, helping me up. She then directed me to a door on the left side of the bed, and I entered. Before I could close the door, she placed a hand on my shoulder, and I turned to look at her in question. I'll be back with someone to do a checkup on you and make sure you're completely fine. I nodded, not really opposed to the idea. Besides, how else would I get the answers to my questions if I didn't cooperate with them? Acting stubborn would only increase Batman's suspicions at me and from what I knew about the guy, that was one way to make your life harder. I patted myself down. I had a hole on my chest last I checked. A hole made by a bullet. One would think that being from the dangerous part of L.A., guns and such would be something that I was familiar with even from just a passing glance, but that couldn't be far from the truth. I had friends who had friends who were involved in crime, but most folks were just trying to live their lives normally. A word that I couldn't use so casually anymore. In fact, how did I even get here? I remember my whole life, so the chances of a ROB messing with my memories and personality was minimal. I was also in my original body. Dark skin, brown eyes, messy hair and a taper fade. Five feet eight and a slim build from long hours playing basketball. What's next for me, I wonder? I splashed a few cups worth of water on my face and swallowed the sudden lump that appeared in my throat. I wouldn't cry. Like Dad always says, make the best out of every situation. I knew it wouldn't and couldn't be easy, but you know what? 
It is what it is, and crying like a little bitch wouldn't solve anything. As if to reward me for reaffirming my will, a piece of folded paper suddenly appeared in a flash and lazily drifted to my open palm. I unfolded it and read, Congratulations. Due to your universe achieving 500 universal cycles and planet, Earth reaching a milestone by producing over a quadrillion number of sentient creatures, one lucky schmuck has been chosen for a never-before-seen chance. A. Hey. Multiversal Ambassador. You, in case you haven't figured it out yet, are that lucky schmuck. Interact with the people of this universe and stand a chance to win. And if you win, then you get to be a divided by divided by times pi in pi in degree times carat dollar underscore hashtag dollar dash six. Get it? All this is geared to help you. A system was tailor-made for you that was judged to be just right for this world. Do not fret however if you feel like it's limiting, achieve different milestones and power will follow you soon after. Excelsior. Young Aiden, and like your name, be strong. P.S. You'll probably never hear from us again. We have a shitload of work to do but luckily the system is fully automated and draws the energy to keep itself running from what the humans of this world call the bleed. The program is very very advanced, no one and nothing will notice it. P.P.S. Although the potential for your growth is limitless, do note that the system will not stray from its core functions. No crafting if the system is meant for fighting. P.P.S. No one will be watching so don't get yourself killed too soon before you reach divided by divided by times pi in pi in degree times carat dollar underscore hashtag dollar dash six kid. P.P.P.P.S. This is the final one I promise. Your chosen system is the avatar system. Not only that but also for reaching the milestone out of depth and into a whole other universe you get. Adaptable body. Look at the system interface to learn more. I finished reading the whole piece of paper and sat on the toilet seat numbly. The paper burst into flames and I jumped a little before sitting down again and hugging myself. I gently started giggling. Out of the quadrillion people who have supposedly existed over the course of 500 universal cycles, I get chosen? Me? I mean, what qualifications did they even use? The guy with nappiest hairstyle of all time? All I can say is I didn't use to look this good forever. The door to the hospital room I was in opened and I knew it was my cue to leave the bathroom. So you know what? I'm not going to care about any of that stuff. As long as these beings didn't affect my life, I would live it as I saw fit out of sight, out of mind, and all that. I straightened out my hospital gown and left the bathroom. A few new additions were standing before my bed. One, a man dressed in an all-black bat costume, Batman obviously, another in the iconic red, blue, and yellow, Superman, and the last, dressed in a red costume munching on a Snickers bar, The Flash. Real-life superheroes in the flesh, wonder what they'll open the conversation with? I didn't hear you flush. The Flash joked and I chuckled. I've always liked his sense of humor. Not the timing though, given by the look Batman sent his way. The Flash looked away and said, well, I love the decor. Superman snorted while Batman's glare intensified. I'm just going to wait outside. The fastest man left the room in the blink of an eye. Batman leveled his gaze back at me. We need to talk. He pulled up a chair towards the small table near the bed and placed a laptop on top of it. A logo of Wayne Tech appeared on the screen and I swallowed a snort. Bruce then clicked on a video on the screen and my eyes bulged out of their sockets. What? That's you. I felt like shouting at him. I can see that, but chose to focus on the screen instead. I was floating in mid-air. A bubble of air surrounding me, rings of fire, earth and water enclosed the bubble. The four elements. The avatar state. I watched as I demolished the warehouse from before with a wave of my hand. Concrete broke free from the pavement and pelted the men running away in panic. A huge rock smashed a man into pulp and I felt like vomiting after seeing the blood pool on the ground. I snarled and flames chased after a few men and burned them to a crisp. The camera evaded a huge rock and changed position. The last take they had of me before the footage ended was a black figure jumping in to stop me. I had a hand on my mouth as I looked at Batman. I, I don't remember any of that. That doesn't change the fact that you took the lives of three people and injured six others, including Robin. It was like a gut punch once he delivered the last line. Robin was hurt? God, is he all right? I swear I never meant for any of that to happen. Superman placed a hand on Batman's shoulder, cutting off whatever he wanted to say next. He grinded his teeth and placed a bag on top of the bed. Inside there's a change of clothes. Get cleaned up and Superman here will walk you to the cafeteria to get something to eat. After that, we will continue this conversation. Saying that, Batman turned around and walked off. Superman sighed as the door closed and patted me on the shoulder. Don't worry about him. He's just been very worried about Robin. I shook my head, still feeling awful. No, I understand. It's just that. Superman sat on the table as I trailed off. He's like that with everybody, so don't let it get you down, kid. It's Aiden. Aiden Strong. Superman smiled widely. Cool name. I'm Superman. We shared a laugh and slowly I calmed down. I was loath to bring it up once more, but it needed to be said. I really don't remember doing any of that. He nodded understandingly. When I got my powers, I almost hurt the people I care about. So I know what you must be feeling. What's done is done, and you can only move forward and make up for your past actions by doing something meaningful with your new powers. No one blames you for what happened Aiden so don't blame yourself. There's nothing as bad as holding on to guilt. It eats you from the inside. 
He got off from the table and smiled that million-dollar smile again. Now then, how about you get cleaned up, and I'll introduce you to the rest of the league. Chapter 3, The Avatar System I'm going to take creative liberties with this FIC. So if Aiden finds himself in injustice, it ain't my fault. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. Superman led us through a few long hallways and I got to see the layout of the watchtower. I couldn't believe it. I was in space, staring down at the cradle of human civilization. Planet Earth was. Beautiful, right? I nodded in agreement with Superman. She is. It never gets old, you know. He said. It's a sight that always leaves me amazed. Come. You'll get other chances to watch the Earth soon. The watchtower is not going anywhere. I followed him closely behind. The wonderful sight I just witnessed changed my perspective on things. On the walk to the cafeteria, I was already giddy at the prospects of what I could achieve. I was in a fictional world for God's sakes. That meant, I wasn't restricted by the mundane anymore. I could. I could be a hero. No, that's too shallow a goal. I could be the greatest hero in the world. Many would kill to be in my shoes. So no more whining, no more crying, no more doubting myself. It was with a new resolve that we finally made it to the cafeteria. The place was huge and almost deserted. Almost, because of the scarlet speedster munching on cupcakes and a silver-colored man with a red star on his chest reading the newspaper. Soups. There you are. Batman said to tell you about the meeting. I was supposed to come get you, but... Flash gestured to the cupcakes. I got a bit distracted. Superman smiled and nodded at the other man present. Captain. Hello, Superman. So this our current guest? Superman lightly pushed me forward. Aiden meet Captain Adam. Captain, this is Aiden Strong. I reached out a hand to shake his hand and my palm disappeared in his huge one. Strangely, his skin didn't feel as cold as it looked. Nice to meet you, son. His voice was strong and I remembered he used to be in the army once. I nodded, but before I could say anything else, the Flash wished in. Hey there. We already met, but I didn't introduce myself. I'm Flash, you know, the fastest man alive. I blinked. Oh uh, yeah, I'm Aiden Strong. The most confused guy alive, I guess. I added lamely, not expecting the laughter from Flash. Even Superman chuckled. I looked at them strangely. Was the bar set for jokes this low in this world, or are they just fans of dad jokes? Superman patted me on the shoulder. Get something to eat. We'll talk some more after I'm done with the meeting. I nodded, and they all turned to leave. Flash waved at me lazily, and I smiled at his antics. I went over to the counter and marveled at the automatic setup of the cafeteria. The league didn't have a live and chef, but after biting into the burger, I was ready to pledge my undying loyalty to the one who had made the food. My plate cleared out quickly, and I finally had some time to think about the message I had gotten. It was time to check the avatar system. Menu. Instantly, a screen appeared in my vision. The avatar system. Bending styles, air, unlocked. Fire, locked. Earth, locked. Water, locked. Perks, adaptable body. There was a plus sign on each of the major elements. I pressed on it, and for each element a section opened up. Air mastery level, beginner. Locked, locked. Fire mastery level, locked. Locked, locked. Earth mastery level, locked. Locked, locked, locked. Water mastery level, locked. Locked, locked. Locked. NB. To unlock more bending styles, get the current bending style to master level. To do that, unlock the sub elements of each element. I nodded in understanding. The outline of the whole screen was very straightforward. All I had to do to get access to fire bending was master wind bending. But what about the avatar state? How did I achieve it if I didn't have past lives? And what were the conditions to use it? I would have appreciated some answers, but whoever had brought me here had most likely forgotten about me. In the grand scale of things, I doubt powerful beings would watch me as entertainment. Which meant, I would have to figure most of this out by myself. Oh goody. Next I clicked on the adaptable body perk and a bunch of information appeared. Adaptable body your body is susceptible to different exotic stimuli. As a result, it grows to adapt to different things without any drastic change of form. Okay, that's good. So if I burn myself with fire many times, as long as I heal I'll eventually develop resistance to it? What an overpowered ability. Too bad, I don't have regeneration as a perk. Those two would pair well. Slow exposure would be the way to go then. The good thing is that I could grow stronger, faster, and more durable in the long run as my body adapted to heavy weights. Something else was bugging me, exotic stimuli, huh? My head perked up. It had been long since I'd watched the show, but wasn't there a strength serum or two? Venom? No, that's Bane's neo-steroid strength enhancer. Of course, the blockbuster formula. It came with some adverse physical deformities, but adaptable body would get rid of that for me. But if I want the very best, I think I should skip on the blockbuster serum. There was an even stronger variant that was a fusion of the blockbuster formula and venom. It was permanent. Luckily, it was one of the highlights of the show, so I remembered quite a fair bit about it. The other details were fuzzy, however. So I now have a clear direction I can take. The question remaining is what is the Justice League going to decide to do with me? And do they have Pepsi on this world? General PV. Batman was standing at the lower end of a U-shaped table. On his left side was Superman, and on the right sat Captain Marvel. He clicked the remote, and a projector placed in the open space between the two columns of the table lit up. 
a hologram of a young black kid appeared. This is the subject of today's matter. His name is Aiden Strong. He was on the scene during a fight with Penguin's men and Robin. I won't go into the details of the operation, but while I chased after Killer Croc, this happened. He clicked on the console and the footage from before started playing. Once it was done, different expressions appeared on all of them. Most were surprised at the power displayed by the young boy. He seems to have control over the four basic elements. Wind, fire, earth, and water. It's my belief that although he displayed complex manipulation of said elements, he wasn't aware of himself at that moment. I had to use knockout gas in high quantities to take him down, showing that he also has a resilient physique. Batman continued. There's one problem, however. He doesn't exist in any records or databases. No facial recognition has picked up on his face before. He's a ghost. Normally, there would be traces left of a data wipe, but nothing this clean. There was concern etched on the faces of most of the Justice League. What's your take on that, Batman? Green Arrow spoke up. Batman grunted and pressed another key on the console, leading to the hologram shifting to an image of a dozen Earths side by side. I believe that he is from an alternate Earth. There was a collective murmur of disbelief. Batman continued on regardless. Such a theory would need more looking into and input directly from the source. Superman shook his mind. That's a huge leap. Even for you, Batman. So more Earths exist? Captain Marvel wondered in excitement. Yeah. I've met a few people from alternate dimensions and traveled to others too but still bats. I agree with Superman. It's a huge leap in logic. The Flash supplied from the side. You know, we could just ask him. I doubt we can expect anything but the truth with the telepath and Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. Hell offered a suggestion. It was popular enough that most of the others nodded. Batman acquiesced to the majority's view. All right. Moving on, there's the matter of what to do with him. He's responsible for three deaths and even more injuries. The mood turned grim. The League has never condoned killing, but I think we can rule this as an act of self-defense. Surprisingly, Batman was the one to defend Aiden's actions. Superman looked at him, surprised. An expression that was shared by all the rest. They knew that Robin had gotten injured, a cracked rib, and a dislocated shoulder from an unavoidable hit from a stray rock. Superman looked proud of his closest friend. That's incredibly understanding of you. Usually you're all like, I am Batman. Flash joked, changing his voice to an intimidating grunt at the end. There was a few chuckles as Batman stared down at the Flash. Somehow this seemed like a usual occurrence. Moving. On. His abilities seemed to draw themselves out when he was already hurt, evidenced by the bloodstains on his clothes. That would suggest that they are something new to him. It's paramount that whatever we decide here takes into consideration the training of his abilities to avoid outbursts like before. I could take him in. Maybe having someone who shares the same roots and culture as a mentor would help him acclimate better to a different world. John, one of the two Green Lanterns around said. Batman nodded. That won't work, John. It would be appropriate if it wasn't for your off-world duties. Hal's words to his fellow Green Lantern made him sigh. Themyscira is out for obvious reasons, but so is the rest of the League for other various things. My suggestion is we let Red Tornado oversee his training. His power set is elemental manipulation, and that would go a long way when paired with Tornado's experience. Green Arrow rounded up to look at the Dark Knight. You're suggesting we make him a part of the Black Ops team in the works? Yes, but as a probationary member up until he gains complete control of his abilities or we decide otherwise. None refuted Batman's words and after discussing more issues regarding League business, the meeting was concluded. Chapter 4. Starting with the basics. A million more chap. Sorry. Over. Colon. Colon. Aiden's PV. I still don't get why we had to leave the watchtower for this. Red Tornado ignored my complaints and floated towards the training room. So far we had passed by the kitchen, meeting hall, the showers, and personal rooms. The watchtower is for league members and associates only. Your previous stay was due to the unique circumstances. He finally decided to answer. I rolled my eyes. So after you guys finished interrogating me, you decided to kick me out of the Underoos Club? I feel used. Negative. The Batman suggested. Bringing you down to Earth would help you get used to a new planet by spending time with other people. Preferably, your age mates. He probably meant the sidekicks. Problem was I hadn't even met one except for Robin, and that didn't count because I was screaming my ass off during our first meeting. Oh, and I was also responsible for his injuries, so. That aside. The interrogation had been surprisingly tame compared to what I had been expecting of Batman. They already knew or guessed I was from another world, so I just rolled with the information they already had and told them about the League from my version of the Earth being relatively newer as compared to here. They had me write down some of the things I could remember about their alternate selves, and I wrote general stuff that a normal civilian would know. There was the threat of being found out about the information I had by the Martian Manhunter, so I had projected my reasons for lying to him. Hello, John. I'd begun. By the subtle widening of his eyes while standing behind Batman, I knew he'd heard me. Meanwhile, my hand hadn't stalled for a single second during that time, writing down some of the villains I knew they had faced already. I don't know if you've read my mind or not, but this world is based on a comic book in my world, so I guess you understand why I couldn't share that information with the whole collective. I know it's your duty as a Justice League member to inform the others, but I fear that such a delicate issue would be better handled with discretion. I could feel his shock ripple through the link he had made with my mind. I urge you to only share this with Batman. 
I'll answer any questions you have after you've taken my opinion into account and come to a logical conclusion. Luckily, John had acted like nothing had happened and after a while I was done. There were inconsistencies that Batman picked up on and combined with what I had told John. I could expect to see the Dark Knight soon. The truth is, I was doing this for my own safety as well. I would rather Batman, Mr. Suspicion Incarnate know this early on rather than finding out about it due to his detective skills. Giving him the chance to decide whether to tell the rest of the League would keep the responsibility off my shoulders and I could focus fully on training my powers. The easy part was that I could guess what he would decide. Probably something along the lines of asking me to tell him everything and then file it away and start countermeasures on any future threats. That would guarantee me a level of trust from him as well as a healthy suspicion on my true intentions. A good balance. He would keep me close and offer the best training for me that the League could offer because of the value of what I knew and the power I possessed. I hated using what I knew of his personality to plan around him and the others, but I couldn't afford to half-ass this. In fact, building my own mental shields was paramount. Apart from John Johns, his niece Miss Martian and Simon could read my mind. I could take advantage of my adaptive physiology and have Miss Martian regularly intrude into my mind. Adapting to those intrusions, I can then build my mental shields up stronger. It would take a lot of time but with patience, my mind would become an impenetrable fortress. We reached the training room and passed it. Wait, I thought we were going to test out my powers? I asked, confused. We are. The android said in that same blank tone I had already gotten used to. I looked back at the door we were leaving behind. We were never meant to do it in the training room, were we? I swear I caught a hint of amusement from Tornado as he replied. No, that was just your assumption. So, where are we going exactly? The beach. The open area will be suitable and prevent damage to any equipment in case things get out of hand. Annoyance showed itself on my face. Is that what the League thinks is going to happen? That I'm going to go all rage god again. He didn't answer and floated silently as before, leaving me to my thoughts. It was when we appeared behind the mountain complex that I came to the obvious conclusion I had missed entirely. I snapped my fingers in realization. You were giving me a tour of the place. That's why we didn't come here directly. Red Tornado didn't have any expression on his face, but the smug was rolling off him in waves. You finally caught on. Good. You'll be responsible for giving the tour to your peers once they arrive. This is meant to be your base of operation. I nodded. Batman had also informed me of the team being put together. They were supposed to be brought here in a week. Robin will probably have already healed by then. The League's medical expertise was pretty good. Break a bone? Green Lantern lines up the broken bone in surgical precision. Wayne Industries and LexCorp had also made huge strides in the medical practice that my normal Earth wouldn't see for the next 20 years. Red Tornado floated to a small distance away from me and stopped. A gentle wave lapped onto the shore as a slow breeze blew through my clothes. I was dressed in a red t-shirt and black shorts. Knowing what the business was for today, my shoes and socks were put away, and I settled into an airbender stance similar to Bagua Zhang. The style emphasized the concept of flow. Maneuvering around objects to avoid direct confrontation while still controlling the motion of the fight. Being free like the air. All this was supplied by my innate airbending powers. I didn't have a teacher to teach me the forms, but that was the good thing about airbending. It was freeing. Let's begin with a demonstration of what you can do. I nodded at Red Tornado and breezed in and out. I sank into the breeze blowing slightly and tried to beckon it. The breeze escaped my grasp, and I reduced my aggressiveness. It wasn't about control, it was about manipulation. My left leg stepped back in a circular motion, followed closely by my left hand. The sand on the beach picked up as a breeze followed behind my actions. The air ruffled my t-shirt as I completed my twirl in a complete 360 degrees. My right hand picked up the breeze and the palm exploded out in a swift action. The breeze turned to a torrential wave of wind that sent sand and dust flying away in front of me. Well, I muttered in fascination as the aggression in the wind petered out to nothing leaving behind the soft breeze from before. You seem to have basic understanding of wind manipulation. You can't force it to do your bidding. Its very nature opposes that. Now let's try a spar. Red Tornado was an android of few words, so I nodded and breathed in, watching him intently. I wasn't sure, but I think that he was an air elemental. There was no way I could beat him in that. But I didn't need to beat him. I just needed to learn and get better. I waved my hand a blast of air fanned out towards him. The wind was nullified into nothing before it could even get close. The dust and sand picked up by the attack provided enough cover for me to sprint towards him. I got within range and jumped. I manipulated the air to give me a push, and I found myself five meters above him. My leg lashed out in an air slash, but he calmly floated away from the attack. My arm then shot off to the side and pushed my body away on the air, bringing me closer to Tornado. Tornado's hand came up, and a swirling mass of red wind hit my body, throwing me back. Oof. I used the air to slow my descent, but I still landed on the beach painfully. Do you know what you did wrong? He asked, floating calmly towards me. I was busy trying to breathe though, so he decided to answer. You left yourself open before a superior opponent. Fighting in the air is a different skill from doing it on land. It's an environment suited for those with free range of movement. Something you currently lack. To put it in human terms, you're not quite there yet, champ. It's official. Red Tornado can joke. I turned myself over and rose up to my knees while feeling dizzy. He was right. That move had been fancy but completely unnecessary. 
I looked back at him. My determination is strong as ever. Again. Chapter 5. Hero Name and Costume. Hop on over to the VIP lounge and enjoy yourself. Over. Colon, colon. General PV. That man walked out of the Zeta tube in silent contemplation. The introduction of the young team to Mount Justice was only two days away. That man wondered how that would go. Robin and the others were insistent on having more responsibility heaped on their shoulders. They didn't have an idea of what they were asking for. No, having them act as a black ops team would be better. Batman himself would vet their missions and little by little as they matured, so with the trust to handle more, be given. He had no doubt they would step up to the challenge. Having them become a part of the Justice League was currently ill-advised, especially given the fact that their enemies had grown smarter, careful and less visible. They were operating in the open yet hidden, partnering up and shoring each other's weaknesses. The shipment with Penguin was a cache of altered cocaine that lasted longer and with stronger effects. No trace had been found and the Penguin was hiding. Bruce could direct his considerable resources into finding out his whereabouts, but he decided to take another approach. Waiting. His contemplation moved on to why he was here today. Aiden Strong. 17 years old. Alien from another Earth. An Earth where all of their struggles was just entertainment to their masses. Batman wasn't sure what to make of that, but he did what he always did. Took it in stride and created countermeasures, in case any of the sensitive information Aiden had given them came true. It wasn't a lot, though. A few villains, invasions, and the unlikely but terrifying prospect of Superman going murder hobo after losing his wife and unborn child. Batman's hand clenched, and he stopped in place. He wouldn't let that happen. Bruce would sooner break his oath to never kill, to put the Joker down rather than see his best friend go through grief like that. That would also be the day that he would have to give up the cowl. Back to the young boy, Batman knew he didn't mean any harm. He could see a lot of loneliness in his eyes, but Aiden was bravely holding on strong. That was enough for Batman to give him a chance. Bruce knew that treating him with suspicion would only distance him, and that could turn badly. The information that Aiden contained was dangerous in the wrong hands, but what made Batman cast his vote into keeping the boy closer was his powers. Batman had seen it. The wide eyes that had stared at him during that night were filled with so much power. Superman was called a god by some, but what Bruce saw that day was more. Bruce reached the training room and found Red Tornado hovering before Aiden, who was cross-legged on a mat. His hands were outstretched, cupped in front of him a swirl of air rolling between the palms in the form of a ball. Am I interrupting something? Red Tornado turned to look at him. Batman. He nodded then continued. No, we were just getting finished for the day. He said and left the room. Batman turned his gaze to Aiden and found him scrunching his eyebrows in effort. The ball of air swirled around his body as he simultaneously jumped. The ball stabilized below him, connected to his body by one leg as the other was crossed over it. The ball then started rolling around as Aiden rode above it around the room. Batman's eyebrows rose up at the casual display of high-level air manipulation. Yes, I did it. He excitedly said before spotting Batman and directed the ball to him. The air ball disappeared and Aiden landed on the ground gracefully. You've gotten better. Batman observed. Aiden nodded his head in a little pride. Yeah, I have been practicing a lot this past week. Red Tornado has also taught me some awesome moves. It was also true. Even the level of his proficiency in the air element had gone up. Air element practitioner. Locked. Locked. He wanted to get the mastery to expert before he tried unlocking any of its sub-branches. Aiden had gotten to know how the proficiency ranking went. It was beginner, practitioner, expert, master, grandmaster. He had a feeling that he was nearing expert, and that was because of all the air manipulation exercises he had done. He had also asked Red Tornado to get him a book on the basics of Bagua Zhang. That martial art shared a lot of similarities with air bending, and once Red Tornado had gotten him the book, his skill in air bending had shot up. That's commendable. Follow me. That man said after a while. Aiden's PV. I followed after the dark night, taking the chance to study him some more. He walked with a natural grace, like a predator ready to pounce and attack. With my improvements in bending, my intellect and observational skills seemed to improve a little as well. Airbending involved a lot of meditation and maybe that had given me some more benefits. We made it to the meeting hall and right there on the table was a briefcase carrying something I had been looking forward to the entire week. I looked back at the dark night and asked, Is that what I think it is? He nodded and I jumped to study it. The briefcase opened up to reveal. This is not what I drew when you asked me to make a sketch of my super suit. I told him a little dissatisfied. Your costume idea was impractical for your powers. Currently you don't have access to the full scope of your abilities as you yourself told me. This suit will be more appropriate for the time being. I took a minute to reason it out and had to nod at what he was saying. My design was a little too ambitious. It was too outstanding in its magnificence. No cap. My design had a white hood, a dark blue sleeveless tunic that run from my neck attached to the hood, down to between my knees and a white pair of pants that were shoved into black boots. There were white bands along my open arms, two on both biceps and one above the gloves covering my palm and wrists. To top it off, on the chest was an emblem with a modernized take on the symbols of the four elements. Instead of that visual orgasm of a super suit, Batman had commissioned something else entirely. For starters, it was the same type of style as Kid Flash's costume. The difference being that most of the suit was black with white accents on the ribs. 
An emblem of air was in the middle of the chest represented by a swirling circle. For a mask, it was styled akin to Kyle Rayner's, but instead of a domino mask, a visor was in place. The whole suit looked unique if a bit average. The thing I disliked most about it was the emblem for air on the chest. It felt like, like I would undermine myself if I accepted it. I was the avatar for crying out loud, not an average airbender. What would villains think when they saw me? It was like an electric shock went through me as I turned to the dark night. You want them to underestimate me, don't you? It all made perfect sense. After seeing the upper levels of my power, Bruce had probably come up with this ruse. To put me in a costume that by all accounts wasn't a clear representation of what I could actually do given enough time. After supervillains get used to me being an airbender, bam. I hit them with fire or water or earth. Any countermeasures to beat me in the future would useless because my powers would grow and grow and grow past them all. I looked at Batman in a new light. Have you decided on a name for yourself? Batman's voice cut through my thoughts. I looked at the emblem on my new suit. Initially, I wouldn't have accepted any other name but Avatar. Looking at it from a different perspective, I didn't deserve that name yet. Batman had a point in his actions, and if there was one thing I knew about him, he never did anything without taking every single detail into account. I would trust his judgment. Maelstrom. For now, call me Maelstrom. Elsewhere. A row of screens were placed before a hidden figure. The shipment was compromised. The hidden figure said, all within expectations. One of the figure in the screen spoke. I agree. If the plan had worked out, we would have found ourselves in partnership with a very shrewd man. Another intoned. A deeper voice than the previous two supplied its own thoughts. With the penguin currently indisposed, we can place our very own tool to gain us more footing in Gotham. Another voice sighed. Batman has always moved to crush any new, ambitious forces in Gotham. He seeks to maintain the current delicate balance. The deep voice from before snorted. He is someone who strikes from the shadows and darkness. Our methods have evolved to work in the light. We need no fear. A female voice was the next to speak. Our whole purpose is for humankind to be unhindered in its growth. Every step we take has been for that sole purpose and anyone who steps in our way will be made to see the light. With that, no one else spoke and the screens went static. Lex Luthor stapled his fingers together as he thought. Not one of them asked how the plan failed. More for me then, he said to himself. On another screen was an obscured image of a floating boy with the four elements surrounding his form. The elements had messed with the picture, but the one thing they failed to hide was the glowing eyes. You're not a metahuman, are you? You're something more, Lex said to the picture. Chapter 6, Meeting the Team. Aiden Strong. I turned up the volume and bopped my head as the bass made the room shake. I powdered my hands and stretched my whole body. The training room in Mount Justice was huge, most definitely to allow enough space for every league member to work out at the same time. Not that such a thing would happen. In fact, I doubt most of them had even used it. Somehow I couldn't see Red Tornado or Captain Adam pushing weight and asking each other, do you even lift bro? Jokes aside, some of the weights went up to 5,000 tons. It was crazy that even the racks supported a few dumbbells like that. Then again, this world had some crazy stuff. Away from the superhero business, the normal everyday appliances that I had seen were futuristic back in my world. After five minutes of stretching, I looked at the obstacle course ahead of me. Turns out that the team had a budget set aside for us by the league. I used the excuse of training the team to react faster to danger for Red Tornado to agree to construct the obstacle course. That same afternoon, yesterday, Green Lantern had come by and voila, a compact 10 challenge obstacle course. The course was filled with some of the hardest obstacles ever cleared. I was dressed in a black vest and a pair of gym pants. The first challenge was the rolling lock. I jumped a little in place to loosen my muscles, timed myself, and then began. Two hours later, I looked myself over in the mirror and nodded. The visor part of my mask came down, hiding my features. I didn't look like me, which duh, I guess was the point. Batman had advised me to lose the taper fade and after a lot of back and forth, he finally gave up though I could feel his disapproval every time we spoke. My relationship with both him and Red Tornado had also gone into a comfortable place. The android didn't speak much, but he was always helpful. Batman's attitude was cool, if you were an antisocial guy like me. And today, today I would meet the rest of my future team. I just hoped that things would go well. I left my room and found Red Tornado already waiting for me in the hall. Follow me, he said, and I nodded. We used a Zeta tube, and when I opened my eyes, I found myself in a massive room. The Hall of Justice. Specifically, the library, judging from all the bookshelves on the sides. Martian Manhunter was the only one around, along with several reporters watching us from behind a glass panel, located in another room. Flashes of camera hit us, and I gulped in nervousness at the step I was about to make. Today was the day. My introduction to the life of capes both heroes and villains. Maelstrom, welcome to the Hall of Justice, Martian Manhunter told me while smiling softly. I returned the smile. Thank you. It's good to be here. Actually, where are the rest? I asked. They're just arriving. Excuse me, Manhunter said and left. A brief silence settled upon me and Tornado, something I had gotten used to by now. To calm down my nerves, I took the chance to review my progress over the past two days. Air Mastery Level, Expert. Locked. Locked. My Air Mastery had gone up to Expert. It might seem fast, but I had really tried my best to bridge the gap between the sidekicks and I. 
They had me beat in experience and knowledge, so I had to learn faster. In the meantime, I would let the my strength carry me over. Fortunately, I already knew some of the villains we would face, and I had even tried to create counters to some of them. The wide doors to the library opened, and it entered eight new individuals. Aquaman and Aqualad, Flash and Kid Flash, Green Arrow and Speedy, and lastly Batman and the Boy Wonder, Robin. Robin did a spit take as his eyes landed on me. I waved a hand awkwardly. Hi. You have got to be kidding me. You. Robin swerved his head to stare at his minner. You never said anything about. He waved his hand at me. The others studied me and Kid Flash whooshed over. Who's the new guy? He studied me from a few sides before running back to the rest of the group. I like his costume. Team Meat Maelstrom, Red Tornado's protege. I stepped forward, calming my wildly beating heart. I wanted to fanboy so much right now, but as my dad always told me, first impressions are very important. Hello everybody. As Batman said, I'm Maelstrom. Happy to meet you. I hope we all get along and become friends. Robin entered into a staring match with Batman before sighing and conceding. He stepped up and offered a hand. Nice to meet you. Officially. Just know I'll get you back for that blow. I smiled at the olive branch. Not the least bit intimidated by his promise. I grasped his hand and shook it. Hey man, I'm Kid Flash. Great to meet you. So what are your powers exactly? Kid Flash asked. Aerokinesis. I answered, but by the slight narrowing of Robin's eyes, I knew I would soon face some questions from him. Well, the kid was just as intense as Batman when he glared. Cool. Can you make tornadoes like Red Tornado? Kid Flash went on. I smirked. You'll soon find out. My name is Aqualad. Nice to meet you. Aqualad was a calm individual but from the sincerity in his eyes, I could tell he was the one to welcome me completely without any reservations. I turned my attention to the last sidekick in the room. Speedy didn't spare me a glance as he approached the League members who had separated themselves to discuss about something. Quick debrief to discuss the coincidence of four ice villains attacking on the same day. We won't be long, Batman announced. The light to access the Zeta 2 ran over him and the other mentors. I watched Speedy's back as my jaw clenched at the silent dismissal. That's, a uh, Speedy. He's like that with strangers. Don't worry, he'll come around soon. Robin told me, but by the look on my face, he could see I didn't believe him in the slightest. He shrugged. What is this? Speedy's voice cut through harshly. The older members of the League turned to stare at him. Green Arrow made to talk. Speedy. Speedy's face scrunched up in anger. No. No more excuses. You promised us a real look inside. Not a glorified backstage pass. You need to be patient. It will happen on its own time. Green Arrow opened his mouth and made things worse. What I need is for someone to take me seriously. Speedy rebutted turning to the others. This is never going to end. They're always going to treat us like sidekicks, not equals. Let us try to calm down and talk this out, Speedy. I'm sure we can reach. Speedy laughed Aqualad's words. I bet you don't even know that this is not the real headquarters. The real HQ is located in space. Batman looked at Green Arrow in disapproval. I thought we could make an exception. The glare didn't end. In fact, it grew in intensity. Apparently not. I didn't know what to think, but from the little I had seen, I could tell that Speedy had a few issues to work through. I didn't remember the whole Young Justice plot, but there was something about him. If you can't treat me like a partner, then I'm done. He finished his rant by throwing his hat on the floor and walking off. With that, the whole room filled up with tension. I really didn't feel like being in the room, and this was the perfect time to talk to John. I walked over close to them. Can I talk to you for a second, John? That man nodded to him. I had already told the Dark Knight what I wanted to ask John, and he'd given his approval. We went off to a private office attached to the library, leaving behind the sidekicks who looked lost in thought. What did you need, Maelstrom? I wrung my wrists, suddenly unsure of myself. Look, you know my situation. And I'm worried that another telepath, one aligned with the let's take over the world, thing, might just as easily read my mind as you can. John nodded his head and hummed. You want to know if there is a way you can shield your mind from telepaths. Exactly. He was silent for only a few seconds. Very well. I know of a few exercises we can do to strengthen your mind. Fortunately, I am also teaching Gan, so it will be easy to include you to the already set schedule. Cool. Cool. When will we start? Soon. I resisted to grumble mostly because I was asking for his help. Soon wasn't really an answer, and I felt uncomfortable knowing that Simon, a supervillain telepath, was in my future. John S. Earpiece beeped, and he turned to me. League emergency. Take care, Maelstrom. He phased through the walls and was gone. I sighed and left the room. Project Cadmus? Aqualad's voice rang out as I came with an earshot. Let's find out. Robin perked up and started typing on a computer. What's up, guys? I asked, but none of them answered me, too engrossed on the screen. Access denied. Robin scoffed. Wanna bet? I came up close to them and marveled at his hacking skills. Well, you're good. I told him. Thanks, but this is easy. Same system as the Batcave. Access granted. Project Cadmus. It's a lab here on DC. But if Batman's suspicious of it, maybe we should check it out. Robin reasoned. Aqualad's face lit up. Solve their case before they do. It would be poetic justice. Wait. Sorry guys, but if I'm getting you right, you want to go to DC and investigate a lab that the Batman, emphasis on the is suspicious of, all the while directly going against their order to stay put. They looked at each other and turned to me. Yes. 
The word came out in unison. Why? You're going to tell on us new guy? Kid Flash asked me mockingly. I didn't really mind, having understood his personality. A smile worked its way onto my face. Not at all. In fact, count me in. Chapter 7, Cadmus. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. We took a Zeta tube to the area in the city where Cadmus was located. Coming out of the phone booth, we spotted the smoke rising over a few buildings a block away, and Kid Flash took off towards that direction. Boy Wonder shot a cable to the building in front of us and pulled on it. He landed on the roof and took off with Aqualad and I following behind. Aqualad's Atlantean physique, that was levels higher than mine by the way, helped him gather momentum from his sprint and jump onto a window close to the roof of the two-story building. Then he pulled himself over. Not when to get shown up. I used the wind to increase my speed and copied Aang's move on the walls of Ba Sing Se. The draft picked up behind me and propelled me forward at high speed. Closing up on the wall of the building, I stepped on it and pushed up. The next step I took was of the windowsill and then I jumped, easily clearing the distance. My leap carried me to somewhere near the edge of the building, right behind Aqualad. In front of us was the Cadmus building. Its upper section was in flames. Boy Wonder was just arriving on the ground. I looked at Aqualad and said, Let's jump. We did and I manipulated the air to slow us down, finally landing on the ground and catching up to Boy Wonder. No time. Could has cleared the area of civilians but something tells me. Robin didn't complete his sentence as a section on the second floor blew up sending two scientists falling to the ground. Kid Flash luckily super sped towards them and saved them, barely placing them on the roof of the building. Unfortunately, the speedster lost traction and had to hang from the window. We need a plan. Aqualad began before looking around and finding out that the boy wonder had disappeared. He's up ahead. Come on, I have an idea. I told Aqualad and started sprinting forwards. The wind carried my body as I moved as fast as a speeding car. I had Aqualad's bounding steps behind me and looking on ahead, noticed that Robin had already arrived at Kid Flash's position. He helped him up and they entered the building. Meanwhile, I took a running jump, cleared a distance of 20 meters and stepped on the ladder of the fire truck on the scene. I distantly heard the fireman shouting in surprise. I pushed off the vehicle leaving behind a sudden whoosh of air behind me. My trajectory carried me to the roof of the building. The two scientists stepped back in fear. I spared them a look at their wariness before I realized something. I was still unknown, so they didn't know if I was a hero or a villain. Fear was understandable. Who? One of them started before I pointed at Aqualad who was coming up, riding on water. Aqualad's going to get you down. I then ignored them and focused on my task. Okay, here goes nothing. I focused and pulled out all the air from the room burning below me. A cloud of smoke flew out of the room leaving behind a vacuum and nothing else but blackened furniture. Meanwhile, the two scientists reached the ground safely due to Aqualad, who then controlled the water to rise up and form a platform for us to step on. Let's go to the others. I nodded and we went down, stopping and entering the room next to the one burning previously. Aqualad did not look happy as he said sarcastically. Appreciate the help. Robin spared an amused glance at us. Nice going. You too, Maelstrom. I nodded and started to look around. Aqualad did the same, and we all heard the ding of an elevator from the hallway through the open door. We went on guard and ran out to the hall. What was that? I asked, catching a glimpse of something before the elevator doors closed. No idea, but a two-story building like this shouldn't have a high-speed express elevator. Boy Wonder told us while swiping at the watch displayed holograms on his wrist. I whistled in appreciation. Okay, I know it's not the time, but could Batman get me something like that if I asked nicely? The Boy Wonder looked at me and smiled. Cool, isn't it? I nodded while Wally snorted. Keep dreaming. I tried to ask nicely, but all I got was the patented glare. Guys, focus. Aqualad said while going to the elevator and pulling the doors apart. Robin whistled. So that's why they need the express elevator. Just as I had expected, the elevator went down many floors judging by the shaft. Now what? I asked. Despite our powers or in Robin's case skills and gadgets, I don't think we should go down there without informing the League first. This doesn't seem like your average supervillain scheme to me. Kid Flash patted me on the shoulder. I get it, man. You're scared. But this is what comes with being a hero. Wow, kid. That was almost inspiring. Robin threw a jab at him. Hey, what's that supposed to mean? Robin ignored him and turned to me. If we contacted the League, they would just tell us to fall back, and by then, it might be too late. Aqualad nodded. I believe it would be prudent to go forward. As humans would say, it is easier to beg forgiveness than to seek permission. Well, I was stumped by their recklessness, but in the end, I nodded. Robin wordlessly shot his grapple gun. The hook dug onto the ceiling above us, and he jumped, hanging from the cable as he went down. Next up was Aqualad. Kid Flash followed after them while smirking at me. Guess you're last, he said, saluting. I rolled my eyes though he couldn't see it from my visor. I pulled on the cable to make sure it was stable before biting the bullet and sliding down along it. Luckily I had my gloves on, so friction wasn't a problem. I pushed myself to the ledge of the floor where the rope ended just as Robin hacked the elevator doors. Aqualad opened them, and we stepped through. We walked in to find ourselves in a huge room lined with strange compartments on the side. Welcome to Project Cadmus. Guys, this place gives me the creeps. We should. Kid Flash used his super speed and pulled ahead of us. Be careful. I finished lamely. Damn it. Aqualad said as we ran forward. 
Kid Flash slipped after running into huge gray creatures and losing balance. I sent a blast of wind that pushed him away from being turned to mince meat by a genomorph. Thanks, he said once they made it past. The huge creatures had tiny other creatures on their shoulders. They spotted us, but ignored our existence. My heart was hammering inside my chest. It's one thing to see such things on TV and another to stand close to them. Okay, that happened. Still don't want to call in the league. Not yet. I need to find out what's going on here. Robin insisted and I knew the others would back him up. I swallowed my objections for the second time as we proceeded through the hallways to come up on two huge double doors. That looks interesting, Kid Flash said. I agree. Aqualad added while Robin broke through the security measures and the chamber doors opened. Inside, more genomorphs were put into glass casings. Electric energy ran through their forms as Kid Flash told us of his suspicions that the reason Cadmus was off the grid was because that they were using genomorphs to produce energy. At that point, I tuned them out knowing that trouble was about to arrive. Two minutes later, Guardian and a number of combat genomorphs entered the room. Don't move. Wait, Robin? Kid Flash? Aqualad. Guardian looked caught off guard by our presence. While they were talking, I prepared myself, ready to spring into motion when Guardian and the genomorphs inevitably attacked. This would be my first real battle and my nerves were killing me. I breathed out calmly while stepping away from the others to avoid friendly fire. Guardian clutched his head in disorientation once he figured out something was wrong. The horns of the genomorph on his shoulder glowed red, and I took that as my cue. Take them down hard. In your dreams, buddy. A blast of air escaped my hands, knocking the genomorphs back. Guardian rolled to the side and escaped the attack. Robin threw a smoke pellet on the ground, and I used my air to spread it out faster, obscuring our position. The four genomorphs jumped through the air. I took the chance while they were suspended and let loose a point-blank air bomb. This was a skill I had come up with while practicing, where I condensed as much wind as I could before releasing it in one burst. It sent out a shockwave of air that slammed two of the genomorphs to the walls of the room while sweeping the smoke away. Holy crap. The new guy has moves. Focus, kid. Aqualad shouted while dodging Guardian's attacks. I watched as Kid Flash took one of the genomorphs out leaving one that was headed for Aqualad. Birdarangs came flying from above and took it out. Courtesy of Robin. With all the genomorphs taken out, that left only Guardian and boy was he powerful. Guardian threw out blows that Aqualad struggled to defend against. More genomorphs entered the room, and I turned my attention away from Aqualad. Hey kid, I need a distraction. Sure. Kid Flash replied and blitzed forward in zigzags. In the same motion it took him to run, I twisted and bent. Harsh winds covered my form before I completed the set of motion and stepped forward. Out of the way, kid. Kid Flash hopped on a wall and ran up to clutch one of the beams above us. My hands shot forward and a massive cone of wind slammed onto the new genomorphs. The blast pushed them all away and back out into the hallway. Aqualad was also done with Guardian after electrocuting him, so we left the room and ran to the elevator which Robin had just finished hacking into. Way to be a team player, Rob. Kid Flash said to the boy Wonder, looking miffed. Although that statement was true in most cases, I disagreed at that current situation. If Robin hadn't gone ahead, we would still be stuck fighting the genomorphs. I thought you guys were right behind me. He answered. The elevator doors opened wide and we entered. Aqualad barely made it as he came rolling in a group of genomorphs following behind him. Luckily the elevator closed ABD started going down. Why are we heading down? I asked Robin. Dude out is up. You don't get it. Project KR is down on sub. Level 52. Robin responded. Perhaps we should contact the League. This is getting out of control. No, we started this. Let's finish it. Robin said convincingly. This time I didn't hide my sigh. Chapter 8. Project KR. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. The elevator opened up to reveal a room built inside an underground cavern. The room itself emptied into two ominous hallways. Okay, which should we pick? Bizarre looking hallway 1 or bizarre looking hallway 2? I would say neither. In fact, I'm an advocate for let's get the hell out of here and call in the big guns. My words had an effect on them, but they still weren't willing to turn back. Maybe Maelstrom is right. That said, we've already come this far. Might as well just continue. I threw my hands up. I give up. You've been in this game longer than I have, so what the hell? Let's continue on and hope we live to tell the tale. That's more like it. Robin responded to me. But before he could add anything else, a genomorph dressed in white spotted us. Halt. The alien took control of a few metal barrels and telekinetically threw them at us. My hand snaked out and a gale of wind knocked the projectiles away. We then started running towards the second hallway. I knew that they were coming for us, and I didn't feel comfortable being confined in such a place with no way out. We made a turn and saw a woman get knocked down by Kid Flash who was moving at high speeds. The massive door to Project KR was ahead of us, about to close, but we all luckily made it through as it shut behind, trapping us in the room with Superman's clone. So far I had been following the plot, but being in that situation, about to face a Kryptonian hybrid who could smash me to pulp, made me realize just how dumb I was. I had neglected to give Batman information regarding the Young Justice universe because I knew how altering events could lead to worse shit, but following the plot so closely had been a dumb mistake, one I was about to pay for. While I was lost in my thoughts, Robin and the others decided to free Superboy. My eyes widened. No, wait. Robin pressed on a key, and the glass case opened with an exhale of air. Damn it. I said, 
earning looks of confusion from the others. We don't know if they programmed him to attack intruders like they did with Guardian. I saw realization fall onto their faces. Get us out of here, Robin. Aqualad shouted in alarm as his water bearers appeared in his hands. Kid Flash turned to me angrily. Why didn't you say anything? I looked at him incredulously. Are you kidding me? I told you guys to contact the League. There are no signals down here. Aqualad interjected. Let's try talking first. It's Superman's son. Here's to hoping he shares the big guy's fluffy personality. Robin's words were met with an angry scowl from the clone. Or not. Look out. I shouted to Aqualad, pushing him away with a gale of wind. Superboy slammed a fist down on Aqualad's previous location and rounded up on the person closest to him, which happened to be me. I ducked a punch and slammed my palms on his gut. A blast of air carried him off his feet to Aqualad's timely attack on the small of Superboy's back. Superboy flew above me to hit the metal frame of his glass cage. He stood back up looking nowhere's for wear. Guys, any ideas? I asked, prompting Robin to go forward. His hands were held up. Calm down. We're on your side. The clone's response was to jump at him with a hand pulled back. Boy Wonder jumped away and in the same motion shot a taser at Superboy, which did absolutely nothing. He pulled on the wires and Robin went flying towards him. Fortunately, Kid Flash swooped in and sped away with Robin before Superboy could hit him. Aqualad, we can't win like this. I told him. My hands were shaking in fear. Aqualad had a determined look okay his face as he jumped into the fray. We have to try. He shouted while drawing water from his tattoos to form the hammer from before. He smashed it onto the clone who blocked it with one hand and pushed it to the side. The hammer disappeared and a shield formed on Aqualad's side to block the devastating punch to the kidneys. Aqualad was pushed back and the clone made to follow only to divert in his course and come for me as I was gearing up for another attack. My eyes widened as he body checked me onto the wall. My back hit the hard surface and a breath of air escaped my lungs. I fell onto the ground wheezing and my head ringing. I heard a cry of pain and saw Kid Flash smash into Robin who had tried to use smoke bombs to distract the clone. The last thing I saw before losing consciousness was Aqualad electrocuting Superboy. Time runs short. You must awaken. You must awaken now. The loud voice rang through my head making me open my eyes in shock. I strained from my bindings once I saw myself and the others suspended from glass casings not unlike Superboy's. What happened? Where are we? Let us out now. Kid Flash asked in panic. I hate to be that guy but I told you so. I shouted in frustration. Robin had the decency to look away. We're sorry for dragging you into this maelstrom. Aqualad apologized but I sighed. No it's not your fault. I wanted to come. Besides although we could have done some things differently, we've succeeded so far on surviving no worse for wear. Kid Flash was relentlessly straining his body against the cuffs. Keeping a speedster locked up was probably very frustrating to them. This is so not cool man. Just calm down kid. I doubt you want to piss off the guy who can fry us just by looking with your nagging. We only saw it to help you out. Aqualad began. Yeah, and then you turn on us. Kid Flash added looking angry. Kid please. Stay quiet. I believe he was being controlled. Yeah. I noticed that the genomorphous horns glowed right before he attacked us. It wasn't intentional. What if I? What if I was? Superboy asked tentatively. He can talk. The others looked surprised at that. Especially Kid Flash. Yes he can. Superboy said looking peeved at Kid's words. Kid Flash was quick to say. Not like I said. It. Then they went on to have a dialogue about how Superboy could leave with us and we would show him the sky and his father Superman. Oh boy. I really didn't want to see the look of confused anger when Clark learns that he has a son. I tried my best to highlight that particular thing to Batman. To tell him that in one of the alternate Earths, a clone of Superman emerges. A clone that wouldn't turn on him because of his background. I just hope Batman had spoken to him about it. We can show you Superman. I caught the end of Aqualad's words and so it seems so did the scientist walking in. Empty promises. They're not going anywhere. Guardian, get the weapon back in its cage. Desmond said. The man instantly rubbed me the wrong way. He's not a weapon asshole. Just because a knife can stab someone doesn't mean that it's all it can do. Oh, and might you be? A new hero? No, you're hanging out with the sidekicks, so the question is, whose protege are you? He asked making me smirk. Get me down here and I'll show you. Desmond snorted. Children these days. Running their mouths without a care for the consequences. He turned to the lady scientist from before. Start the cloning process. Then to Superboy, he stepped closer. You are not a real boy. You belong to Cadmus. Now get back to your pot. The horns of the genomorph on Superboy's shoulder glowed and Superboy left. Two metal rods with four pincers each detached from the frame of our cage and impacted my chest. There was a discharge of energy released and I felt my blood being drained from me. Not a minute later, Superboy came charging in. Desmond looked on disbelief as Superboy pushed him out of the way. Robin broke through his cuffs and instantly they freed the rest of us. Robin threw four explosive birdarangs that took out the containers containing our blood samples. During the commotion we ran out of the chamber. We took a turn and ran towards the elevator. Genomorph suddenly broke out of the pods dotting the hallway and we found ourselves surrounded. I didn't stop, augmenting my agility with air. I took a leap and at the apex of the jump, wind surrounded my form as my body twisted. A tornado sprung up, strong enough to push the huge genomorphs out of the way, clearing the way enough for the others to take down the rest. Superboy let's go. 
I shouted at the clone who was wrecking the genomorphous shit. Don't give me orders. I rolled my eyes as he followed us. Aqualad forced open the elevator doors and we started going up. Robin and Kid flash on a grapple gun and me bounding on the sides of the shaft. The others landed on the ledge of sub-level 15 while I was higher on sub-level 13. Robin looked up at me and shouted, Maelstrom, there's an elevator coming down. He shouted, and I let loose an air bomb on the elevator doors, blasting them open and jumping in, narrowly missing the lift from crashing into me. And like that, I had successfully separated from the rest. I smiled. The good thing is that they didn't suspect anything. You might be wondering why sub-level 13 was special. The short answer? It was where the blockbuster formula was contained. The fight with Superboy from earlier showed me that despite my powers, I was essentially a glass cannon. He had taken me out of the fight in one hit. That needed a change. I couldn't wait for the Cobra Venom. The blockbuster formula was here and ready. I stepped into the hallway and ran forward, looking for anything distinctive. Luckily, most of their forces were looking for Robin and the others. I didn't have a lot of time though. Desmond would also walk in, looking to use the blockbuster to take us down. I made another turn and before me, written in bold were the words, Containment 13, Blockbuster. Chapter 9, Blockbuster. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. A problem presented itself soon. I couldn't open the doors to the containment unit. Hacking was Robin's thing, not mine. Anytime now Desmond would walk in to take the sample he would use, although that was risky, it was also my only chance. I looked for places to hide and settled on the ventilation shaft at the end of the hallway. From that position, I could see the doors to the unit perfectly and I was undetectable, mostly due to Robin hacking the motion sensors. I stayed put for five minutes before the elevator doors dinged and opened. Desmond entered looking to be in a hurry. He jogged slightly towards the huge doors and swiped. I jumped out of the shaft and landed gently behind him as he pocketed his card and entered a code. Then the biometric pad on the wall next to the door scanned his eyeball. I silently thanked my lucky stars that I had waited. There wouldn't have been any other way to open those doors without getting found out. What I was doing needed to be seen as something necessary. Taking the blockbuster formula would no doubt increase my strength way above what I currently had. That would raise flags with Batman and the rest if I didn't have a good explanation. So Desmond needed to take that formula first and turn into blockbuster. When he started overwhelming the team, I could jump in and beat him, telling them that I had taken a sample of the blockbuster to give to Batman for study only to have to use it to avoid our deaths. That wouldn't really fly with Batman, but one thing I was sure of was that he would look the other way. The thing is I wanted to be a hero and he wouldn't risk losing my alignment to the good side over something like that. As long as I wasn't killing anyone, I hoped he would condone my actions like he did with Catwoman. What Batman didn't know was that although I wanted to be a hero, it was not in the traditional sense. I had plans for this world and I would take every advantage I could to make them happen. If that meant stretching my morality a little into the gray area, so be it. I mean, I was just 17 years old, but I could see what was wrong with this world. That meant more than most. I had the responsibility to change it for the better. The doors opened with a loud hiss and Desmond walked in. I trailed after him and hid behind a machine, watching him. He approached a glass casing containing six samples of the blockbuster formula glowing blue. Desmond pressed a key on the computer and the casing opened. He grabbed one of the formulas and looked at it with a manic expression in his face. Yes, this will do. He turned and left only to stop before the door with an odd look on his face. He shook his head and left, muttering. It's probably nothing. I felt like slapping myself when I realized I had left the kid to the ventilation shaft on the floor out in the hallway. I breathed out a sigh of relief when the doors closed behind him, locking me inside the lab. I waited for a few minutes then walked to the glass case and opened it. My hands grabbed two of the vials. I stalled for a second thinking things through. The plan had been to skip on the serum and use the perfected version of it, but the thing is, could I survive without this power up until the Santa Prisca mission? Hell, I could die here if I wasn't careful. No, I couldn't wait for the Cobra Venom Serum. It had to be now. Here's to hoping that adaptable body lives up to its hype. I didn't waste another second and drank one of the vials. Instantly, pain assaulted my body. I felt myself stretch and a cry escaped my mouth. Oh my god. I shut my eyes and curled up in a ball. Desmond hadn't gone through such agony in canon, so what was different? No, he didn't have adaptable body though, did he? The way the perk worked was allowing changes to be made to my body as a result of an outside element interacting with my biology. That came with the added benefit of my body not changing drastically from the model of how my species was supposed to look like. I clenched my jaw and took the pain with nary a cry, hoping it would end soon. With the team. They had been surrounded. Genomorphs on all sides. There hadn't even been a fight. The genomorph from earlier had taken them out easily through telepathy. Then he'd given Superboy a choice. Superboy had chosen freedom rather than captivity. With that, Robin and the others had breathed out a sigh of relief thinking that the fight was over. It feels like a fog lifting. Guardian said after the genomorphs released him from their control. Guardian? Robin asked. The older man looked at him. Go, I'll handle Desmond. A snicker sounded from behind them. Handle me? I think not. Blockbuster will let me restore order here in Cadmus. They looked behind them, only to see Desmond drink a strange blue glowing serum. Right before their eyes, Desmond began to change into a gray, monstrous form with red eyes. Cut five minutes later and the sidekicks were losing badly. 
The creature had blasted Superboy through the roof of the building, right to the next one up. He had strength to match Superboy and enough durability to take their hits and shrug them off. He punched Superboy to a wall and then used Kid Flash to slam into Aqualad, sending them both to the ground. Robin's Birdarangs did absolutely nothing, and the boy Wonder was just about to come up with a risky plan when reinforcement arrived in the most unlikely way. Maelstrom blasted through the elevator doors, catching everyone's attention. Hey guys, thought you needed some help. Maelstrom, Robin shouted in relief. That man would have had their heads had they let the new guy get hurt. The creature turned to look at Maelstrom and roared, running forward. Maelstrom ducked the first blow and in a move that surprised the rest, let loose an uppercut that snapped the creature's head back with an audible crack. The blow was so strong that it sent a sudden gale of wine through the room. The creature was lifted and slammed into a pillar that broke under its weight. Okay, I didn't know you could do that. Kid Flash spoke up looking shocked. They all looked at Maelstrom in question. To answer them, he showed them the vial held in his hand. It contained the same blue liquid that Desmond had used. I followed this guy into a lab where he took one of these vials, talking about how he would use one to restore order. Maelstrom told them, while helping Aqualad out from under one of the wrecked pillars. I took two of them to give to the League for study, but then found myself besieged by genomorphs. I took a risk and drank one, hoping I'd get strong enough to overcome their number. Then, they just stopped. They looked at him, and he tried to clarify. I mean they didn't attack me, so I used the elevator to come up, and the rest is history. Robin wasn't convinced. Then how did you not turn into a monster like Desmond? Aiden's PV. My body felt. Amazing. I clutched my fist in wonder while I contemplated how to answer Robin's question. I have a power called Adaptable Body. It lets me adapt to certain conditions without a change in physiology. Just then Blockbuster extracted himself from the wreckage and shook his head while staring at us. Save the rest of your questions for later. Right now I think we should handle this. He's right, Rob. We need to take this thing down. I agree. Kid Flash said and was backed by Aqualad. You all talk too much. Superboy told us and sprang forward with a snarl. I looked at Robin and added him the second vial. He looked at me strangely. You excel at long range against this kind of opponent. It's less risky if the vial stays with you. He nodded and I jumped into the fray, following the others. I called upon the air to slow down Kid Flash's body from colliding against me. Thanks, he said upon landing. His body blurred as he jumped back to fight against the monster. Blockbuster took Aqualad's water maze to the face and stumbled back. Although he was disoriented, he managed to backhand Superboy, sending him flying off. Aqualad came into position underneath him and slammed a hammer on the monster's side. I jumped over him assisted by the wind and slammed an axe kick on Blockbuster's head sending him to the floor on one knee. Kid Flash whizzed in with a hundred punches a second moving faster than Blockbuster could see, successfully distracting him. Aqualad. Superboy. Hold him down I have a plan. Don't order. Not now Superboy, you can set me on fire later with your heat vision. Right now, use that anger and work with us. Robin. Some smoke bombs to distract him. Kid Flash keep doing what you're doing. Got it. It must have been the urgency of the situation combined with no one else having a plan, but they listened to me. Kid fall back. He did so, right when Robin's smoke bombs hit Blockbuster. I slammed a double hand punch on top of his head when he made to get up, sending him back to a knee. Superboy and Aqualad came in from behind and grabbed each of his hands, pulling them back. They strained and I hurried to carry out the final step of the plan. I waved my hands and a bubble of air surrounded Blockbuster's head. I sucked out all the oxygen from the bubble, slowly suffocating him. Hurry! Aqualad shouted, his hands shaking while his face scrunched up. Kid Flash came in from the side and helped him, barely easing the burden. Blockbuster's eyes were wide open as he tried to rise up but couldn't due to the legs placed on his back, pushing him to the floor and denying him leverage to stand. Finally, he slumped on the ground, passed out, and the three of them let go, breathing heavily. I, I never, want to do that again. I ran a hand on my face and breathed out. It's over. The entrance was before us. I looked at the others and pointed to Blockbuster. Should we leave him here or? The unanimous decision was to carry him outside, a task that Superboy took on willingly this time, sending a challenging look my way. We followed him out and into the night sky. Superboy dropped Blockbuster on the ground as he stared at the moon, too distracted to notice the League watching us with unamused looks on their faces. I looked at Batman and he narrowed his eyes at us. You have some explaining to do. Chapter 10 Aftermath and the New Perk Colon, colon. Aiden's PV I'm Superman's clone. The air chilled suddenly at the drop of Superboy's statement. Superman's face hardened in a way I hadn't seen before. Seems like Batman hadn't informed him of anything. Speaking of the Dark Knight, he did not look happy. What? happened? He ground out. No one stepped up to talk. Robin finally sighed and started talking with the rest of us adding bits and pieces to the story. Batman looked at me strangely once he heard that I had used the blockbuster formula but otherwise didn't comment. Some of the other League members did not look at me fondly. Oh boy, they probably think I'm a power-hungry maniac now. That said, I wouldn't change a damn thing. I was itching to go and test out what I could do now. After we finished, Batman held out a hand and Robin placed the blockbuster formula on his palm. Batman then put the vial in his utility belt, and the League members separated themselves from us to have a brief meeting. I looked at the others, we looked banged up due to the fight, but we were all otherwise okay. 
It started out as a chuckle then I started laughing in happiness. The others looked at me weirdly. Hey, you okay man? Kid Flash asked and I smiled at him. Just happy that we're still alive. I mean, we beat that thing. We beat everything Cadmus had to offer and came out on top. Robin smiled. I forgot that this was your first time. Kid Flash whooshed next to me and draped his hand across my shoulder. Yeah man, you were great. And you did make a tornado when the Genomorphs tried to overwhelm us. I laughed as he reminded me of the time he had asked if I could create a tornado like Red Tornado. You're pretty alright, new guy. Overwhelmed? Why is no one ever? Robin started only to have Kid Flash cut him off. No no no, no more whelm stuff Rob. Aqualad patted me on the shoulder. He's right. You handled yourself admirably. You're fit to be a hero maelstrom. I smiled, a feeling of giddiness overcoming me. I looked at Superboy who was scowling at Superman's direction and the glee diminished a little. I couldn't let Superman's relationship with what was virtually his son start off so rocky. Something had to be done. Manhunter. I mentally shouted. John didn't react so I shouted even louder. Manhunter. Yes, Maelstrom. How can I help you? He finally answered. John could you please connect me to Superman? John was silent for a little while, probably questioning when he had turned into a phone. Then. Very well. The next voice I heard was from the Man of Steel. Maelstrom. He asked and I walked a little bit away from the others to stop any distractions. First of all, I cannot begin to imagine what you're feeling right now. I know you're shocked and confused and many other conflicting feelings that someone in your position would feel. Go on. Instead of replying, I concentrated on relaying the memories of Superboy fighting with us. I felt the undertones of surprise, respect, and a tiny touch of pride through our link, but so was confusion, distrust, and fear. He fought against all he's ever known because he wanted to live up to your legacy. He wants to be like you. Superman is more than just a man. You represent truth, justice, and compassion. Those values are what he admires in you. Someone like that, striving to earn your approval does not deserve a cold shoulder. What would you have me do? I never planned for any of this to happen. The Man of Steel lost his nerve, showing just how much of an emotional turmoil he was in. But I knew I had him where I wanted. Neither did he. Give him a chance and try to connect with him. He's your son whether you like it or not, and right now, he'll need you the most. Do this so that you will not regret in the future when you try to be in his life. No, you don't know what you're asking of me. I sighed. Why does he have to make all this so dramatic? I'm asking you to stand above the negative emotions. Be compassionate. That's not too much to ask, is it? And with that, I cut off the mental link. I was under no illusions that he would listen to me. But those words, he needed to hear them. Superman made his way to us and stopped before Superboy. He breathed out and a small smile appeared on his face. I saw what you did, courtesy of Maelstrom. Good job. Superboy. Hell, even I was surprised. That's not what I was expecting. Th. Thank you. Superboy stammered out. You will be staying at Mount Justice with Maelstrom. I'll be coming over regularly to check on you before we figure anything else out. With that Superman nodded and looked at me from the corner of his eye as if to ask, satisfied? I looked away, only now realizing that I had just lectured the Man of Steel. Superboy turned his attention to me. Thank you. He said sincerely. Did we miss something? Kid wondered while looking between us. Batman started walking towards us cutting off the discussion. Despite the results, we are not happy. You should have called. Flash butted in. You hacked into the Justice League systems and disobeyed a direct order to stay put. Batman continued. That aside. Good work team. However, it goes without saying that you will not be doing this again. Aqualad stepped forward. I'm sorry, but we will. Stand down Aqualad. Aquaman told his protege. I'm sorry my king, but no. I watched on as each member of the team stepped forward in determination, standing up to the Justice League. They all turned to look at me and I shrugged. What they said? Batman's eyes narrowed at me, but I ignored him turning to my teammates. So what do you think we should call ourselves? Sometime later. I made it out of the Zeta tube following Red Tornado. He hadn't said a word about the whole Cadmus debacle except for, I am glad to see you're alright. Which was cool. Red Tornado wasn't a talker and I found that I was more than comfortable with that. Good night Tornado. I told him and left to show Superboy his room. The hallway was brightly lit as he and I walked on in silence. Superman said you showed him what I did. He finally broke the comfortable silence. I hummed in confirmation. I just showed him the truth. That you're more than a clone. I watched him from the corner of my eyes. His face looked lost before it changed to one of determination. We didn't say anything else all the way. I showed him where the kitchen was, fully stocked pantry and all and then the rooms, promising him a tour around the whole base come morning. I told him to wait a little and left for my room. I came back with a few t-shirts that were a size bigger than my actual size and a few pairs of trousers. Superboy didn't have a change of clothes, so I offered him a few of mine and made a note to go to town for some shopping tomorrow. I told him good night and left for my own room. Once inside I hit the shower and dried up. My eyes roamed over my body in the mirror and I did a spit take. I had abs. I touched them a little and they felt hard. Like steel. My chest was much bigger and my arms. I flexed. Holy shit. I'm ripped. It must have been the blockbuster formula. Thinking about it, I was reminded of the talk I would soon have with Batman. I wasn't looking forward to that. Done with admiring my new body, I fell inside my sheets to sleep but a prompt from the system appeared before my eyes. I propped myself up and read it over. Congratulations. For participating in your first superhero mission and not dying, 
you get Chi Blocker perk. Chi Blocker, take down your enemies by targeting their Chi points. I smiled. Information appeared in my head on the forms and where to target to block someone's Chi. This new perk was very welcome. I wonder if it would work on superhumans like Deathstroke or aliens like Superman. The short answer? Yes. As long as the target was biological then all I would need to do is hit their chi points and they would be helpless. The next morning. Red Tornado will be your supervisor. Black Canary will handle your training and I will deploy you on missions. Batman announced. We were all in the Hall of Mount Justice. That is the team and the mentors and Black Canary. I tried my best not to stare at her but goddamn Canary was hot. Batman continued while my mind went off tangent into fantasies with Canary calling me Zaddy. What? I'm a fucking hormonal teenager. Cut me some slack. The six of you will be that team. Batman finished. Wait, six of us? Robin asked in confusion and Batman gestured behind us at the pair coming out of the Zeta tube. Team meet Miss Martian, Manhunter's protege. She will be part of you. A green-skinned shy girl waved at us from Manhunter's side. Hello. Kid Flash draped a hand over Robin's shoulder and whispered. I'm loving this gig more and more. Then he turned to the new arrival. Hi, Miss M. I'm Kid Flash. This is Robin, Aqualad, Superboy and Maelstrom. Hi. I waved at her then turned my attention to Manhunter and raised an eyebrow. She's your other student, isn't she? Manhunter smiled and nodded. Miss M must have felt the telepathic feedback as she turned to me and a second later, I heard her voice in my head. Hello, your mind is very open telepathically. I frowned. Is that a good thing? Or? It is. Especially for someone who's not a telepath. It just means you can project your thoughts out to a telepath much easier. In addition, your mind is very flexible. It's nice to meet you, Miss Martian. Excuse me, guys. I spoke out loud and approached Batman who was typing something on the hall's computer. I cleared my throat. I'm guessing you want to talk? He stopped what he was doing. Yes. Chapter 11. Testing out the new strength. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. Why did you take the serum? Batman's question cut right into the matter. I couldn't afford to lie to him, so I went with the simple answer. For power. To clarify, the situation was bad from the beginning, which is why you should have stayed put. Batman interjected. I'm sorry, but have you met them? Plus the whole situation with Speedy left them in a position where they wanted to prove themselves to you. It was either join them and try to help out or stay back and lose out on the camaraderie. We were a little further away from the team. Batman had pressed a button on his data pad and I picked up on a static field enveloping our position. Explain. He told me, clearly referencing on why I took the blockbuster formula. It's very simple. I didn't see another way we could win. We were trapped in enemy territory, an enemy who had easily taken us out earlier. After eavesdropping on Desmond and learning what the serum could do, I took it in hopes that it would be enough to grant us victory. I avoided the negative effects due to my other power. Adaptable physiology. He stated, and I nodded. I ran a hand through my hair. I won't lie to you, Batman. I was selfish, and I endangered my life, but my intentions were not evil. All I really wanted to do from the start was to get the others and leave. But things just got more and more complicated along the way until finally, I found myself in that position. I clenched my jaw. I don't regret my choice. I finished, waiting for his verdict. If he wanted me to leave the team, then I was okay with that. I had a plan in place on how I could do the superhero gig by myself. Don't do it again. Next time things might not work out as well as they did. He told me and I breathed out a sigh of relief. You will also go for a checkup at Star Labs to make sure that the formula doesn't have any unforeseen effects. I agreed seeing no harm in that. We're done here. I turned at the dismissal and walked away. And Maelstrom, good job. A smile appeared on my face as I walked away, a little straighter. A day later. Star Labs was amazing. The technology was otherworldly. I saw a man floating in the air assisted by four metallic bands attached to the wrists and the ankles. When I asked the intern leading me to the room where I would get my checkup about it, he simply said, Inth Metal, and left it at that. The checkup took a few hours and after I was done I left for the cave. Stepping out of the Zeta tube, I belated myself after seeing Superboy and realizing we hadn't done any of his shopping. Superboy had always worn the same type of clothes in Young Justice, but now that I was here, held to the EFF no. Where I come from, style is as much a part of you as anything else. My swag senses were tingling. I talked to Red Tornado, and then Gan, Superboy, and I spent the rest of the afternoon, shopping in town. Happy Harbor was a quaint little place and the food was great. We lazed around and came back to the base, happier and Superboy clothier? Is that a word? Three days later. The medical checkup at Star Labs was an eye-opener. The scan showed that my muscle density had increased by over 1,000%. The tensile strength of my skin was enough to block small caliber bullets. There hadn't been any physical exertion exercises, but I wasn't worried because the gym in Mount Justice was more than sufficient to test that. I looked over at Superboy and found him benching 100 tons easily. My eyebrows rose up as I left him to do his reps and approached the treadmill. I started slow with a jog, then up the speed as I listened to old-school hip-hop assault my ears. My heart started pumping faster as I regulated my breathing, moving even faster. At my top speed I looked down and noted I was pushing 50 miles per hour. Not quite speedster level but still faster than any human should be. Things got crazy when I used airbending to augment my speed. 
My feet slapped the treadmill as a gale appeared behind me and made my body lighter while also reducing the air resistance. My speed instantly jumped to 60 miles per hour. The air got more violent, and to reflect that so did my speed. 70 mph, 80 mph, 90 mph, 100 mph. That was the limit for the current me. I strained to keep up that speed while thinking of ways I could increase it. A lot of things factor into super speed. The main thing, though, is a high perception to react to moving at that speed. I had no idea how to tackle that. There was also the problem of maneuverability. My speed pushed me forward, but it didn't account for quick turns or corners. Not yet. The way to get better would be to constantly push my airbending training. I could already feel I was halfway to the next level which was master. I lost control and was thrown off the treadmill. I hit the ground and tumbled to the sound of Superboy chuckling. I got up and dusted myself. These few days had helped me build a good relationship with him and Gan, and as a consequence of Superman being more understanding, Superboy was much more mellow. Laugh all you want, but I bet you can't beat that speed. I told him in a challenging tone. Oh, it's on. He told me and removed his shirt. I think I heard a squeal from somewhere by the door. You know, you could simply come and Gan. I doubt Superboy would mind. I didn't need to be a telepath to know she had ran away. Superboy smirked and started to run upping his speed more and more to the point he was nothing but a blur. Fuck. I said softly when he proudly stepped back and showed me his top speed. The boy of steel was fast. 200 miles per hour. The problem was that apart from the first episode there were less instances where he showed that speed. But maybe that was because it took some time to accelerate? Kid Flash could go from 0 to a 100 in the blink of an eye. So Superboy probably chose to focus on what he was good at. Punching really hard. He hopped out of the treadmill and smiled pointing at the weights. Here's my own challenge. I shrugged and approached the weights. Long story short, he beat me in that too. We found out that I could comfortably lift 60 tons. My limit was 70 tons though, and that was after huffing and puffing. I was a little disappointed in myself. I hated losing, so I decided to at least secure one win. Plus I also needed a subject. I mean a partner to practice chi blocking on. I smiled in secret as Superboy and I faced each other on the sparring mat. So here are the rules. First one out of bounds loses. No dirty fighting. Hitting below the belts or blowing holes in each other's body. Superboy grunted and my shirt came off as well. I had a rocking bot now, all the more reason to show it. I saw Gan, our referee, blush even deeper at the testosterone on display. Superboy and I stood facing each other. His hands came up in a standardized guard. His form was firm and stable, feet set apart, and his front leaning forward. I kept a loose stance on my part. Ready, begin. Amgan S. Word, I sprang forward, cartwheeling to add momentum and increase chi flow according to the chi blocking forms I had integrated with. The best part about the forms was that they shared many similarities with airbending. Adding airbending to the forms brought about a sort of flavor to chi blocking. They worked together almost seamlessly to give me crazy flexibility and reaction time. I transitioned from the cartwheel to a twist in the air, coming down upon Superboy with a mock of a punch, the joint of my index finger protruding slightly from the rest of the fingers. This was to target the chi points better. Superboy swiped his fist at me but I grabbed his hand, twisted my body, flowing like water to his back. My hand lashed out to his armpit and he sucked in a breath as the arm went slack. Undeterred, Superboy threw a backhand while turning his body to keep me in his vision. You can't hit what you can't see after all. Except if you were me, I ducked the hand without looking and swept his legs from under him. My hand shot out multiple times before he could touch the ground and when he did, his body lay there motionless. W.H., what was that? He asked bewildered. I sat cross-legged while Mkin flew forward in worry. That, my friend is chi-blocking. Is he going to be okay? You don't worry about him. It's going to wear out in just a short while. Gan looked relieved at my words. I turned to address Superboy. I guess I can count this as my win? He grunted, a little annoyed, making me laugh. We then left for the kitchen after Mgan told us about the cookies she had made. They were actually good, especially given that they weren't burnt like the ones in the prime timeline. A day later, the others came to hang out in Mount Justice. Superboy was not around, however. Surprisingly, Superman had asked Superboy to accompany him for a patrol around Metropolis. I was really happy for him. No doubt it was a tactic for the older man to get a reading on his clone, but although their relationship hadn't started out smooth, I had hoped that it would go well. Miss M, and I decided to give them a tour of the base and its facilities. Of course things got interesting when Robin and Kid Flash decided to try and beat my record on the obstacle course. Chapter 12, Taking Flight. 30 advanced chapters in my pat.rayon. Patrayon.com slash St. Barbido. Colon, colon. General PV. Robin bent his knees as the alarm went off. Suddenly, he sprang forward, his feet barely losing balance on the rolling log as he ran on it. He heard the cheers from the rest as he ran on towards the next obstacle that was a wall with two pegs that went on to slots, which he used to climb. His hands seamlessly used the throttle pegs to climb, not even once did his feet touch the wall. He pulled himself over it and jumped, landing on the ground gently, rolling, and then using the momentum to add speed for the 20 feet high warped wall. He heard Wally ask if he would make it and Robin smiled. This was easy compared to the training he had gone through. Robin's legs pumped as his feet pushed off the wall to grasp its top, and then he used his hands to not only pull himself up but to also throw himself further leading to him grasping the rope and swinging to the next platform. 
Okay, that's cool. Aiden admitted. Before the blockbuster formula, throttle pegs always gave him trouble. Aiden watched on as Robin completed the rest of the obstacles and ended up with the second fastest time. 21 seconds. Aiden said, pressing on the timer. What? No way. Wally came over to see for himself. He beat you, Wally. Just accept it. He beat us all too except for Aiden. Calder told him. In last place was Superboy, who had been disqualified when he got frustrated at the flywheel and smashed the rolling plates. Next place was Calder at 25 seconds, then Wally at 22 seconds, and finally Aiden held the record at 19 seconds. Gan had refused, saying it wouldn't be fair because she would just fly past all the obstacles. Unsurprisingly, Robin was frustrated that he didn't beat Aiden. However, after learning that Aiden was at the obstacle course every day, he chalked it up to him being more familiar with the obstacles and promised he would beat his record. The team were enjoying themselves when Red Tornado's voice rang through the gym's PA system. Red Tornado to team. An emergency alert has been triggered at the power plant. I'm sending you there to investigate. Covertly. He added. Finally, a mission. Robin said as they ran out of the training room. How are you guys going to get there? Maybe I should scout ahead. Wally asked, his Google's coming on. No need. We can all use Mianna's ship. Aiden told them. Hello, Megan. Of course, follow me. Miss Martian took a turn, and the rest fell right behind her. They soon came upon her red oval craft. It's, ah, cute? Not aerodynamic, but definitely cute. She's asleep, Wally. Let me wake her up. The ship transformed upon Miss Martian's touch, and they entered. They took their seats, and Miss Martian controlled the ship towards the huge bay doors that were now open, courtesy of Red Tornado. Robin reached into the sleeve of his jacket and pulled out his yellow utility belt. You had that the whole time? Wally asked. You're just like you had your googles with you. Touche, dot. So what do you guys think it is? Wally asked looking around at the rest. They were already approaching the power plant in question. A huge ass tornado heading our way? Aiden responded. What? Wally's question was answered when he looked through the windshield of the ship and saw the tornado in question. Miss Martian, pull back. Aqualad said in urgency, but it was too late. The ship was sucked into the tornado, disorienting everyone. By a stroke of luck, Miss Martian took advantage of the tornado's motion to pull away by accelerating forward suddenly. The ship landed safely and they all jumped out. So what's the... Aiden cut his statement short when he caught sight of Robin trying to sneak away. Oh no you don't Robin. Everyone turned to stare at the boy wonder, whose sleeve was gripped in Aiden's hand. Robin chuckled. I was just going to scout ahead. You guys come up with the plan. I'll work with you. He then pulled on his sleeve and ran forward. Same with me. You guys come up with the plan. Wally said and sped off. So what's the plan? Miss Martian asked. The rest looked at each other and shrugged, running after their missing teammates. Several tornadoes had sprang up around the parking lot sending people screaming and stationary objects like the vehicles flying. Aiden's speed picked up and Superboy pulled up next to him. Miss Martian flew on ahead to block a vehicle about to fall on a few workers hiding behind another car. Get out of here. Aiden shouted at them unraveling the tornado aimed at their position. Aqualad and Superboy ran forward into the building, leaving Aiden and Miss Martian to get the civilians out of the scene. Aiden's PV. I remember this particular villain encounter pretty well. A villain called, Mr. Twister. He possessed Red Tornado's abilities and was very proficient in using them. It wouldn't be an easy fight. After helping the civilians to escape, I went to the back of the building to see if any more people needed help. I cleared that area as well and ran inside. Whoa. I jumped to the side to avoid colliding with Wally's body, after he was thrown out through the entrance. My hands came up, and I pulled apart the tornado coming at high velocity towards me. You possess aerokinetic abilities. Commendable use, but that will not help you came the robotic voice of the android floating out of the building. Twin tornadoes came at me from both sides. I swept out my hand and the gale produced, fanned out in a voluminous wave, pushing the tornadoes away from me. I ran forward and jumped at the android. He pointed his hands at me and an air bomb exploded out of my palm, aimed up at the sky. The force of the wind pushed me to the ground faster and I avoided the tornado above. The android quickly brought his hands down at my position to bombard me with the tornado still firmly in his control. I tried to unravel it like before but the force this time was greater and I was thrown back. I controlled the air in the surrounding to land safely on the ground next to Kid Flash. He got you too, huh? Not really. I couldn't get close to him, though. I quickly helped Kid Flash up while watching our opponent. Any idea, Kid? Yeah. Hit him faster than he can react to then you blast him with an air bomb or your new strength. I nodded. It was more than I had. Plus, I wanted to extend the fight a bit longer. I felt. I felt like I was at the cusp of something. Kid Flash sped off suddenly, leaving behind after images in his wake. I slid forward too, moving like a snake as I used the air to make minute changes to my steps in hope of confusing the enemy. All your efforts are futile. Kid flipped and dug both his feet on the android's torso. That's what you think, but frankly, nobody asked you. The android took a step back and pushed Kid away with a blast of air. My hand was already in motion when I saw the streaks of electric energy running down the android's limbs. I pushed Kid Flash away, and the electric bolts slammed onto the ground, unearthing the soil. I took the chance while the android's hands were overextended and slammed a fist with swirling air around it for speed and power onto his chest. He flew away towards a charging Superboy. Go to hell. Superboy slammed into Mr. Twister's back and sent him spinning away. 
Birdarang shot through the air, and an explosion followed after they made contact. The fight reminded me of the blockbuster one. I couldn't help but note just how well we worked together. Maybe we could win this. No sooner had that thought crossed my mind when I found myself twisting uncontrollably through the air. My clothes smoked as an electric current ran through my body, making my muscles seize up in pain. I slammed onto the wall of the building and left a crack as my body slumped to the ground. Maelstrom. Miss Martian cried out in worry. I'm okay, Miss Martian. Concentrate on the fight. No more games. The android shouted from afar as my mind struggled to concentrate on the fight. I had just taken his lightning strikes point blank. Hello, Megan. Mr. Twister is Red Tornado. Miss Martian said confidently while I slowly got up. How many androids do you know that can create tornadoes? Everyone stopped what they were doing. My face turned ugly in anger. What is wrong with you? He's not Red Tornado. Tornado would never put people in harm's way for any reason. I could see his realization dawn on their faces. Unfortunately, it was already too little too late. You think I'm Tornado? Let me prove you wrong. A sudden tornado sprang up near Kid Flash. This tornado was different. More aggressive and bigger. I stumbled forward in my burnt-up clothes and tried to take control of the air. I stretched out a hand and felt something. My hand stalled for just a brief second. I wish it hadn't. There was a cry of pain as Kid Flash was thrown away and smacked across a tree. An audible crack rang out and everyone's eyes widened as Wally's leg bent the wrong way. Wally's breathing picked up, while his body shook both in pain and in surprise. The fight stopped. Just like children, you also get distracted too easily. The android said while laughing. Robin, Aqualad, watch out. Two twin tornadoes sprang up under both teens and swung them around. I knew Mr. Twister's plan from the get-go. Wally was out of the fight and Superboy, he took a running leap at the android, but the same lightning shock I had been hit with slammed him into the ground. He was still trying to get out of the groove his body had made. Miss Martian tried to pelt the android with trees and whatever else was lying around, but the harsh winds surrounding him were too much. No, this fight was mine. Wally was hurt because of me. This android was turning to scrap metal. Earlier, I had felt something when I had connected with the tornado in his control. The air had leaped in excitement at my touch. That's when I realized I had crossed through the threshold. I didn't need to look at the system to see I was firmly in the master level. My hand rose up, and I pulled. Every tornado in the area dispersed. Aqualad and Robin landed on the ground as they turned to me. I'll handle Mr. Twister while you guys come up with a plan. I said running forward past them. Handle me? I. He started. Shut up, you scrap metal. Time for you to get your can kicked. I relished the look of awe and surprise as the wind carried my form upwards and I shot off into air in the classic Superman pose. There was no warning as I plowed into the android at high speeds. He can fly now. Robin shouted. Yes, boy wonder. I could fly now. Chapter 13. First subskill unlocked. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. My fist slammed into Mr. Twister and the momentum carried us off into the docks of the settlement near Mount Justice, the happy harbor town. Our trajectory spun us to the water. We skimmed above it, the water roiling behind us as I put my all into pushing him in. Mr. Twister regained control over his limbs and a huge tornado appeared under him, sending the water erupting up into a wave that headed for the docks. I looked over in concern that was quickly eased as I caught sight of Aqualad near the beach. The brief respite allowed Mr. Twister to fly further away from me. I will admit, child, you caught me off guard. Not anymore. The wind picked up as even the clouds above swirled over us. His limbs sparked with electric energy and a beam of lightning appeared from above and slammed onto me. A hand came up and my impromptu windshield protected me, scattering the streaks of blue lightning to the sides. The shield held easily. I had access to air constructs now, perks of getting to master level no doubt. The shield was a pale green color. I enlarged it to cover my body as Twister's signature tornadoes besieged me from all sides. My bubble of wind held, swirling around not unlike the first time I went into the Avatar state. You love tornadoes, huh? Let's see how you like it standing on the receiving end. I told the android. My hands reached to the sides and forcefully took control of his tornadoes. Impossible. I combined them into one and sent it over to him. Improbable maybe, but not impossible. The tornado slammed onto a dozen more he created while flying back. All I did was incorporate his attacks into mine. He tried to fly away from the scene, but I unraveled the gigantic tornado and pulled it close to me. The wind roared as it jumped to follow my orders, sending water spraying all around me. The sea under me churned as I pointed my hand out to the android flying towards the settlement. Behind me, numerous pale green constructs of blades formed at my urging. My hand fell and the constructs shot forward at more than 300 miles per hour. They cut through the air leaving behind a hissing sound. The android was eviscerated. Slashes cut through his metallic shell and his body sparked as the limbs detached and fell off. He lost control of his flight and smashed onto a warehouse. I pushed my hands to the side and the air and water calmed down. I flew forward and instantly found myself feeling the sensation of free movement in the air. The others were gathering at the place where the android had crashed, so I leaned my body forward and shot off towards them. I laughed in glee as I saw my reflection on the water. I touched the water, doing twists and turns and all too soon found myself arriving next to the team. Hey guys, I can fly now. I told them in excitement. Robin snickered. Yeah, we saw that. Though for a minute there you looked like a fish out of water. Robin said referring to my inexperience with flying. 
I did the immature thing and stuck out my tongue at him. He laughed while approaching the limbless android who was sparking. Man, that was so cool. Wally told me while patting me on the shoulder. You did a great job, Maelstrom. Aqualad added with the same soft smile we knew him for. Miss Martian was the most excited. I am so happy. I have so much to teach you. Now that I'm not the only one who can fly anymore. She flew over and hugged me. I patted her back awkwardly. Damn, Ngan was strong. Over her shoulder, I saw Superboy's face and instead of the jealousy I was expecting, he had a small smile on his face. He noticed me and held up a thumbs up. A little of the tension inside me eased out and I felt a genuine happiness. I wish I could thank my past self for deciding to talk to Superman. Guys, you need to see this. Wally called us over and we all approached just as a slim middle-aged man stumbled out of the remains of the wrecked android. Foul I call foul? Gan. I told her. Got it. A huge rock rose up and smashed onto the android. Wait. No. The protests from the rest were ignored in favor of turning the android into pieces of metal. Wait. I held up a hand to stop Robin's aggressive statements. Look. Miss Martian lifted the rock telekinetically, revealing the broken metal plates and parts of the android. Oh. Wally muttered. Nice. We couldn't risk letting him get close to us. He might have had a contingency plan to blow himself up in our vicinity. How did you know? Robin fell back on his detective's side. I asked Miss Martian to read his mind telepathically while we were fighting him, but she couldn't. The only way that is possible is if Mr. Twister was inorganic. Miss Martian supplied. Right. But the simple answer? You guys didn't see it, but his left foot was sparking due to damage. Last time I checked, a person bleeds with an injury like that. Superboy noticed the red light from one of the android's eyes and stomped on it. I'm hungry. He stated and left for Miss Martian's ship that had just arrived. Wally flashed over to Gan's side while Aqualad left to stand a bit further from the rest of us. He brought a hand to his earpiece and gave Red Tornado status update on the mission. Hey beautiful, what do you say we go and make more of those awesome cookies? Wally said while winking. Robin laughed. We? You're going to be eating more than baking. Dude, come on. Aqualad and I watched their teasing and chuckled. Once we were all in the ship, Gan took us back to the cave. That man found time out of his schedule to come to the debrief. He had us go over everything for one full hour before letting us leave. I stayed behind after the others had left to go have some cookies to talk to Dark Knight. Your abilities increased. He commented, reviewing the report we had made on the android. The League had gathered up its parts and I was sure Batman would look closely into the perpetrator behind the whole thing. I remembered something. There were other androids apart from Red Tornado in one continuation. He looked up from the data pad and narrowed his eyes. That's not in the information you gave me. I shrugged. I guess I forgot. There are many timelines and alternate realities. It's confusing at times and some details are forgotten. I see. You'll write up a report on all you can remember. Now, what do you need? He went right back to the pad and I was silent as I mulled over what I wanted to ask. It's... I clenched my jaw. I was thinking of introducing some of the stuff from my world on this earth. Batman looked up. Explain. I pulled up a chair and rested my hands on the table. You know, things like music and books. The glare came back again. No. I knew this was going to be hard, but I couldn't do it alone while also being a hero. I needed Batman's or rather Bruce Wayne's help. Look, I know your reasoning behind saying no. I stopped to judge his reaction and continued when I saw he was listening. You think that I might mess up and disclose something that I shouldn't. Which is understandable, given my situation. My fingers started tapping on the table, a nervous tick I've always had. That can be solved by vetting everything before I release it. You're avoiding the main reason. Batman's gruff voice answered. His wide eyes speared through my own and I felt like there was nothing I could hide. The tapping increased. Okay. I sighed. You also think that the chances of other fictional worlds existing is highly probable due to this planet being real here yet just a story back in my home dimension. You're worried that someone from another dimension might travel here by whatever fluke and come across a spoiler on their life. M.H. He grunted, making me shake my head. DC doesn't do crossovers except maybe with Marvel. And this discussion is over Maelstrom. I got up a little angry. I knew Batman was stubborn but come on. All right, I get the point about the books and whatnot. But what about music? I think he might have cocked an eyebrow at me. I just want to do something I'm good at. Being a superhero is a noble use for my abilities, but I feel like it's still not enough for me. My uncle owned a recording studio, and I have grown up with music surrounding me. The Dark Knight was silent for a while. I will think about it. Was that the best I could get out of him? Yes. Did I get the hint to leave it at that? Yes. Did I follow it? No. Look, Batman. I know you're concerned about a whole lot more than some teenager from another dimension asking you to let him do something he loves, but there's nothing to think about. This is something I am not willing to back down on or make concessions about. I just thought I should inform you out of respect. Have a nice day, sir. I turned and left the room, trying and failing to calm down my shaking hand. That was very nerve-wracking. Somehow standing up to Gotham's protector was much more scary than fighting Blockbuster and Mr. Twister combined. I had meant every word I said to him. I loved music and now that I was in another world, I wanted to bring some of my favorite songs to life. Especially considering that this world didn't have Chris Brown, Drake, or any of the well-known stars. I won't lie. I was excited to be the pioneer of a different kind of hip-hop, trap, R&B, you name it. The shit I had was going to leave the whole world shook. 
Too bad Batman said no to me writing some of the bestsellers from my world. You know what? What if I use a pen name? Not only that, but I could think of a few light novels I could discreetly upload online. Then when I have already established myself, bam, I come up with Harry Potter. For this plan to work, the telepathic lessons were a must now. I needed to remember the books clearer. The whole team was at the kitchen, but I didn't feel like talking to anyone just yet. I wanted to freshen up first. Martian Manhunter was coming for the telepathic lessons I had asked for. Gan had been showing me some exercises on how I could increase focus by getting rid of distractions. The lessons were good and really informative, but I also found them a bit lacking. Gan refused to challenge me. She didn't want to hurt me by taking it too far, so Manhunter was my only chance at not being babied. I had my shower and sat down on the bed after remembering to check out my status. The first sub's kill was unlocked. I wondered what the next one was going to be. Air element. Master. Flight. Unlocked. Locked. Chapter 14. Santa Prisca. Colon. Colon. Aiden's PV. I held the guitar firmly in my hands and began plucking the strings. It had taken a while to get used to my new strength, but I could now play again. Well, come on Aiden, we're waiting. Gan urged me, while Wally was shoving the cookies that Gan had taken to making whenever we were all around, in his mouth. Yeah, I could be beating your record now. Robin intoned while smiling behind his glasses. I rolled my eyes. Patience guys. I believe he is about to start. Thank you Calder. I pray you live a full life. I cleared my throat and fidgeted in my seat. I was nervous. I hadn't played ever since I had come to this dimension. Not seriously like now or in front of the whole team or any other audience for that matter. It had been three days since the fight with Twister and we were all back to a 100%. I had decided against playing him for the weekend by Coldplay to them, which is what I really wanted to do. To start off, I needed something catchy yet simple. The melody to Pink Sweats at my worst started playing and everyone became entranced. I had always had a lyrical tenor, great for singing but I had trouble controlling my breathing. Funnily enough, after the blockbuster formula, the problem disappeared. Can I call you baby? Can you be my friend? Can you be my lover up until the very end? Let me show you love. Oh, no pretend. Stick by my side even when the world is caving in. Yeah. Oh, 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 don't, don't you worry. I'll be there whenever you want me. I need somebody who can love me at my worst. No, I'm not perfect, but I hope you see my worth. Cause it's only you. Nobody knew. I put you first. And for you, girl, I swear I do the worst. I put in all my emotions, my fear at finding myself in a fictional world, missing my family so damn much, breaking up with my girlfriend just before I left my world, my hope that things would turn out okay and happiness that despite it all, I had managed to make friends and find a place to belong. I quickly wiped a tear discreetly after I finished up the song and looked around. Everyone had open mouths. Guys, I said, knocking them out of their stupor. Wow, I didn't know you could sing like that. Gan said while blushing. Yeah, that was actually pretty good. Robin added. Didn't expect that at all. Wally said and then went back to stealing cookies from Aqualad's plate. I liked it. Superboy told me while smiling. They're all right. That was very good. You have an amazing gift, Aiden. I hate being praised and that's because I don't know how to react to it. I nodded and looked away while laughing. Thanks, guys. Wally super sped to my side. So Aiden, what do you think about forming a band? You can sing, and I can play. We can call ourselves the huh. You can play? Don't crack jokes like that, Wally. Robin snickered. Dude, I can totally play. I just need a few lessons and bam, drummer extraordinaire at your service. No one looked convinced. I decided to spare Wally the grim reality of how hard learning music was and patted his shoulder. I'll think about it. Batman to team. Everyone gather at the hall. We rose up and left for the briefing on our first official mission. To investigate Santa Prisca. I didn't recall this mission clearly. And the lessons with Martian Manhunter were focused more on concealing my memories more securely. I knew the mission with Simon was just around the corner, so I had had to forego the exercises to better recall my memories for hiding them away better. The mission was pretty straightforward. It was to covertly investigate the reason why the Venom Neo steroid shipment supply lines were stalled while the factory seemed to be operating normally. Batman probably thought that the supply lines had been changed, but he wanted to make sure before jumping to conclusions. So who is the leader? Robin asked when Batman was finished with the brief. The Dark Knight and Red Tornado looked at each other and seemed to come to a conclusion. We will let you decide that amongst yourselves. Oh boy. I was strapped on my seat inside Miss Martian's bioship. My breath came out slow and long a tactic to center myself for better focus. It was one of the exercises that Martian Manhunter had taught to me. You breath in and hold your breath for 10 seconds, then you breath out and stay like that for 10 seconds before inhaling again. The cycle slows down your heart rate, ABD calms the mind. We are arriving near the island. I'm putting the bio ship in camouflage mode. Gen informed us. Five seconds later, I opened my eyes when she added. Approaching drop zone A in 20. Aqualad got up and pressed on his belt buckle. The normally red upper section of his suit turned gray. These were the new suits given to us by Batman for covert missions. Gan brought the bio ship low, near the water. A section on the floor of the bio ship opened up and Aqualad jumped through it. His mission was to swim and covertly approach the beach to take out the motion and heat sensors. He radioed in and informed us the detectors were down. 
Approaching drop zone B. Gan controlled the ship, once on the island to drop us off a distance away from the beach. Wally pressed his belt buckle and his suit turned gray, not unlike Aqualad. Miss Martian simply morphed her costume into something more inconspicuous. Luckily my own suit was predominantly black. Superboy on the other hand preferred to go as he was. To quote him, no capes or tights. Robin was a stealth master, it didn't matter if he was dressed like a rainbow or not. Inform me when you land so that we can regroup. Aqualad said. Roger that. Robin answered. Boy Wonder and Wally used a rope to land while I merely floated down, carried by the air. I landed softly as Superboy jumped from the ship. The air under my control slowed him down before he could smash onto the ground. I didn't need your help. He whispered harshly. It's a covert mission. Had you landed, the loud sound would have risked us getting found out. I whispered back, and he shrugged. Whatever. Superboy grumbled, disappointed that he hadn't made a crater under him. Hey Roby, I hate it when he does that. Kid Flash stated, referencing Robin's disappearance. I'll go on ahead and scout. He then did the same thing as Robin and disappeared into the jungle. Do you think he sees the irony? Superboy asked while we followed after Kid Flash. Nope. Not even if it slapped him in the face. Our feet were as silent as could be. I wasn't experienced enough to fly in such thick foliage. Man, fiction makes it seem easy to fly, but in reality, it's like learning how to swim. It takes time to learn all the fancy moves and increase speed in the water. To avoid detection, I decided to stick to running. Gan floated above us, invisible. We came up on Kid Flash hiding behind a few rocks looking out at a beaten path. His googles were on, and he pointed to his front. There's a group making their way here. He whispered. Two actually. There's another one with guns coming from the other side. Superboy corrected him. Are they together? Miss Martian asked. Let me go and find out. It will only take a second. Kid Flash announced and blitzed, leaving behind after images and protests from the rest of us. We seriously need a leader. I muttered in exasperation. Our resident speedster slipped and fell between the two groups as they begun opening fire against each other. Well, the stealth part is useless now. Superboy stated and jumped into the fight. I brought a hand to the earpiece I had on. Maelstrom to Aqualad, do you copy? Send over. We are currently engaging two opposing groups. Follow the sound of gunshots to our position. Out. Gan had moved ahead and was throwing around Cobra goons like they weighed nothing. A few birdarangs fell between the men on the other group and exploded, sending the men flying away. A second later Boy Wonder was on the scene incapacitating goons left and right, next to Kid Flash. What happened to being stealthy? Remember Covert? Why didn't you follow my lead and vanish into the jungle? He asked in annoyance. You didn't tell us anything. We are not mind readers you know. Kid Flash shot back and I agreed. I sailed over both of them and kicked out. A huge gale sent the goons flying away in shouts of surprise and pain. He's right Robin. Remember most of us are still very inexperienced. I told him. A hail of fire cut off what he was going to say next, and we took cover behind a tree. Robin threw out smoke bombs that obscured the surroundings. Kid Flash ran out and took care of three of them, while I used the cover to pull up on the rest. One Cobra goon stumbled back as I came out of the smoke suddenly. He rounded up his gun to shoot, but I ducked the fire, my fists came up, and I threw a few jabs on his armpits. His hands slumped, unresponsive. My palm instantly shot out, and a blast of wind landed on his torso, throwing him to his partner. Motherfucker. One of the two left shouted and shot at me. I flew up. Escaping the bullets and a tornado appeared before me, sweeping through the two of them and slamming them onto a tree. I floated down as the gunfire died down finally. Aqualad had regrouped up with the rest and I flew forward to join them. Everyone was gathered surrounding the tied-up men. Who's the wrestler? I asked them, pointing to a middle-aged man in face paint. Bane, no doubt. Chapter 15, Cobra Venom. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. It all makes sense now. These hood wearing guys are part of Cobra. Robin said referring to some of the men we had tied up. Well, share it with the rest of us. Wally told him impatiently. I'm thinking that Cobra came in and hijacked the factory from these other guys. That's why the factory is still operating normally, but the supply lines have been cut off. So what are they making? More Cobra? Or something else? Aqualad's question made the boy wonder rub his chin. That's what I need to find out. You need to find out? We're a team, Rob. You're making it seem as if you're the leader. Wally protested heavily. I am the one with the most experience. Dude, you're just a 13-year-old kid. Well, I hadn't known Robin was that young. When did Batman even start training him? Ah, and you're a mature 15. Now is not the time, guys. We need to stay on track. Aqualad broke the argument apart, leaving one teenager frustrated while the younger one was smugly smiling. Ha ha ha, such clever minus. Bane laughed. Perhaps I can be of assistance? It is my factory after all. I turned to look at Gan and nodded imperceptibly towards Bane. Realization dawned on her and she nodded back. I walked closer to Bane and crouched before him. And why should we trust you? I asked him, making him chuckle because I am your only chance to get into the factory undetected. I looked at him skeptically. You know of a secret entrance? Yes, and I propose we work together. As the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I nodded and got up. Did you get it, Miss Martian? I inquired, walking away from Bane. It wasn't easy, but I was able to see where the secret entrance is. Robin gave her a thumbs up as everyone else looked confused. I asked her to read his mind then started asking pointed questions to make it easier for her. 
That's good foresight, Maelstrom. Aqualad praised, making me shrug. She did everything. You tricked me? That is very smart, but you still do not know the layout of the factory on the inside. You need me. Not really. Get me to the control room, and I'll have access to everything. Robin crushed Bane's last hope. Hell yeah. Let's do this. Kid Flash said, putting on his goggles. Wait. I think we should inform the League first. The mission was to investigate covertly. The situation has changed drastically from the mission parameters. I held up a hand and suggested. No. Not yet. We still need to investigate and gather some concrete intel to present to the League. Having them intervene on our mission is the same thing as saying we're not ready. Robin spoke up. I looked at everyone's faces and saw determination. A smile worked its way onto my face. Just making sure we're on the same page. Something tells me, this mission will not be easy. Okay. What's the plan? Wally asked. They all turned to look at me. What? You can't be serious. You took charge during the Mr. Twister fiasco. Wally shrugged, making the others nod. I looked at Robin. And you're okay with this? No. Not in the slightest. But I want to hear you out first. Besides, us following your plan doesn't automatically make you the leader. Just the guy with the plan. He smirked in that infuriating way. I sighed. All right. So I'm thinking we keep it simple. First of all, Dan, did you get any other information from El Lucador's mind? Robin snickered while Bane ground his teeth. I think the name disturbs him. Wonder what he needs to do to be turbed. No one gets it, bro. Wally's words made Robin scoff. The buyer is arriving tonight. That is the reason why he, she pointed at Bane, was trying to regain control of his factory. I smiled at the others. Gan connect our minds. She nodded after getting a nod of consent from everyone and inside my mind, I felt an alien sensation. I didn't want to risk anyone hearing the plan. I stopped to study their faces. Seeing the looks of concentration, I continued. So here it goes. We use the secret entrance to go in. Robin accesses the control room to find out as much as he can about what they're making, who's funding them, and who the buyer is. The rest of us will remain in position, hiding. Once we have gathered enough evidence to present to Batman, we'll take out the lights and deal with the underlings first. Then as a whole we'll attack Cobra and his circle as a team. He must be packing some real firepower if he managed to force Bane out of his factory. Before the buyer arrives, the factory needs to be under our control. We have roughly half an hour based on the information stolen from Bane's mind. Any objections? There were none. Things are bad. Cobra managed to combine Venom with Blockbuster. The result is three times as strong as Venom and Permanent. Robin informed us through the link. So just as we thought, Cobra is no doubt working with someone else with the know-how to combine the two formulas together. I doubt they can do that by themselves. Kid Flash added, Have you found out anything about the mysterious buyer? Nothing. Robin answered Aqualad's question. Okay, guys. We have learned what we can. It's time we took these guys down. Kid, get ready. Take away all their guns and knock them out once the light goes off. Use your googles. Gan bind them together using the zip ties Robin gave you. Superboy distract the big guy while Aqualad knocks him down. I doubt he can resist a high enough charge. Robin and I will take down Cobra and the girl. I reminded them the plan. Roger. Cool. Let's do this. I'm ready. M and H. I aim for the lights and tiny wind bullets shot off from my fingers. The light bulbs above shattered and the whole factory was plunged into darkness. Instantly, guns started firing wildly as the Cobra goons were taken out by Kid Flash. Luckily, all of us could fight in the dark. Superboy, Gan and Aqualad because of their unique biology, the rest of us because of the thermal imaging and night vision on our mask, goggles, and visor. That advantage was what enabled us to overwhelm them despite being outnumbered. Within a few seconds, most of the Cobra goons were down. Three figures appeared on my visor. The night vision had a green tint to everything, but I could tell that one of those figures was massive. Mammoth find out who was causing this and crush them. A deep voice from the one in the middle said. Mammoth grunted and took a few bounding steps into the dark, towards the last position he had heard of movement. Cobra was either very confident in his capabilities to split up with his main powerhouse or a fool. Superboy took a running leap and punched Mammoth out into the open night. A stream of moonlight shone through the hole in the factory illuminating the surroundings. I stepped out into the light. The palm of my hand faced backwards as I gathered the air around it. Stand down, Cobra. We have you surrounded and trust me, we will take you down hard, if you fail to comply. The girl, Shimmer I think, stepped forward to stand between me and Cobra. How far the has League fallen to allow mere children to do their dirty work? Robin, now. Let's see if you keep the same sentiment once we kick your ass. Birdarang shot through the air as Shimmer's hand rose up. The Boy Wonder's projectile dug themselves around Shimmer and the blast lifted her off her feet with a cry of pain. In the same motion, I pushed my hand out and an air bomb exploded outwards, sending an unsuspecting Cobra flying off to slam onto the walls of the building. Cobra fell to his knees with a grunt and raised his head only to find my fist heading straight for his face. The hood had come off and I saw a slight widening of his eyes. At the last minute, he bent his head backwards and managed to evade my right hook, only to miss the chi blocking strike aimed at his mid-ribs. The blow connected and his breathing became labored, his fingers swept out but a blast of wind blasted him onto the wall again. Coming down, I aimed for the chi points on all his limbs and Cobra slumped down, immobilized. Just then, a telepathic message came through our link. Mammoth is down. How are things on your end? Aqualad informed us. 
Cobra has been taken care of. Robin, I sent through an image of the bald and pale man. Robin chuckled. That's Cobra all right. Miss Martian has the rest of the underlings tied up. I'm currently copying everything they have in their systems. Then I'm scrubbing the whole thing. Kid Flash is with me. Robin reported. Wait, I can hear something. Superboy told us. It's a helicopter. The buyer. Wally asked. Highly possible. Let's regroup and lay an ambush. Miss Martian sneak into the helicopter once it lands and sabotage it. The rest of us will capture this mysterious buyer. Aqualad laid out the plan. I'll stay behind to make sure that Cobra and his cult don't escape their bindings. I told them and broke off contact. I looked at the man in question and saw his eyes watching me with hate. I don't like the look on your face. Something tells me you want nothing more than to skin me. So off to dreamland with you. You will pay for. A sphere of wind surrounded his head, cutting off his words and sucked out the oxygen around him. He suffocated and passed out. I didn't want him to break his bindings and have us repeat the same dance and song. Plus I had another reason. I closed my eyes and connected with the air. A small breeze swept through the whole factory. I used the wind to sense any movements throughout the building and smiled once I found out that the team had left. I was all alone with Cobra and his men. Gunfire started outside the factory and I knew I only had a few minutes at most. Despite being a good mercenary, I doubt Sportsmaster could handle three sidekicks and two superpowered aliens in a fight. I approached a crate with the new product that was riddled with bullets and opened it. Inside I saw the vials of Cobra Venom, most of which were destroyed. I nabbed two of the vials and placed them into my utility belt. I couldn't use them right now because I couldn't know what effect they would have when mixed with the blockbuster formula. After doing that, the team came back with a bound Sportsmaster. The mission was more than a success. The only problem was that Bane had escaped. Chapter 16. Meeting Someone Interesting. Underscore 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 Aiden's PV. I'm impressed by how you managed to adapt to the change in situation. Furthermore, you managed to not only capture Cobra but also Sportsmaster who was the middleman, increasing the League's chances at apprehending the main buyers behind the whole thing. The factory has been destroyed together with the rest of the formula. Wally high-fived me. Hell yeah. Our first mission was a success. Don't celebrate too early. I expect a written report from everyone on where you messed up. The mood plummeted a little at Batman's glare. That said, good job team. Batman added, taking away the tension. We looked at each other and smiled. One more thing. We turned our attention to the Dark Knight. Who did you choose to be your leader? As one, we all looked towards Aqualad. The Atlantean blinked in surprise. Are you sure? Although the question was directed to all of us, his eyes were on Robin. Boy Wonder snickered. Yeah, just until you inevitably mess up and I end up carrying the team. We all understood he was just joking. What about you, Aiden? It was your plan that helped us complete the mission. I shrugged my shoulders. I won't lie. Leading this team seems like an awesome thing to do, but compared to you, Wally and Robin, I still have a lot more to learn. You're the right guy for this, Calder. We all believe in you. Caldurum closed his eyes and when he opened them, I saw resolve. He stepped forward. Thank you. I accept the responsibility and I hope we all work together. The rest of the team left for the night. Robin and Wally had school tomorrow after all. Speaking of school, we were slated to join a few weeks from now. Batman had decided that a few weeks was enough time for the three of us, Gan, Superboy, and I to get accustomed to Earth. Then it was off to high school. Oh goody. I opened the door to my room after saying goodnight to Gan and Superboy. I removed the visor and ran a hand through my hair. Throwing the visor on the bed, my feet took me to the bathroom for some much-needed privacy. The door to the bathroom clicked close behind me and I reached a hand into my utility belt. Out came the two vials. My heart hammered in my chest at how easy it had been sneaking the vials past the team and Batman. I breathed out to calm down my nerves. Batman told me explicitly to never use a strength-enhancing formula again. Not only for the added danger but also because he thought I could easily be overcome by the greed for more power. The Dark Knight, unfortunately, didn't understand why this was necessary. That shit was coming in the future. Wally even dies though I couldn't remember why or how. The power to protect myself and my new friends was needed. I couldn't tell anyone that I knew the future of this planet. I had used the exercises Manhunter was teaching me to hide those memories as best as I could. So the responsibility to make sure we made it out of this alive fell to my shoulders. I opened one of the vials and drank it down. Two days later. You know, when you told me to come with you on this patrol, I didn't think that things would get interesting this fast. I told Superboy. I was flying beside him while he was jumping across rooftops. Superman was flying ahead of us, headed to the bridge connecting Gotham and Metropolis. Well, maybe it's your presence? On my last two patrols with Superman, things were relatively quiet. I scoffed at his words. Relatively quiet for the Man of Steel is an alien invasion. Superboy laughed. I think you should pull on ahead, there's a school bus hanging from the bridge. I gave him a thumbs up and shot off after Superman. Superman went under the bridge to hold it up from collapsing. 
I flew to the front of the bus and waved my hands. A soft but strong gale pushed the bus back onto the bridge just as Superboy arrived and saved another car from plunging into the water. I went under the bus and easily lifted it up, then deposited it on a section of the bridge that was less likely to fall under its weight. I waved at the kids as they cheered in happiness. The driver breathed out a sigh of relief and muttered a thank you. I flew down towards Superboy and high-fived him. Good job, boys. Now let's. A transmission came through his earpiece and Superman answered. Slow down, Arrow. No, I'm available. I'll be there in a few minutes. He turned to address us. Sorry, boys. We will have to get that apple pie another time. League business. I'll call you later, Superboy. It's Connell. Connor on Earth. Superboy said while looking away. Superman looked surprised for a bit, before smiling and patting Superboy's shoulder. That's a good name. We will talk more about that later. Then he was off. Do you think he liked it? Superboy asked me once we had escaped the reporters. We were sitting on the Daily Planet's roof, eating corn dogs. Yeah. I mean, it's a great name. Plus you acknowledged your Kryptonian heritage and subtly told him you consider him as part of your family. I comforted him, knowing how much it meant to him for someone to say that. Thank you, Aiden. We were quiet for a while, content to watch the city. What about you? Do you have family? He asked me, making me stop chewing. I wasn't ready to talk about that. Not yet. It's getting late. I think we should head back to the cave. I stood up, avoiding the look of sadness that flashed across his face. General P.V. Santos was a businessman. He had started off as a common goon for hire, doing odd jobs for the mob then joining Penguin once Batman had started targeting the Falcons. So Santos had wisely jumped ship. For the next half a decade, he worked for every supervillain in town, always managing to escape the long arm of the law and more than that, Batman's radar. Santos liked to think he was a smart guy. Hence after saving away a tidy sum from all his illegal activities, he had set up a half a dozen legal restaurants around town and used his connections to purchase a building in Crime Alley on Theater District for his less than legal activities. The building was a generic strip club, but down in the basement, that's where the real show took place. An underground fighting club. The show brought him money like crazy. It was where people came to see men and women tear each other apart for cash. Now, Santos knew the rules of the game. First, never bite off more than you can chew. Second, always have an in with the cops. Third, stay the fuck away from the top five list, and lastly, don't mess with the freaks. The former two were self-explanatory. The latter two were a bit more complicated. The top five list was the list of the supervillains you did not want to tangle with. Number one was the insane prince of all crime in Gotham, the Joker. Santos was a man of morals, however little they may be, and the Joker sickened him. The next was Harley Quinn, mostly because of her relationship with number one. Third was Poison Ivy, she was toxic in all the ways the law deemed it. A terrorist in other words, number four was fucking Scarecrow, and finally, the Riddler. Other villains like Two-Face at least had a modicum of respect to their goons. Santos left the underling business mostly because of the top five. The last rule was to never mess with the freaks. By freaks, he meant Grundy, Killer Croc, Firefly, and Victor's Ash. Despite keeping that rule almost judiciously, trouble came looking for him instead. His eyes tried to keep up with the clearly superhuman movements of the newest contender in the room. He was wearing a balaclava that covered his whole face only leaving his eyes open. The man was five feet nine inches and was very fit. The black t-shirt he was wearing hugged his frame tightly. Brown skin suggested he was African-American. He also had on black camo pants and sports shoes. An amateur. An amateur that was clearly winning. This was his fifth fight in a row, and he had won all of them, swiftly and ruthlessly. Santos didn't like it. The guy was a superhuman, no doubt. A metahuman, likely. He had taken an almost seven feet tall ripped giant down with a single punch. The crowd had gone silent before exploding into a wild cheer. People had started betting for him, and that meant Santos wasn't making money. Something had to change. He signaled to the event coordinator, and the man nodded. It was time to bring out his special guest. She owed him a favor after all. Aiden's PV. Five fights and five wins later, I knew the next match was going to be my last. Especially when the next fighter turned out to be someone very interesting. The crowd went wild as they made way for her. The adoration was intense. Her features were slightly Asian, but she had blonde hair. She was dressed in a sports bra, fingerless gloves, and her face was hidden behind a green mask that covered the upper section of her face only. Her identity hit me like an electric shock. I was standing before my soon-to-be teammate, Artemis Croc. Her eyes were set in determination. This wasn't a fight I could take casually and expect to win. Going all out wasn't an option either. I was here to try and control the added strength from the Cobra Venom formula. Hitting her too hard would kill her. I brought my hands up and we faced each other. Artemis' eyes grew weary once she started my form, but that didn't deter her. She took a step forward and attacked. Chapter 17, Solomon Grundy. Colon, colon. General PV. Artemis Croc. That was her name. Mature for her age. Circumstances had forced that maturity upon her shoulders. That and her parents. One of them being a former supervillain, the other being very much still in the game. She also had a sister that had followed on her father's footsteps. Fortunately, Artemis still had her mother, and she was determined to break the chain. Artemis was going to be a hero. For that to happen though, she had to pay off some debts. Get into the hero business with a clean slate. 
Start over without any skeletons hiding in her closet. Not more than she already had at least. Paying off the favor she owed Santos meant fighting in his underground fights. Artemis' training was enough for her to dominate the scene but the opponent standing before her was different. She could immediately tell it. This wasn't going to be an easy fight. Artemis drowned out the noise as she watched the guy. Strong but with a physique that emphasized speed and endurance. She wouldn't outlast him. That meant putting him down quickly. She ran forward and started the fight with a jab. A jab that turned out to be a feint as her leg shot off to hit his thigh. A strike that would compromise his movements. Her opponent brought his knee up and blocked Artemis' leg with the side of his shin. Artemis rebounded and transitioned to a round kick aimed at her opponent's head. The guy's foot lashed out quicker than Artemis could react to and buried itself right onto her gut. Artemis clenched her jaw and moved with the blow, flipping backwards to bleed out the momentum. She tried to bring her breathing back under control and sprang forward once more. This time she came up from the side with a left hook, trying to reduce the chances of a direct hit on her body by her fast footwork. Punches, jabs and swift kicks were exchanged in a crazy flurry of blows. The crowd cheered in ecstasy as the fight raged on. Artemis' fighting spirit was awakened by then, and a smile appeared on her face. She saw the same look on her opponent's face and knew he was also enjoying it. It felt like she was sparring with Jade again. The smile slipped off her face when in a particular movement she overextended and her opponent let loose two very fast blows that sent her reeling. The kick that followed the unexpected blows sent her to dreamland. Aiden's PV. Shit. I got lost in the fight and forgot to regulate my strength and speed. The crowd was going ballistic as I ran forward to see if Artemis was okay. The ref called the match in my favor after the countdown got to 10. I slapped her lightly and she groaned on the ground, trying to get up. Hey, you okay? She shook her head and got up gingerly. Let go of me. The words were curt and I had no choice but to comply. I followed her swaying hips as she left the ring and shook my head to get rid of the distracting thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, your new champion, Eng. The crowd started cheering me on with the name I had picked. I know, I have no originality. Bite me. Having bet 500 bucks on myself. I went home with five grand due to the earlier fights. It wasn't a lot when you're working under someone like Batman who was a freaking billionaire, but it felt nice. Something about hard-earned money being fulfilling and all that. The real prize I had gotten out of all of this was the experience and getting to meet Artemis. The Cobra Venom had increased my strength by a substantial amount. Although not as big an increment as the time I took Blockbuster, it had been enough to throw my control off balance a little. That wasn't a problem anymore. I left the building and went through an alley where I had stashed a hood on a dumpster that I took out in war. Then I walked down the street towards the nearest Zeta tube that was four blocks away in an old tailor shop. My footsteps were silent on the sidewalk. I came across a few people on the way that steered clear from me, showing just how cautious Gothamites were. During my walk, I noticed a figure following after me from the rooftops of the buildings I was walking under. Could it be Robin or Batman? I wondered before getting rid of that notion. They had no idea I was even in Gotham, or that I had left the cave. The only other person who would be interested in me would be Artemis. She was probably curious about me. I had beaten her easily despite the fact that she had been trained by Sportsmaster himself. And that guy was a badass. I continued walking silently, curious about whether she would actually confront me or not. I crossed the street to the next one and rounded on the corner of a building. This part of the street was a bit more populated. There was a strip club, Chinese restaurant, and even a Starbucks on it. It's like after leaving Crime Alley behind, I found myself in another world. Artemis followed me closely just as I got closer to the shop with the Zeta tube. Then something unexpected happened. The manhole cover on the road exploded in a shower of concrete and metal. The screech of tires was heard as the cars driving on the street bumped into each other. Pandemonium exploded and people started running away while a figure rose up from the sewers. Seven feet tall, grayish skin, patches of similar gray hair, ripped clothes and a body as huge as the Incredible Hulk. Born on a Monday. My eyes widened. Solomon, fucking Grundy. The zombie looked around and then roared. The air carried with it a rotten smell that made me almost gag. A woman disoriented from her vehicle crashing onto another screamed out in fright upon seeing Grundy. Grundy rounded up on her. Grundy hates loud woman. The giant shambled forward intent on crushing her and I enhanced my voice while flying forward. Pick on someone your own size you walking Halloween freak show. Excusing the irony, Grundy turned to stare at me angrily just as my fist landed on his face, lifting him up and sending him flying away. Everyone get out of here. I shouted and ran towards the woman from before. The seatbelt was cliche enough, stuck. I grabbed the door handle and pulled it. The whole thing tore off and I threw it like a frisbee towards the loud stomps I heard coming my way. A few arrows hit the door on its way to its intended target and the thing exploded once it made contact with Grundy, throwing him back. I pulled the woman out of the car and handed her over to another civilian who was escaping. The smoke hiding Grundy's position retracted upon another roar by the undead. Christened on a Tuesday, a few arrows shot through the air and dug themselves on the ground around Grundy's position. The arrows started beeping and then exploded. Grundy crashed onto the wall of the Starbucks building and I flew forward as he got up. An uppercut sent him sliding up the building, with me following right under him. Grundy shook his head and snarled at me. He brought his hands to the side and then clapped his palms together. 
The blast of wind sent him flying up even faster, while I negated the gale produced from shattering any glass around and hurting people. I caught a glimpse of a fast-moving figure heading across the rooftops as I increased my speed and plowed right on a grunty's chest going even higher and higher. Married on Wednesday. Little man die. The shout reverberated through his chest, and his hand came down in a devastating strike. I twisted around him and grabbed hold of the offending limb and spinned him several times. Then I aimed for a vehicle recycling site and threw him down. Grundy's body fell uncontrollably and smashed onto the site, sending pieces of wrecked cars flying away from the crater he created with his body. The only way to take down Grundy was to kill him. He wasn't like other villains who would escape when they found themselves on the losing end, and was also a stamina beast on top of that, making him even more dangerous to fight because he didn't get tired. I floated in mid-air and concentrated on the crater. With a hand motion, a tornado with Grundy's body floating inside it appeared. I then closed my eyes and made the wind sharp. Grundy roared in helplessness as his body was sliced apart by millions of wind blades. His remains were scattered around the recycling site and I breathed out a sigh of relief at managing to end the fight without any loss of life. I couldn't stay in Gotham for too long though. I didn't want to answer Batman's questions on why I was in a city. But before that, I looked at a certain direction and shot off into the night sky. A figure was crouched on a rooftop as I fast approached the building. The figure pulled on her bow in fright and let loose arrows at me. A tornado appeared around me and the arrows were pushed aside. I'm not here to fight you. I held up my hands. This is Gotham. Seems like everybody is trying to fight somebody. I chuckled at her snark. True, but I'm not from Gotham. I was just here for sightseeing and to run some other errands. The hands on the bow lowered but the wariness and distrust remained. What do you want? Instead of answering, my eyes roamed down her figure as I studied her. She had changed into her iconic suit. You dirty-minded pick. Whoa. Whoa. I wasn't staring at you like that. It's just that. You're a hero, right? Artemis huffed. Yes, oh. Your PR sucks. I continued speaking, killing off her wave of protest. I like your outfit, though, and I saw what you did to Grundy with those arrows. You're really good. Artemis blushed red. I'm on a team of young heroes, too. Maybe we might see each other again. Hanging out in these circles guarantees that much. Suspicion appeared on her face. Team of young heroes? I spared a look at my watch. Yeah. Shit. I gotta go. Look. Please don't tell anyone you saw me. Saying that, I turned and flew off quickly. Why? Due to my most superior senses, I caught a glimpse of the Dark Knight himself headed in our direction. I held out no hope that he wouldn't interrogate Artemis about me. The good thing is that at least he didn't catch me himself in his city. Chapter 18 The Amazo Mission Colon, colon. General PV He has not exhibited the full scope of his abilities since the incident. This begs the question, why? Was that particular incident a one-off? The glowing eyes might mean that he was not in full control of himself. If so, that means he still has more power hidden inside. Luther swiped the image on the screen which changed to show a hooded figure facing off against Grundy. All that remains is to find out just who you are. Aiden's PV. I got back and went straight to my room. The next morning I was at the gym for my daily session. My eyebrows rose up in question when the door to the training room opened and in walked the team and surprisingly, Black Canary. Canary ran her eyes over my body with clinical precision, assuring me she wasn't admiring my abs but instead gauging my strength. Sweat poured down my chest as I grabbed a towel and dried off. Are you usually here this early in the morning? She asked. Aiden is very enthusiastic about training. Superboy and I even find him here at night sometimes. With the kind of freaks we deal with, I'm surprised you guys don't train more. The others looked away in a little embarrassment as I told them. I do. Superboy said with pride on his face. Kid Flash waved his hand in dismissal. Training? Please. I'm fast. And my body is always supercharged. Running at supersonic speeds is more than enough training. Yet you still can't go as fast as the Flash. The boy wonder stated. Dude, come on. Canary looked at Aiden sternly. Don't push yourself too hard, Aiden. Although you have acquired new powers, too much training can have a negative effect on your body. I nodded. I'll keep that in mind. Now, did all of you come here to tell me that or? Black Canary is giving us lessons on close quarter combat. We thought the training room was more appropriate than the hall. Aqualad spoke up for the first time. We followed Black Canary to the sparring section of the room. There were weapon racks on the sides, courtesy of Red Tornado, courtesy of my nagging. I wanted to learn how to use a weapon. It was after I had noticed that a weapon helped me focus the direction of my wind attacks more. All right, let's begin. First thing you need to understand about combat is to always be the one to dictate the flow of the fight. That way, you will lead your opponent to making mistakes and leave openings that you can then exploit to take them down. Canary took off her jacket and winced in pain. She had a bandage on her left hand. It comes with the job. She told us upon seeing the concern on our faces. I'll need a partner. Maelstrom, if you will. I stepped forward as Wally complained about not being able to show off his killer moves. We faced off and I instantly found out the difference between a martial arts master like Canary and an expert like Artemis. Artemis? I could read. Canary? She was a blank slate. This wasn't going to be easy. The way you carry yourself has changed. She observed. I looked at her in faint surprise. Yeah. I learned a new martial arts skill. It's called she blocking. She cocked her head. That is an unconventional name. Never heard of it. Part of your powers I assume. 
I nodded. How many powers does he have? Wally wondered out loud. Trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. Boy Wonder was quick to reply. His response took my thoughts back to the incident when we first met. That brief moment where I was lost in thought was all Canary needed to pounce. My eyes widened as her fist came too close to my chin. I leaned back and barely escaped the blow. Her hand bent after missing my chin, and the elbow landed on my solar plexus. Despite my durability, my diaphragm spasmed and pain assaulted my senses, making it hard for me to breathe. In panic, a bubble of air formed around me and pushed Canary away. She flipped and landed on the ground with the grace of a cat. From my kneeling position, I looked up and saw the odd looks on the team. A feeling of frustration hit me and I barely stopped myself from punching a hole into the ground. How could I have been taken out that quickly? Holy crap. Did you guys see that? Wally spoke up. She was so fast. Miss Martian added. Can anyone tell me what Maelstrom did wrong? He got distracted at the start of the fight, allowing you to lead the flow of the fight. Robin responded to Canary's question. Good. There's one more thing, however. Inexperience. Maelstrom is not used to fighting opponents who are better than him, skill-wise. Unfortunately, you can only build experience over time. That man to the cave. I need you all in the hall. We wrapped up the session with Canary promising us more lessons. I made my way to the hall along with the others in a dour mood. Fortunately, Batman had no reaction to seeing me, so I knew that Artemis hadn't sold me out. Then again, the Dark Knight's mood was barely readable at all times. Yesterday, Green Arrow and Black Canary were attacked by a new menace. The two requested for backup from the rest of the League. We soon discovered that the android who attacked them could copy and replicate powers. Batman stopped to press a key on the data pad. The huge screens facing us changed to show a devastated street, wrecked vehicles, and broken buildings. Everything clicked once I saw the image of Amazo on the screen. I sucked in a deep breath, earning a strange look from Robin. Amazo was in the information I had given Batman because of how dangerous he was. One entity with the powers of the Man of Steel, the fastest man alive, and an Amazonian demigod was nigh unbeatable. Add in the other League members, and you have someone only the Justice League could defeat. Android? Who built it? The design matches that of Evo's earlier experiments. Manhunter made himself known by phasing through the doors of the mission room. Evo? But he's dead. Apparently not. Black Canary sighed. Who's Evo? Miss Martian asked. Mad genius scientist, who we all thought was dead. Robin answered. It took the Justice League four hours to defeat the android and dismantle it into parts. That's where you come in. Batman continued. You want us to be the security detail for the parts to be transported somewhere. Robin caught on quick. Precisely. The two parts will be taken to two separate branches of the Star Labs. One in Boston, the other in New York for in-depth analysis. Excuse me. Everyone turned to me. If this Evo is as much of a genius as you say he is, wouldn't that mean he might have a way to track the individual parts? Good point. We might be attacked on the way, Aqualad said. Unfortunately, that is a risk we'll have to take. Immediate evaluation is needed in case another android with the same capabilities starts making trouble. Every precaution has been taken. We will have four additional trucks to act as decoys in case Evo or anyone decides to intervene. You will split into two undercover teams to safeguard the real trucks. Yes. Road trip. Wally jumped in glee. I'm sending you the coordinates to the pickup now. Batman out. We all looked at each other thinking the same thing. This mission will definitely not go according to plan. We got into our suits and moved out. At the pickup point, we split up into two teams. I was with Aqualad and Kid Flash while Miss Martian, Robin, and Superboy were on the second team. We checked our comms and then proceeded to move, following behind the truck. Aqualad and Kid Flash were riding on some high-tech bikes while I was up in the sky acting as their eyes. The sky was beautiful and clear. The sun was shining down on the cornfields covering our sides and it felt peaceful. Despite the time of day, the road was desolate allowing me to keep watch easily and still get lost in thought. My control over my powers was growing each day, and I was grateful for that. The effort I put into training yielded results and I felt pumped up and confident about facing the battles that were in my future. Like Canary said, what I needed was experience. I also learned that just because I could block bullets with my body, my durability wasn't invincible. I still couldn't believe that she had managed to hurt me by targeting a weak spot. It just went to show that I still had more to learn. I would soon unlock the next subskill in the air element, taking me to Grandmaster level and once I got there, it was only a matter of time before I. The first indication I got that something was wrong was the bright glint of glowing green eyes concealed in the cornfields. I swerved to the side, dodging the green laser beams that were quickly followed by the chattering of monkeys. Guys, we have company. Of the simian kind. I brought a finger to my ear and informed the two on the ground. Got it. I tried to fly down, but a group of flying monkeys besieged me from all sides. Let's try something new. Wind blade constructs appeared in my hands, twisting like miniature drills. I slashed a monkey's head off and plunged a blade into another monkey's chest. It screeched as its body twisted upon itself before exploding. My hands were a blur as I dealt with the creatures. The numbers did not reduce despite fighting off more than a dozen. The wind blades disappeared as I tried something else. My body spinned in place, creating a tornado that sent all the monkeys in my position falling down in several slashed off pieces. Finally free, I looked at the truck and cursed out. The monkeys had flown away with the container. Chapter 19. Dire Straits. Colon, colon.
Aiden's PV. Maelstrom, do you copy? Aqualad's voice came through the comms. Loud and clear Aqualad. I have the container in my sight. It's headed towards Gotham. I have Kit on the road as well. He will link up with the other team. Robin has a way to track the location where the monkeys are headed. Don't engage until the rest of the team is around for backup. I frowned. I can take them. The container is literally a few hundred meters away from me. No, stand down. Let's use this chance to follow the parts to where they're headed to first. I slowed down, already seeing the mistake in Aqualad's plan. Aqualad, if the other container is headed towards Gotham as well, that means there's a high chance they're convening in the same spot. Evo could assemble the parts again, and that would be game over for us. We can't take that chance. He's right. The android took eight League members four hours just to take it down. We're great, but not League level yet. Aqualad. Plus Robin is already tracking the other parts. Kid Flash added. Calder was silent for a while. Can you take them down by yourself? The robots are weak individually but in huge numbers, they are a problem. Don't worry, I got this. My speed suddenly increased as I cut through the air heading towards the fleeing container. Some of the monkeys broke away from the group carrying the container to assault me with lasers. I ducked and weaved past the attacks using the wind to blow the robots away, and then smashing them with my fists once they were thrown off kilter. A wind funnel spread out before me, fanning the monkeys blocking my path to the side, only for them to be sliced apart by the tornadoes following behind me and on the sides. I dealt with the last of the robot monkeys and carried the container down. Maelstrom to Aqualad. I've recovered the parts. Good. Signal me and I'll head to your position while you go on ahead and help the others. I looked around and made sure that no other surprises were hiding in the cornfields and flew off towards Gotham, leaving a tornado of crops to show Aqualad the way. Miss Martian. Tell. Me once I get within your telepathic range. Copied, Maelstrom. See you in a bit. Her voice came through the earpiece. I had never really seen how fast I could fly before. This was as a good a time as any. Five bucks says I can break the sonic barrier. I pumped myself up and increased my flight speed to its limit. The environment passed me by in a blur. I spared a look at the sides and came to some conclusions. My speed was just subsonic. Not quite enough to break the sound barrier. Zaheer from Avatar could also use the wind to fly, but there were clear differences between us. For starters, he didn't produce a gust of wind when flying. For all intents and purposes, he was the wind. In my case, however, I produced wind gusts to propel me forward. Secondly, he was, in a sense, freer. His range of movement allowed him to be flexible like the air. He could stop suddenly and drag or airspeed did not affect him. All that showed me was that I still had more improvements to make. The good thing is that at master level, I didn't need to do any bending moves. I was deeply connected with the air at that point, that with the slightest gesture I could control it to do my bidding. Maelstrom, you're within my range. Just follow the telepathic beacon to me. Miss Martian's voice pulled me out of my thoughts. Got it. I looked at the ground under me and found that I was nearing the edge of the corn plantation. A few hundred meters before me was a ranch. Even before I got there, I could already hear the sounds of battle. I touched down before the red barn and ran inside. The front of the building exploded into a shower of wooden shards as a tractor broke through it. I threw my hands forward and a gale of wind caught the seven-ton vehicle before it could ram into me. I was about to place it to the side when something impacted the tractor from behind, making it slip through my control and fall on me. Fortunately, I caught it with my hands and placed it on the ground. Kid Flash extracted himself from the wrecked side of the tractor and jumped up, looking completely fine. Great. You're here. We have a slight problem. We heard a grunt and several explosives from the barn which made me raise an eyebrow at Kid Flash. Okay. It's a big problem. Evo managed to repair the android. What? How? We recovered the other parts before he could get them. Kid Flash didn't need to answer me because before we could go in, loud mechanic steps echoed out of the building and out came Amazo. Superboy and Robin were held in the android's two hands by their necks. Oh shit. He used the robotic monkeys as a replacement for the lower body. I gasped. Right you are my dear boy. It's a shame my monkeys failed to retrieve the other parts, but the true mark of a genius is to solve problems, and so I did. Amazo, show no. Oh no you don't. Evo found himself lifted into the air by Miss Martian's telekinesis. He flailed about in panic. Amazo, protect your master. Primary directive. The Amazo threw Superboy and Robin to the side and turned to Miss Martian. Access Superman. It intoned. The Man of Steel's familiar heat beams exploded out of Amazo's eyes towards Miss Martian. She dodged them but the beams followed her. The heat beams carved a demolition line across the cornfield setting it on fire just as Kid Flash and I jumped in to attack him. I punched out a hand onto the android's face that he caught and squeezed, making me grunt in pain. Kid Flash came in from the side and started hitting him with a metal bar he found, which did nothing. My foot slammed onto Amazo's torso with great impact, pushing him back as I flipped away. Kid Flash cleverly tripped the android and it fell to the ground. Explosive birdarangs dug themselves onto Amazo's body but fell through when the android accessed Manhunter's phasing ability. The explosion sent me spinning away for a few meters, but I got up and charged. Anyone have an idea? We're getting our asses added to us. I shouted through the comms, receiving no answer. Miss Martian begun flying away with Evo, and the android pursued. Access Red Tornado A red tornado sprang up below the android and carried him towards Miss Martian. 
Why didn't he just access Superman's flight? The Big Blue is faster than Tornado by far. He doesn't have all the abilities he copied from the League. Robin came to the same conclusion I did. That means if we overwhelm him with many attacks while he's occupied with getting Evo back, we can take him down. Right. Let's do it. I'm in. I'm going to turn it into scrap metal. The last words were from an angry Superboy. Miss Martian lead the android to us. Miss M did as instructed and passed by us, with Evo screaming bloody murder and Amazo hot on her heels. Superboy growled and took a leap, shoulder checking the android onto the cornfield. The crops were decimated and a groove was left on the ground. We ran towards the pair just as Superboy interlocked his hands and slammed a double-handed fist onto the android. Access Manhunter. The attack phased through the android and a tremor through the ground. Whoa. Kid Flash lost his footing and fell, his body tumbled away, carving another path through the crops. The owner is not going to pleased. Robin chuckled as he disappeared off into the plantation. Access Black Canary. Canary's sonic cry sent Superboy spinning away into the air. I jumped and grabbed a hold of his hand, spinning and throwing the boy of steel back at Amazo. Access FL. His words were cut off as Connor slammed into the unsuspecting android and actually damaged it this time. One of its hands were bent the wrong way, and its torso was caved in. Take this. Superboy pulled his hand back, but the android opened its mouth and activated Canary's signature move. Superboy managed to hold his ground despite being pushed back while covering his ears. Smoke bombs from Boy Wonder obscured the android's vision, covering me as I charged in. Wind surrounded both my palms, twisting and gyrating around. I enhanced my speed and cut through the smoke like a ghost. Access Superman. My eyes widened once I saw Amazo's eyes light up. I ducked just in time as the beams of solar energy flew above me. That was so close. To shorten the distance, I controlled the wind, sliding the rest of the way, and then... Whoosh. I passed by Amazo. Sparks started running around its hips after my palm cut through it like butter. Access F. My palm slashed out and the head separated from its torso. The android fell down in three detached parts including to the lower body from my earlier attack. I walked over to its head and slammed a foot down, totally crushing it. I breathed out and sat on the android's torso. Dude, how do we keep ending up in these situations? When will a mission go right? Just for once. Wally complained spitting out pieces of leaves from his mouth. No. What have you done you? You buffoons. My genius. Evo's red bow tie detached to wrap itself around his mouth just as he and Miss Martian landed before us. Sorry, I don't like his attitude. Gen shrugged at our looks. Trust me, no one blames you beautiful. Kid Flash winked at Miss Martian while Robin went off to look for Superboy. Meanwhile, I tapped on my earpiece to update Aqualad on how things had turned out. He was the only one of the team who was left behind. Maelstrom to Aqualad. Maelstrom, what is the status? We're all fine. We have Evo in our custody and Amazo is scrap metal again. Good. Miss Martian's bioship is on its way to pick you up. Great job. Elsewhere. The children are becoming more than a nuisance. One of the human-like figures made of light said through the screen. Evo has been captured. He was a valuable asset. Another added. They have dared to stand in our way too many times already. This deserves retaliation. This voice was deeper than the rest. You're all correct. But for now let us leave them be. When the time is right, even they shall see the light. The last voice was more menacing than the rest. Chapter 20. A new teammate. Colon, colon. The Watchtower. Now that everyone has arrived. Let's begin. Batman stood up from his seat as he addressed his fellow League members. The ones present were just the mentors to the sidekicks as well as Canary who was the team's combat instructor. We're here today to review our protégé's progress since the establishment of the junior team. The hologram between them changed to show the image of Blockbuster, Mr. Twister's remains and all the other villains Maelstrom and the rest had gone up against. The Flash whistled. Seems like it's been an eventful few weeks for them. Flash is right. Most of these guys would have given me trouble back in the day. Arrow added. And that's taking into account that none of their encounters with the villains have gone exactly smooth. Superman shared his own opinion. Aquaman cleared his throat. About that. Is there a way to give them missions with a lower amount of risk? He hurried to explain himself. I'm not doubting their capabilities. Aqualad has proven time and time again that he is strong. What concerns me is how simple missions completely go off the rails. The atmosphere became grimmer. Makes you wonder, how many close calls until one of them gets injured, or worse? The mentors looked at each other gravely. Aquaman has a point. But I share a different opinion. The job is dangerous. And they are quite aware of that. Filtering out missions that have an element of danger is not helping them. It's hindering their growth. Canary spoke up. With all due respect, Black Canary, you don't have a protege. Your opinion, quite frankly, doesn't count. Aquaman's voice was annoyed. Black Canary narrowed her eyes at the King of Atlantis. That's not fair, Arthur. You know that she only has their best interest in mind. Green Arrow defended her. Superman stapled his fingers together. When we all started out, there was no one to hold our hands. The challenges we went through helped shape who we are today. Help shape what the League stands for. His eyes ran through everyone gathered. Aquaman. You have trained Aqualad to do what you can and more in case you are not around, correct? Arthur begrudgingly nodded his head. Then you understand that for him to truly grow, you need to step back. Let them put what they've learned to work. Let them be greater than us. For that is our job as mentors. To ensure we leave the world in safe hands in the future. 
Everyone nodded at the Man of Steel's words. Aquaman, seeing he had no support, simply shrugged and kept quiet. The team is more than ready to take on the huge responsibilities we have all prepared them for. That said, there are some concerns that need to be addressed. With a gesture from Batman, the image of the wrecked Cadmus facility, Santa Prisca, and the cornfield where Amazo's fight had occurred appeared on the hologram. We have long suspected the presence of a powerful group working in the shadows to counter the League's efforts. The others sat up straighter. After some investigation and interrogation of both Sportsmaster, Cobra, and recently, Evo, those suspicions have been confirmed. Well, do you know the identities of the ones behind it all? Barry inquired. Batman shook his head a little bit of frustration leaking through. Not yet. They hide in the shadows. It's now quite clear that they're taking advantage of places where the League cannot go to carry out their agenda. Do they have a name? The one who answered Green Arrow's question was Martian Manhunter. They call themselves the Light, not Justice. I spy with my little eye. A girly I can get, cause she don't get too many likes. A curly-headed cutie I can turn into my wife. Wait, that means forever, ever, hold up, never mind. Oh, I spy with my little eye. A girly I can get, cause she don't get too many likes. A curly-headed cutie I can turn into my wife. Wait, that means forever, ever, hold up, never mind. Oh, I, I spy with my little eye. I spy, I spy with my little eye. Oh, I, I spy with my little eye. I spy, I spy with my little eye. Oh, I. Gan knocked on the door to Aiden's room. All she could hear from outside was the sound of music and Aiden's voice. He really has a beautiful voice, Gan thought, and also a great body. She blushed at the direction where her thoughts were taking her and shook her head to get rid of the image of sweat dripping down his brown skin, his muscles rippling with effort as he sparred with Superboy. Then she thought of Superboy, his jaw and beautiful blue eyes staring at her, his rock-solid abs. Gan didn't notice when the door was opened, revealing a shirtless Aiden with headphones on his head, staring at her in confusion. Aiden snapped his fingers at Gan, and the Martian got out of her stupor. The reddening on her cheeks increased once her eyes landed on Aiden's chest. His sculpted physique looked, and Gan suddenly realized she was staring. She hoped that Aiden hadn't noticed, but once her eyes looked at his face, she noticed the smirk. Take a picture, it lasts longer. Gah. Gan flew away in embarrassment, leaving behind the plate of cookie she had come over to bring. Aiden's PV. I closed the door after Gan ran away in embarrassment. I munched on a cookie and almost moaned at the tasty goodness. Gan had gotten better at baking. Her progress was phenomenal taking into account a few weeks ago she had no concept of earthen food. My eyes swept across my room to admire the new changes. I had used the 5k from my winnings to set up a private studio in my own bedroom. Fortunately, the room was huge enough for it to not look cluttered. I went over to the latest LexCorp laptop that had cost me quite a penny. On the screen was this world's version of Pro Tools, a digital audio workstation. It was called Heightens. Next my eyes landed on the keyboard and the guitar I had bought earlier. A microphone, speakers, and the headphones I had on completed the set. Pretty bare for a music studio, but great for starting out. I looked at the notebook in my hand and the lyrics to I Spy by Kyle I was reconstructing from memory. It wasn't the only song in the notebook, however. Basically, I was jotting down all the lyrics to the songs I could remember, editing them, and then recording myself and saving the audio file in my computer. It wouldn't do if I forgot the best hits from my world. I even had a few original projects of my own I was working on. Music had always fascinated me and growing up in a family of musicians, I felt inspired to share that same joy I felt growing up to the rest of the world. I finished up after two hours and left my room for the gym, reminding myself to get a good camera for when I started uploading covers in this world's YouTube. On to other things, I arrived in the gym and found Superboy bench pressing 150 tons with ease. I shook my head, said hi and went a bit further away from him to the sparring mat. I first started by stretching my muscles. Stretching was essential for a limber and flexible body, which was essential for my fighting style. Chi blocking incorporated fast but elastic moves to take down your opponent with the minimal amount of effort. It was the principle of blow like the air, but sting like a bee. After stretching for half an hour, I started doing the chi blocking kados. The moves flowed like water, one set building the bridge to transition to another move. I got lost into it that I didn't notice it when I started adding air bending stances and moves into the chi blocking. I had done it before, but this time it felt different. The air exploded out like a minute shockwave whenever my fist shot out. The air extended away from my foot like a coiled snake whenever I kicked out and buffeted my surroundings while whistling whenever I spread my hands out without urging. I breathed a little heavily with a confused look on my face. The air whistled. No, no, let me explain myself. It was different from the normal thing. I crossed my legs and started to meditate. The way it felt. It was like, like I was given the key to a door I couldn't see. I connected with the air element around me and just observed. It roiled around, coiled in the air while gently swaying across the room. A new sensation also made its way through my senses. The air also sang. I opened my eyes. A breath escaped my mouth. I had it. I knew what the door was. I finally had the way towards my next subskill. Sound. A blue box from the Avatar system appeared before me. A few days later, it was time for a new mission. The rest of the team was gathered in the hall when I arrived, my visor in my hands. I had gotten caught up in the training room, 
trying to perfect the new sub skill I had to minimal success. It was a new application of my bending that I had trouble familiarizing myself with. I said hi, and we started making small talk. I noticed that Mian was going out of her way to ignore Superboy and I. She would blush every time we made eye contact, and during our mental exercises she had been acting weird. I shrugged and put it out of my head. Soon, the security system announced the arrival of Batman, Green Arrow, and our new teammate, Artemis. Only problem is, she noticed me almost right away and shouted, You. Everyone turned to look at me, and I glared at her. Artemis had the grace to mutter sorry and look away, leaving me feeling stupid for not wearing my visor. Then again, how did she even know it's me? I was pretty sure my mask from when we met was a good disguise. Batman cleared his throat while looking at me, promising that we would have a discussion about what had just happened. Team, I would like to introduce your new teammate. Green Arrow's protege, Artemis. Chapter 21, The Fog Part 1. Colon, colon. General PV. Razo Ghul was the incarnate of a shadow, unknown to most and a dawning figure to those strong enough or influential enough to do. He meditated in his room, awaiting good news from his underling on the progress of the mission. His eyes opened just in time to stare at the screen showing a man whose upper face and head was covered with a visor that had a huge red optical lens at the front. Dr. Rocket has resurfaced. She is trying to track us. That link, however, is a two-way stream. I have her coordinates. It's Happy Harbor, Rhode Island. Who do we have close to that location? Rosal Gull asked. I have a few of our people in mind. The leader of the League of Shadows grunted after seeing the names of their closest agents. I have a feeling they won't be enough. What should we do then, Master? Don't concern yourself with that. I'll handle it. Make sure you get what we need. Aiden's PV. Wally glared at me from across the room. The environment was tense and unfriendly. Miss Martian link us all up. We don't want the shadows to overhear our communication. Aqualad instructed Mgan through the comms. Right. Her voice came through and I instantly felt the telepathic streams connected to my mind. And also Wally's grumbling. He had no right to talk to Speedy like that. I rolled my eyes at the speedster. Dude, I'm mad too but it's so not the time. Robin backed him up while also reminding him that we were on a mission. Ugh. This was not. A good idea. I have a technological work of genius that borders on a miracle to track. A shadow group of assassins that funnily enough call themselves the shadows that want to put me down under. And now on top of that I have to listen to teen drama. Rocket shouted through our mind link looking exasperated. So not the time lady. Kid Flash told her, completely missing the irony. Artemis snickered. Kettle meat pot. Like I'm going to listen to the person who stole Speedy's spot on the team. I ground my teeth in anger at seeing the flash of hurt on Artemis' face. So not cool kid. Ease up a little. It's not her fault you know. Robin was at least mature enough to accept the situation for what it was. Wally had, disappointed me. I'm going to patrol the perimeter. I told them, and got up from the desk. You walk away, traitor? Wally added. Dude. Kid. I will pull you out of this mission if you continue acting like this. Whatever issues you have with Maelstrom, or anyone else, solve them after the mission. Not now. Aqualad's voice was sterner than I'd ever heard before. Wally looked surprised before his face got even angrier, staring at me as if it was my fault. I had no doubt that Miss Martian was blocking the expletives Wally was probably thinking about me, based on her loud sigh. I'll huh, follow Maelstrom too. Artemis said out loud and trailed after me out of the classroom. We made our way out into the open, the school building behind us in relative silence. I'm sorry. Artemis told me softly rubbing her arm. I cocked my head to the side in a little confusion. For what? Well, for a lot of things actually. You stood up to Speedy mainly because of you know me. I shook my head and turned my head around to look out into the bushes surrounding school property. Trust me. It was less about you and more about how that guy's attitude annoys me. Artemis chuckled a little. Yeah, you made that quite clear in the hall. I smiled at her as my thoughts took me back to what had happened. It was right after Speedy now Red Arrow had arrived with our new mission details. To protect a genius scientist he had rescued from the League of Shadows, while the scientist tried to track down a swarm of nanomachines she had been coerced into making by the same group. The nanomachines were called, the Fog. They could eat through anything. Metal, concrete, flesh and bones. Their main function, however, was that they could instantly download any data and information from data storage systems and deliver it to the one controlling them. Cutting-edge technology, top government information, and secrets. The one who controlled them could do anything. Knowledge is power, after all. She was hidden in the local high school of Happy Harbor. Back to Red Arrow, first of all, he had swaggered in like he owned the place. Which I would normally shrug at and mind my own business, but then he totally became an ass and insulted not only Artemis but the team. Talking about how we would never amount to anything meaningful while under the League's oversight. A while ago. I snickered at Red Arrow's words. Everyone turned to stare at me. You have something to say, newbie? Red Arrow asked, with a bite in his tone. Me? No, no. See, I was actually content just listening to you bitch about how life is so sad because no one understands how great you are and how much they're wrong not to offer you a spot in the Justice League. There was a brief silence. Then Red Arrow took a step towards me, anger rolling off him in waves. What makes you think you can talk to me like that? I smiled and got up. What makes you think I can't? Maelstrom. I held up a hand to silence Aqualad my eyes still staring at Red Arrow. You walk in here like you own the place. Talk rudely to everyone. 
including your so-called friends and expect that the rest of us are just going to lay down and take it. The smile slipped off my face as I crossed my hands. You don't know what you're talking about, Maelstrom. Could Flash appear between us and push me back? He turned to address Red Arrow. Speedy he's new. Don't listen to him. He still tried to suck up to the older team despite the fact that all he had done was be a dick to everyone. My ears buzzed as I couldn't believe it. I looked around and except for Batman, who was unreadable, Red Tornado, who didn't really care about whatever was going on, Artemis, Superboy and Miss Martian, all I could feel wafting off everyone else was disapproval. Well, does this guy have superpowers that make other people want to seek approval from him or something? I wondered. Frankly speaking, I don't care what you think of me. Yeah right, I thought. I brought you all a job I was sure you could handle. From your words however, I'm thinking maybe I was wrong. He told me and I chuckled. Dude, this is not about our capabilities. Check our mission lock. You'll be surprised to learn that other people are competent too. You're just mad that I see right through your bullshit. There was an intake of breath when my words dropped. Red Arrow couldn't handle it anymore and advanced menacingly towards me. You little. Both of you, stand down. This is not the time or the place. Batman came between us. Red Arrow stared into the Dark Knight's eyes and held it before clenching his teeth and turning towards the Zeta tube. I'm leaving. Speedy B06. It's Red Arrow B06. Update. He stated as the light of the Zeta tube washed over him. What is wrong with you? Kid Flash came up to me to hold me by the shirt but I easily shrugged him off. I should be the one asking you that question. You all just let him walk all over you. I stared at the three veteran sidekicks. I mean I can understand Kid Flash's misplaced loyalty. But even you Aqualad? You're so blinded by whatever past you have all shared that you can't see your friend is changing. You don't know him. Speedy is a good guy. Robin came to his defense. I never said he wasn't. But the bitterness he carries, that irrational anger at the League for denying him what he thinks is his right, will get him hurt or worse. Watch your words carefully, Maelstrom. You're still pretty new so your opinion about him is all wrong. Green Arrow finally spoke up. The older man's eyes were no nonsense and stern. I could already see that no matter what I said, they would still look at me as if I was the bad guy. I took a deep breath and nodded. You're right. But I'll tell you one last thing. My gaze was unflinching as I stared them all down. He comes up to me like that again, and I'm not backing down. I have my own self-respect, and I hate bullies. No matter what kind. Damn. That was, so hot. Artemis whispered, but given how everyone was silent, no one missed it. Green Arrow sighed. Time to move out team. Maelstrom, I want to see you after the mission. Batman stated and left. Present time. That's not the only thing. Artemis' words pulled me out of my thoughts. I spared a glance and waited for her to continue. My reaction when I saw you. It's going to raise some questions. Especially with Batman. I already knew what she was getting at but still, I pretended to be confused. And why is that? She held my hand, making me stop and turn towards her fully. Let's just say that my situation is a bit different. You saw where we first met, right? That's my real life. Her tone turned gloomy. I sighed. I understand. Trust me, my eyes softened and a small smile appeared on my face. Someone else would tell you that your background doesn't determine the choices you make in life, but that's a lie. There are things you can't fully shake off. Where you come from defines a part of you. And you can't ignore that. She was stunned for a little bit. All right. I didn't expect that. She finally said, making me raise an eyebrow. Should I be insulted? I feel like I should be insulted. Artemis chuckled. You can't exactly blame me. I thought you hot guys trade your brains for those muscles. I smirked. You think I'm hot? Artemis boldly squeezed my bicep and licked her lips. Guilty as charged. I swallowed. This girl. By the way, you never told me how you recognized me. I asked her. The jaw. Before she could elaborate a sound in the bushes made us pause. Did you hear something? She nodded and knocked an arrow, letting it loose towards the grove of trees near the fence. There was a clang and I grabbed her hand, pulling her out of the way of the metal hook flying at us. Guys, we have company. The captain hook kind. I informed the others through our mind lake. I had gotten good enough that manipulating what I sent over so most of the mental echo from my communication with Artemis was isolated from the rest. Seems like they now know our location. Maelstrom, Artemis deal with whoever that is and fall back to within close proximity. We are short on manpower because I sent Superboy and Robin to where the fog is. Aqualad's voice came through the link. Got it. Chapter 22, The Fog Final Part. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. Ever wonder how someone wakes up one day and just decides to be a modern take on a character from Peter Pan? I wondered aloud while floating around the air. Artemis weaved around the hook attacks while occasionally shooting out trick arrows. No clue. Maybe it's a cry for help. I chuckled while keeping watch. It wouldn't do for someone else to slip past us while we were occupied by. Hey. What's his name by the way? I casually asked as the metallic hook whizzed by my face. I clutched the chain and pulled the guy to me. His eyes widened and my fist impacted the hasty one hand block from his left arm. The bone snapped with an audible sound and he winced in pain, landing on the ground painfully. He tried to rise up but Artemis shot a few arrows around him that exploded with the force of a flash grenade, momentarily dazing him. She stepped closer and threw a roundhouse kick, sending him to dreamland. Artemis went towards the unconscious mercenary and hefted the huge hook while smiling at me. My mouth opened. No way. 
His name is Hook? That's like the most unoriginal name I've ever heard. Maelstrom, we need that back up now. Aqualad informed us. I looked at Artemis and she waved me off. I'll tie him up. Go. My body turned and shot off towards the school building. I crashed through the skylight of the class and blocked the shuikens aimed at Dr. Rocket. They bounced to the side and I stepped in closer to a woman wearing a white creepy mask. Underneath her green costume, she had curves for days and was packing some dangerous weapons. I caught a glimpse of some kanai and knives strapped to her thighs when she flipped behind chairs for a modicum of cover. Aqualad was on the floor kneeling with one leg while breathing heavily. His water bearers were held loosely in his hands. I frowned at Aqualad's condition which was probably due to the poison on Cheshire's weapons. The only thing I didn't expect was the many passed out shadows inside the room. I frowned. This wasn't canon. In the original timeline, they had only been attacked by three villains. Could this be a butterfly effect due to my interference? Aqualad, are you hurt anywhere? I asked him through the link, while watching Cheshire carefully. The doctor and I are fine. Just be careful not to get pierced by any of their weapons. Especially hers. Miss M, could flash how are things on your end? There are way more shadows than we expected. We are currently occupied at the gym. Miss Martian told me through the link. Maelstrom, you need to take the doctor and go. I'll provide you with cover. I thought it through. I can carry you both. No one is getting left behind. Could flash, and I have the gym secured. If you can get here, we can regroup and come up with a plan. Miss Martian informed us. Well, well. And who might you be? Cheshire Cat brandished her sigh at me while stalking around us. I blinked, and the whole room was swarmed with over a dozen more figures dressed fully in black. You promised you would protect me. Rockette was shaking when she said this. Stay behind me, doctor. Artemis, I need you here. Coming. Nice get up. I have a question, though. What's with the creepy mask? If you ask me, it makes you less approachable. The assassins were patient, seemingly waiting for the signal from Cheshire. Ah, and I thought it was the best thing about me. I smirked. If you're going for the intimidating factor, sure. Personally, I'd like to see if your face matches your voice. Irresistible. Oh my, are you sure you should be flirting with the enemy? She asked me while twirling her sigh. Not really, but I won't tell if you won't. I'm in position above you. We need cover to relocate the doctor somewhere else. Okay. In one. Step aside then. I'd hate to ruin that perfect jawline. She crooned. Sorry, beautiful. Some other time. Arrows dug themselves around us, and I grabbed a hold of Aqualad and Dr. Rocket. The woman screamed in alarm as I flew us out through the skylight I'd broken through earlier. Artemis drew a few more arrows and let them loose inside the classroom, and then followed after us on the rooftop while I flew away to another section of the building. I held Rocket in my arms while Aqualad was floating beside me inside the bubble of air I had constructed to carry him. Miss Martian, where is the gym located? On your left. She answered and I changed my course. I looked back at Artemis and saw her running in our previous direction. She stopped a few times and shot arrows towards the shadows pursuing us. I'm gonna lead them away from you. They can't see you in the dark properly while you're in the air. She explained. That's a good idea. Hopefully by the time they realize it, we will be far away. I replied. Slight problem even if you bring Dr. Rocket here, she won't have access to a computer to finish creating the virus. Could voice something we had overlooked. Don't worry, I have a plan. We listened to Miss Martian's plan, and I remembered it as surprisingly the same plan that they had come up with in canon. Basically, Miss M changed her appearance to match Rocket, while Aqualad and Kid Flash acted as guards. Meanwhile, I flew Rocket towards a cyber cafe in town to complete uploading the virus. Twenty minutes later, I was standing guard in front of Rocket as she hurried to finish the job. She breathed out a sigh of relief and smiled at me. It's done. My fingers went to my earpiece. Maelstrom to Robin. Do you copy? The virus is ready. Robin's voice came out hurried and urgent. Right on time. The fog is going for Wayne Industries. If they copy the information from their servers, it's going to be bad. His voice cut off. I'm going for the one controlling the fog. How many teeth should he be missing? I chuckled at Superboy's statement. Aqualad, did you get all of that? Yes, but be careful. The assassin in the white mask is probably headed your way. Artemis is in pursuit. I sighed and turned to Rocket. Stay behind me, doctor. Seems like it's not over. What? But, but I finished the virus. They have no reason to kill me now. She started panicking. Hey, hey. I held her shoulders. We promised to protect you. That hasn't changed. How touching. My hand shot out to hit the projectiles heading towards us out of the air. I waved a hand and a gust of wind threw back the second volley of shuriken. Relentless, aren't you? I commented. Cheshire lowered her body into a ready stance. I could say the same thing. But that's about to end. Rocket is mine. It's too late. You were instructed to kill her to stop the fog from being rendered inert. It's already done. That means your mission has failed. Cheshire looked unsure. I don't believe you. I turned the monitor around and showed her the screen displaying a successful upload. Well, I'll be damned. It's not often I fail. Well played. She trailed off, wanting to know my name. Call me Maelstrom. She cocked her hip to the side. Maelstrom, huh? Cool name. Fits you perfectly. I'm... I held up her hand before she could introduce herself. A small smirk appeared on my face. No need. I'll find that out for myself during the interrogation. Instantly, she went on guard. Though from a lesser discernible eye, her body posture remained loose and relaxed. 
Confident you can take me down? I thought you were smart. I chuckled. Trust me, I'm not the dumb one here. You followed me alone. She sighed. Why are the cute ones so egotistical? Cheshire leaped over the table and palmed her canai. They left her hands and cut through the air with impeccable accuracy. For were aimed at my vital areas and two shot towards Rocket. A tornado appeared before us and pushed everything away. Computers, chairs, and papers alike. I grabbed Rocket and pulled her to my back away from the shuikins that dug themselves on the wall behind her. I said behind me, doctor. Not beside. A monitor was kicked at me and I swiped it away, sending it to smash through the glass door of the cafe. Cheshire had used that brief cover to pull in close to me. I lifted my leg off the ground, evading the leg sweep. She spinned around and threw one of her sayas at me. I grabbed it out of the air and returned the favor, sending it back at her. She quickly ducked by leaning her body backwards. The sigh passed above her, curving a line across her mask and detaching it from her face. Then the sigh planted itself on the wall behind her, digging in deeply into the bricks. Cheshire extended her body back completely and transitioned into a flip. Her eyes widened when she found me so close to her. My fist shot out before she could respond and landed on her left hand. Five more hits to her chi points and Cheshire slumped against me with zero control of her limbs. Oh my god, did you kill her? Rocket came up from behind me and asked. Cheshire glared at me as I removed zip ties from my utility belt and fastened them on her wrist and ankles. How is she going to walk like that? She's not. I lifted Cheshire and held her close to me. Showing sympathy for the enemy doctor? You do know she tried to kill you a minute ago. Rocket started stammering upon my question. Still, that's, that's not ethical, putting a girl in such a position. I sighed. I'm an advocate for gender equality. Now stay here. I need to go out and look around to make sure none of those other assassins are headed towards us. She made to talk, but I interrupted her. And yes, doctor, I'm taking the deadly assassin with me. I opened the door to the cyber cafe and walked outside. Just as I'd expected, Artemis was waiting outside looking unsure. Hey, where are the others? They're yet to arrive. I left them rounding up the assassins at the school. Cool. I caught this one, and the virus upload was successful so the mission is complete. I stated and just to make her even more desperate. Can you imagine how much we can learn from her about the League of Shadows? Artemis made contact with Cheshire's eyes and Cheshire smiled knowingly. Artemis drew her bow. I can't let you take her in. She told me with her hands shaking. I tightened the hold on Cheshire and got into a ready stance. What do you mean by that Artemis? She closed her eyes. Please, Maelstrom. I'll... I'll explain it later, but you have to let her go. We faced off for a few seconds before I sighed and removed the zip ties from Cheshire's wrist and ankles. Luckily, I had anticipated all this, and the hits I had landed on her were not that hard. So after five minutes, she now had enough control of her limbs to move about. Cheshire got up and stretched, then she caressed my jaw with a smile on her face. You really did a number on me, darling. Don't. Artemis told her with a hard tone. Spoil sport. Cheshire muttered, blew me a kiss and escaped into the darkness. I turned around and started walking away. Wait. Artemis called out. Thank you. I owe you one. I nodded solemnly and continued inside the cafe. On my face, there was a small smile. Chapter 22. The Fog Final Part. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. Ever wonder how someone wakes up one day and just decides to be a modern take on a character from Peter Pan? I wondered aloud while floating around the air. Artemis weaved around the hook attacks while occasionally shooting out trick arrows. No clue. Maybe it's a cry for help. I chuckled while keeping watch. It wouldn't do for someone else to slip past us while we were occupied by. Hey, what's his name by the way? I casually asked as the metallic hook whizzed by my face. I clutched the chain and pulled the guy to me. His eyes widened and my fist impacted the hasty one hand block from his left arm. The bone snapped with an audible sound and he winced in pain, landing on the ground painfully. He tried to rise up but Artemis shot a few arrows around him that exploded with the force of a flash grenade, momentarily dazing him. She stepped closer and threw a roundhouse kick, sending him to dreamland. Artemis went towards the unconscious mercenary and hefted the huge hook while smiling at me. My mouth opened. No way. His name is Hook? That's like the most unoriginal name I've ever heard. Maelstrom, we need that back up now. Aqualad informed us. I looked at Artemis and she waved me off. I'll tie him up. My body turned and shot off towards the school building. I crashed through the skylight of the class and blocked the shuikins aimed at Dr. Rocket. They bounced to the side and I stepped in closer to a woman wearing a white creepy mask. Underneath her green costume, she had curves for days and was packing some dangerous weapons. I caught a glimpse of some kanai and knives strapped to her thighs when she flipped behind chairs for a modicum of cover. Aqualad was on the floor kneeling with one leg while breathing heavily. His water bearers were held loosely in his hands. I frowned at Aqualad's condition which was probably due to the poison on Cheshire's weapons. The only thing I didn't expect was the many passed out shadows inside the room. I frowned. This wasn't canon. In the original timeline, they had only been attacked by three villains. Could this be a butterfly effect due to my interference? Aqualad, are you hurt anywhere? I asked him through the link, while watching Cheshire carefully. The doctor and I are fine. Just be careful not to get pierced by any of their weapons. Especially hers. Miss M, could flash how are things on your end? There are way more shadows than we expected. We are currently occupied at the gym. Miss Martian told me through the link. Maelstrom. 
You need to take the doctor and go. I'll provide you with cover. I thought it through. I can carry you both. No one is getting left behind. Kid Flash, and I have the gym secured. If you can get here, we can regroup and come up with a plan. Miss Martian informed us. Well, well. And who might you be? Cheshire Cat brandished her sigh at me while stalking around us. I blinked, and the whole room was swarmed with over a dozen more figures dressed fully in black. You promised you would protect me. Rocket was shaking when she said this. Stay behind me, doctor. Artemis, I need you here. Coming. Nice get up. I have a question, though. What's with the creepy mask? If you ask me, it makes you less approachable. The assassins were patient, seemingly waiting for the signal from Cheshire. Ah, and I thought it was the best thing about me. I smirked. If you're going for the intimidating factor, sure. Personally, I'd like to see if your face matches your voice. Irresistible. Oh my, are you sure you should be flirting with the enemy? She asked me while twirling her sigh. Not really, but I won't tell if you won't. I'm in position above you. We need cover to relocate the doctor somewhere else. Okay. In one. Step aside then. I'd hate to ruin that perfect jawline. She crooned. Sorry, beautiful. Some other time. Arrows dug themselves around us, and I grabbed a hold of Aqualad and Dr. Rocket. The woman screamed in alarm as I flew us out through the skylight I'd broken through earlier. Artemis drew a few more arrows and let them loose inside the classroom, and then followed after us on the rooftop while I flew away to another section of the building. I held Rocket in my arms while Aqualad was floating beside me inside the bubble of air I had constructed to carry him. Miss Martian, where is the gym located? On your left. She answered and I changed my course. I looked back at Artemis and saw her running in our previous direction. She stopped a few times and shot arrows towards the shadows pursuing us. I'm gonna lead them away from you. They can't see you in the dark properly while you're in the air. She explained. That's a good idea. Hopefully by the time they realize it, we will be far away. I replied. Slight problem even if you bring Dr. Rocket here, she won't have access to a computer to finish creating the virus. Could voice something we had overlooked. Don't worry, I have a plan. We listened to Miss Martian's plan, and I remembered it as surprisingly the same plan that they had come up with in canon. Basically, Miss M changed her appearance to match Rocket while Aqualad and Kid Flash acted as guards. Meanwhile, I flew Rocket towards a cyber cafe in town to complete uploading the virus. Twenty minutes later, I was standing guard in front of Rocket as she hurried to finish the job. She breathed out a sigh of relief and smiled at me. It's done. My fingers went on my earpiece. Maelstrom to Robin. Do you copy? The virus is ready. Robin's voice came out hurried and urgent. Right on time. The fog is going for Wayne Industries. If they copy the information from their servers. It's going to be bad. His voice cut off. I'm going for the one controlling the fog. How many teeth should he be missing? I chuckled at Superboy's statement. Aqualad, did you get all of that? Yes, but be careful. The assassin in the white mask is probably headed your way. Artemis is in pursuit. I sighed and turned to Rocket. Stay behind me, doctor. Seems like it's not over. What? But, but I finished the virus. They have no reason to kill me now. She started panicking. Hey, hey. I held her shoulders. We promise to protect you. That hasn't changed. How touching. My hand shot out to hit the projectiles heading towards us out of the air. I waved a hand and a gust of wind threw back the second volley of shuriken. Relentless, aren't you? I commented. Cheshire lowered her body into a ready stance. I could say the same thing. But that's about to end. Rockhead is mine. It's too late. You were instructed to kill her to stop the fog from being rendered inert. It's already done. That means your mission has failed. Cheshire looked unsure. I don't believe you. I turned the monitor around and showed her the screen displaying a successful upload. Well, I'll be damned. It's not often I fail. Well played. She trailed off, wanting to know my name. Call me Maelstrom. She cocked her hip to the side. Maelstrom, huh? Cool name. Fits you perfectly. I'm... I held up her hand before she could introduce herself. A small smirk appeared on my face. No need. I'll find that out for myself during the interrogation. Instantly, she went on guard. Though from a lesser discernible eye, her body posture remained loose and relaxed. Confident you can take me down? I thought you were smart. I chuckled. Trust me, I'm not the dumb one here. You followed me alone. She sighed. Why are the cute ones so egotistical? Cheshire leaped over the table and palmed her canai. They left her hands and cut through the air with impeccable accuracy. For were aimed at my vital areas and two shot towards Rocket. A tornado appeared before us and pushed everything away. Computers, chairs, and papers alike. I grabbed Rocket and pulled her to my back away from the shuikens that dug themselves on the wall behind her. I said behind me, doctor. Not beside. A monitor was kicked at me and I swiped it away, sending it to smash through the glass door of the cafe. Cheshire had used that brief cover to pull in close to me. I lifted my leg off the ground, evading the leg sweep. She spinned around and threw one of her sayas at me. I grabbed it out of the air and returned the favor, sending it back at her. She quickly ducked by leaning her body backwards. The psi passed above her, curving a line across her mask and detaching it from her face. Then the psi planted itself on the wall behind her, digging in deeply into the bricks. Cheshire extended her body back completely and transitioned into a flip. Her eyes widened when she found me so close to her. My fist shot out before she could respond and landed on her left hand. 
Five more hits to her chi points and Cheshire slumped against me with zero control of her limbs. Oh my god. Did you kill her? Rocket came up from behind me and asked. Cheshire glared at me as I removed zip ties from my utility belt and fastened them on her wrist and ankles. How is she going to walk like that? She's not. I lifted Cheshire and held her close to me. Showing sympathy for the enemy doctor? You do know she tried to kill you a minute ago. Rocket started stammering upon my question. Still, that's, that's not ethical, putting a girl in such a position. I sighed. I'm an advocate for gender equality. Now stay here. I need to go out and look around to make sure none of those other assassins are headed towards us. She made to talk, but I interrupted her. And yes, doctor, I'm taking the deadly assassin with me. I opened the door to the cyber cafe and walked outside. Just as I'd expected, Artemis was waiting outside looking unsure. Hey, where are the others? They're yet to arrive. I left them rounding up the assassins at the school. Cool. I caught this one, and the virus upload was successful so the mission is complete. I stated and just to make her even more desperate. Can you imagine how much we can learn from her about the League of Shadows? Artemis made contact with Cheshire's eyes and Cheshire smiled knowingly. Artemis drew her bow. I can't let you take her in. She told me with her hands shaking. I tightened the hold on Cheshire and got into a ready stance. What do you mean by that Artemis? She closed her eyes. Please, Maelstrom. I'll... I'll explain it later, but you have to let her go. We faced off for a few seconds before I sighed and removed the zip ties from Cheshire's wrist and ankles. Luckily, I had anticipated all this, and the hits I had landed on her were not that hard. So after five minutes, she now had enough control of her limbs to move about. Cheshire got up and stretched, then she caressed my jaw with a smile on her face. You really did a number on me, darling. Don't. Artemis told her with a hard tone. Spoil sport. Cheshire muttered, blew me a kiss and escaped into the darkness. I turned around and started walking away. Wait. Artemis called out. Thank you. I owe you one. I nodded solemnly and continued inside the cafe. On my face, there was a small smile. Chapter 23. Tension and the talk. Colon, colon. Aiden's PV. Where is the girl? Was Rockhead's first question when I entered the cafe once again. Oh, you mean the assassin that was hired to kill you? Failed once and just kept on trying? That girl. I shot back, looking at her weirdly. Yes. What did you do with her? I rolled my eyes. She escaped. Some of the other masked ninjas attacked us, and during the commotion she slipped her bonds and ran away. The one who answered was Artemis, following me in. Rockhead looked skeptical. She adjusted her glasses while watching us with narrowed eyes. Really? But I didn't hear anything. They're ninjas. Their whole deal is being unseen and unheard. Look, doctor, I think your priorities need some reevaluating. I mean, I gestured at her. You survived an assassination from the League of Shadows. That's bragging rights in some circles. He's right. You held up pretty well, doctor. And the good thing is that the Shadows don't have a reason to come after you now. Plus, the Justice League will put surveillance on you for a certain amount of time to ensure you don't get attacked. Artemis followed up, trying to appease the doctor while also subtly changing the subject from the Cheshire thing. All in all, it's over. Rocket breathed out a sigh of relief and looked at us in gratitude. Thank you so much. I won't lie, since Red Arrow put me under your protection, I wasn't confident on seeing the next day. But you guys are pretty good. Almost as good as the Justice League. I smiled at the praise. Thank you. Heard that Artemis were practically as good as the League. I didn't say that. I said almost. The teen drama takes away a few points. Artemis laughed as I glared playfully at Rocket. Why'd you have to ruin it? The door to the cyber cafe opened and the rest of the team walked in barring Robin and Superboy. Wally glared at me which killed my mood and brought back some of the same frustration from earlier. What happened? Aqualad spoke up. Artemis and I looked at each other, and she stepped forward to update them on the Cheshire thing. You let her get away? Wally shouted at us. I crossed my hands on my chest. What are you talking about? I know you. There is no way she could have just escaped you like that. He came up to me and poked his finger on my chest. I was momentarily surprised at the unintentional praise. Still, I didn't like the way Kid Flash was pressing my buttons. My priority was on making sure Rocket was safe. Everything else came second. He frowned. Kid, that's enough. Dr. Rockhead is safe, which is the only thing that matters. Aqualad came between us. Teen drama. Yuck. Rockhead muttered while shivering into staste. Hello, Megan. Superboy and Robin just arrived with the bio ship. Miss Martian said happily and left the room. Everyone else cleared out leaving Kid Flash, Aqualad, and I a bit behind. Calder, we need to talk. I agree. The stoic teenager nodded. Let's do it after we arrive. Fine by me. I followed them out, got on the bio ship, and we all flew off. An hour later, after handing over Rocket to a League affiliate, I found myself standing before the three veteran sidekicks on the team. I looked at the others, Superboy, Gan and Artemis were no doubt on my side, but I didn't want their help in solving this small group squabble. Guys, could you excuse us for a bit? Aqualad asked them, and I nodded after they looked at me for confirmation. I don't like this. It feels like you're all ganging up on Aiden for no reason. Connor told them while leaving. We'll be right outside if you need us. Gan added and followed after Connor. Artemis looked at me and nodded. Thick tension permeated the room after they had left. I removed my visor and set it aside on the table as we all sat down. This can't go on. I started, holding up a hand to stop Wally's words. 
If you're expecting me to apologize for the things I said to Red Arrow, you're out of luck. You embarrass Speedy in front of everyone. Wally jumped up in fury. He's not a child, Wally. He can stand up for himself. Why are you fighting his battles for him? I asked him frowning at the younger boy. Because, it's always been a dream of ours to join the League together, and we have all worked so hard to make that happen. Aqualad answered. You don't know this because you just arrived recently, but getting to the point where our mentors trusted us enough to watch their backs and save civilian lives has not been easy. Robin's hands tightened into fists as he leaned forward on the table separating us. He picked up from Aqualad. You couldn't hope to understand our frustration. Imagine someone building up your hope for months on end. So you prepare yourself, polish your skills until bruises and blisters are a common thing every night you go to bed, and when the day arrives, bam, nothing changes. Speedy was even more dedicated than the rest of us. I know you think that we just let him walk over us, but you're wrong. Kid Flash stood up in anger. You judged him without even knowing him. How many times have you been in a room with or even interacted with Speedy for you to form such a harsh opinion about him? Frankly speaking, you are a newbie. He's better than you in every way possible, and if it came down to the two of you, I think you know who our first choice would be. Kid Flash spit out at my face. My mind was instantly assaulted with red-hot anger. This little shit. Wally, that's enough. Calder banged the table with his fist, leaving a dead in it as he addressed the speedster. You went too far, Maelstrom is still an integral part of this team, and I will not let you ruin that. We are here to settle the disagreement from earlier not to put him on trial. Even Robin looked shocked at Wally's words. Dude, that wasn't cool. Wally looked away while grinding his teeth. I breathed in to calm myself down and realized something, I wasn't right, but neither were they. Maybe calling out Red Arrow in front of everybody was the wrong thing to do, but the words I said to him weren't. I understood inconvenience, and that familiar hope that turns into disappointment more than most because, that is what my entire my background was like. So I might have jumped the gun and pegged Red Arrow the same as me and I how I used to lash out in the past. I haven't had an easy life, and that's all I'm going to say about it. I sighed, the anger slipping off my face as I turned to them, Ernest. Sometimes things don't work out and for a long while you're left feeling bitter at the world, which causes you to lash out on everybody and everything. The people closest to you get the blunt of it. No one interrupted me as I continued. When you're in a dark place, you try your best to pull yourself out from that hole because if you don't, it just gets deeper and deeper until one day, you wake up and find that all that bitterness and anger has changed you. I thought I was standing up for you guys. Standing up for the team against a bully. I thought I was trying to help knock some sense into Speedy because I can relate to that. Wait, what do you mean by that? Wally demanded. I clenched my jaw and debated on my next words. Things haven't been easy for me, but I'm trying my best to handle my shit the right way. The healthy way. By acknowledging that the situation sucks, but also understanding that the bad things won't last forever. That is what I was hoping to convince Speedy of. Robin had a suspicious look on his face while Wally looked like he didn't know what to say. Is everything okay, Maelstrom? Aqualad questioned with a little compassion. Don't worry. I have secrets that I am not ready to share yet, and that's besides the point. I just need you to know that. Anything I said wasn't out of malice. But I am not sorry for my words. Kid Flash looked ready to blow up again, but I motioned for him to wait. What I can apologize for, however, is for making you three feel bad. Aqualad nodded. It's a start. I apologize too for us putting you on the spot like that. Especially during the mission. We all clearly knew who he was referring to. That sort of behavior could have compromised the whole thing. Robin smirked. I don't have anything to say sorry for because I was a professional throughout the mission. Dude, I saw you throwing dirty looks at least twice. Wally butted in. Much to Robin's annoyance. I wasn't the one talking bad about him. Last time I checked that was you wall man. He said the last part derisively. Aqualad and I chuckled despite the mood. Things settled down and it was Wally's turn. The mad expression on his face had slipped off by then. He looked contemplative and unsure. His eyes never made contact with mine as he got up. I am sorry for saying all that awful stuff. They weren't true. Just wanted to make you feel bad. He made to leave the room. Wally. I called out to him. He looked back at me. It's okay. We're good. He smiled and made a thumbs up. The rest got up and left after a few fist bumps, leaving me alone in the room with my thoughts. So far I could say without a shadow of doubt, being in a team wasn't easy. Just as Rockette said, the drama was off-putting and unwelcome but sticking around was beneficial to me for now. My dream was to be the greatest hero this world had seen to change things for the better. That meant I needed the experience of working and learning tricks and trades from those who were more experienced before planning my next move. The one thing I promised myself while sitting in that room all alone was that the next team I would be in would have no drama and most importantly, would be under me. Chapter 24, Batman. Colon, colon. I'm back. Aiden's PV. Maelstrom, I need you in the hall, now. Batman's voice rang out through the whole gym from the PA system. Sweat was pouring down my skin in rivulets as I completed the set of crunches with a 50-ton weight dumbbell between my hands. Not even Batman was pulling me away from my gains. I had been at it for just an hour, having started early at 6 a.m. I completed the exercise and swiped a towel off the bench to wipe away the sweat. I didn't have time to actually take a shower without testing the Dark Knight's patience, so I left for the hall. On the hallway, I met up with Connor who was coincidentally going to the gym as I left it. He smirked at me. 
I feel like I should tell you. He doesn't look too happy. I scoffed. Is he ever? Connor laughed. That's a good point. See you later. I nodded and headed towards the hall thinking about what Batman wanted to see me for. Could it be because of the incident with Speedy? Did he want to reprimand me for my behavior? No, that didn't seem like something Batman would do. His policy was to always let the team solve its own issues. Then again, I was a wild card in his eyes. Maybe he didn't want me disrupting the peace or whatever. I arrived at the huge hall and my eyes were instantly pulled to the huge figure in all dark. Batman's costume never failed to impress me. It was bulky yet accentuated his fit physique and was intimidating. Very intimidating. Which I guess was the point. I cleared my throat while standing up straight behind him. He swiped the last of the file logs off the hologram projector and turned to me with a few documents in hand. Sir, I said in greeting. Maelstrom. He nodded at me. First of all, I want you to know that the League is impressed with the work you and your teammate have put in on your missions. Furthermore, the information you supplied about the threats to look out for has helped the League to plan out better strategies for handling them. I was stunned at the praise. Oh, thanks. It hasn't been easy, but I've learned a lot by being in this team, and it's all because you decided to give me a chance. So thank you too. The expression on his face didn't change, but I couldn't help but feel as if the air between us had grown more comfortable. There's a reason I wanted to meet with you today. He started, his voice as monotonous as ever. I sighed, my fears becoming confirmed. I was familiar with the tactic he had used, give praise before following it up with a reprimand. So I spoke up first before he could. Look, if it's about the issue from before, I talked with the rest about my behavior towards Red Arrow, and we solved it. So no need for the tongue lashing. That man narrowed his eyes. I was going to say, I have processed your identification papers. All preparations have been made for you. Connor and Gan to join Happy Harbor High School. You will be starting soon. Batman concluded. Oh. I was embarrassed at jumping to conclusions. Of course Batman wouldn't care. I mean he would but as long as our arguments did not disrupt the team's concentration during training or missions he would rather leave it to us to work it out amongst ourselves. In addition, I have thought about your proposal to pursue your hobbies. He told me, referring to the writing thing. The answer is yes, but I will vet any material you wish to produce before you post it out to the world. His tone turned harsher. All privileges will be revoked if you abuse this chance, Maelstrom. Don't disappoint me. I nodded in confirmation. I would still have done it even without his permission, but this way was better. He placed the documents on the table and addressed me. That's all. You're dismissed. I gave him a curt nod and left while studying the documents. There was a birth certificate, passport, and everything else I needed to present in a legal format. I took the documents to my room, took a shower to get rid of the slight sweat, and started making music. I had roughly 20-plus hit songs that I had managed to write down from my memory. The equipment I had was good enough for me to start my plans. All I needed was a good camera with the leftover money I had and then I could begin recording myself while singing covers. Although this world's entertainment industry was different to my last, that was only in the case of different musicians and songs. The styles were a bit similar yet with a different tonal flavor. To ingratiate myself into the scene, I decided to start slow by making covers to this world's best songs but with an exotic air to it. Settling on that plan, I used my laptop to window shop for great recording devices that weren't too expensive. The specs on some were crazy. Especially LexCorp stuff. Wayne Industries provided products that were good quality but aimed towards the common man, but LexCorp catered for the specialists. Meaning high-end stuff for people who had the money and need to purchase that equipment. Equipment that included micro cameras with a strong battery life and could store loads of footage, drones outfitted with surveillance tech that I'm not sure how Luther managed to get the government to allow out into the public and lots more. I settled on a good camera that was a lot higher than my budget but was great for recording. The money I had on me was just $100, having spent the rest on a few other important stuff. Basically, I needed my laptop to be secure from tampering with, so I had upgraded its security measures by installing the best antivirus and anti-spyware software I could afford. LexCorp's stuff still turned out to be the best. I had the idea to ask Robin for help, but that would give the impression I had something to hide, which I did. And one of the boy wonder's weaknesses or strengths depending on the situation was trying his best to dig for information. For now, I was content with whatever modicum of security my laptop had. I had plans for some under-the-table high-specs upgrading once I got the money for it. One might wonder why I was so concerned with ensuring privacy. Easy, I needed to contact some. Interesting characters who would be able to analyze the vial of cobra venom I had to see if a stronger version of the same serum could be made. That was far off into the future, however. I had no doubt I would need the power especially with the threat the light presented. Unfortunately, that meant tippy-toeing and hiding my actions from the Justice League and the rest of the team. Luckily, I now had a viable reason for Batman to ease off my back whenever I decided to travel out of town. I'd just give him a spiel about music or something and I would be golden. Not really. Batman was a bad case of suspicion coupled with constant vigilance. I was sure he wouldn't lessen his watch on me, but that was good too. I was expecting it which meant I could control what he could more or less see. That was one of the reasons I had pushed really hard to get his approval in following my hobbies and talents. I love music and writing, that much is true, but that would come second to heroing and to do that. I needed a life outside the cave to set the foundation for what I wanted to achieve. 
money for my projects and fame for protection through public adoration which would make it easier to get contacts and provide a good cover for my extracurricular activities. It was all a rough draft but something I was working towards. Which leaves me with looking FO away to earn money quickly again. All things considered, underground fights were still my go-to. Just spending less than two hours had netted me $5,000, how much more could I get if I was serious about it? A lot more I'm sure. The problem is, I couldn't go to Gotham again. I was 100% sure that Batman would find me out this time. Before I had arrived at the hall for our meeting a half hour ago, he had been going through the cave's file logs. Which meant, he must have seen my usage of the Zeta Beam tube to go to Gotham. This time he didn't ask about it, but he would no doubt be keeping an eye on me. That left going to other cities. Luckily, I had the perfect idea. L.A was a cultural hub for music and entertainment. Plus, Batman already knew that it was where I was from in my real earth. I could use that excuse of reconnecting with my roots to hit some of the illegal underground fights there and make money. Happy with the plan, I left my room and flew towards the gym for some power training. I had unlocked the next subskill which was sound. This just further showed me how my bending was different from the avatars. There wasn't sound bending from what I knew. Then again, I couldn't say I knew everything about avatar. This just showed that I could even be wrong about the other elements' subskills. The most probable conclusion was that my avatar system was different from the power system of the avatar world. Benders used their chi to manipulate the elements and bending moves were essential to direct those same elements. However, my case was different. For starters, I didn't use my chi to bend. My whole body, essence, soul and everything was connected with the avatar system which acted as the medium to process energy from the bleed to allow me to bend. That was why, upon hitting master level in air bending, stances and moves that had been crucial before were now not needed. Secondly, the avatar had access to all the elements from the word go even if they didn't have good control over them. My case was different. The system was built up on a leveling foundation where I had to master an element first before unlocking another. Air element. Master. Flight. Unlocked. Sound. Unlocked. So I only had to master the sound subskill then get my air mastery to grand master level and then I would have access to the next element. Chapter 25. Insight. Colon. General PV. Batman was busy combing through surveillance footage from the street cameras in a certain section of Gotham. He narrowed his eyes once he saw a hooded figure leave a building and head towards a certain direction. That figure was Aiden. Well, did you find anything out? Batman asked the darkness inside the Batcave. The shadows rippled and Martian Manhunter's form appeared. No. My efforts failed. Batman didn't say anything for a few seconds while Manhunter came out closer into the light. You're unsure. Conflicted. Batman observed making Manhunter look at him in surprise. How did you? That's not important, John. Speak your mind. What I am doing is breaking one of the greatest moral laws from my culture. It is unethical to pry into the thoughts of unsuspecting victims. Batman's attention turned to John Johns fully. You understand why. The situation demands it. Before we confirm the veracity of the information he has given us, all we can do is sit tight and make loose plans. I understand, my friend, but that does not mean I have to like it. Manhunter told him. Batman nodded while switching focus of the cameras. There is another problem. Manhunter fell silent to see whether his teammate was listening. Go on. The Dark Knight responded, his hand stalling in place. His mind... It's adapting to every intrusive action I make to access his core memories. He is learning fast. Almost as fast as an actual telepath. It is strange and I fear given enough time, his mind might manifest telepathy as a power. Is that so? Batman pulled up a few medical records on the back computer. They were records about Aiden's physiology from the Star Labs checkup he'd done a few weeks ago. His body is highly adaptable to any changes. Upon using the Blockbuster formula, he got access to all the benefits minus the changes in body shape that had affected Dr. Desmond. If you're right about his psychic potential then that ability seems to not only affect his physical body but also extends to the mental aspect. Batman concluded. Remarkable. Indeed. Batman surprisingly agreed. Any progress in finding out a way back to his world? Batman shook his head. Maybe. I'm chasing down a few leads but nothing concrete. Zatara has ruled out magic being the cause for his arrival. We know that it's possible to traverse long distances given the presence of spatial devices like the Zeta tubes but the science behind dimensional crossing is uncharted territory as of now. So a wait and see approach. Manhunter asked. Yes. Manhunter looked off towards a shadow in the room and a small smile appeared on his face. Have a good night, Bruce. He nodded at Batman and left, disappearing through the walls of the Batcave. The dark night was silent for a while. How much of that did you hear? A figure detached from the shadows and crossed its hands. Dick Grayson, better known as Robin, stared at his minner with a frown on his face. Enough to know that you're hiding something from me. I'm not hiding anything. You're the one who eavesdropped on a conversation you were not meant to be a part of. Robin saw he wasn't getting through to Batman, so he decided to change tactics. If it's about the team, then I have the right to know. You're the one always telling me that every single detail matters. I need to know what's going on for the team. Go to sleep. If it's essential, I will inform you. Saying that, Batman ignored him. Dick looked at his mentor's back feeling frustrated. His gaze was drawn to the huge computer and a smile worked its way to his face. It wouldn't be the first time. He muttered to himself and laughed. Elsewhere. How's the team working out for you? 
Flash asked his protege. They were devouring donuts on the roof of the Central City Hospital. They were there mostly for the pediatric unit of the hospital. The kids always loved to see a real-life superhero, and it made the Scarlet Speedster happy putting the smiles on their faces. Oh, it's so great. We get to go on these covert missions. I already knew that, Wally. I'm asking about you know, the dynamic between you guys. Wally took a bite of his donut and thought about it. We work together really well. Every mission we've been in hasn't gone according to plan, but my friends have had my back and me theirs, which is why we haven't failed yet. To tell you the truth, we're awesome. Barry smiled, proud at Kid's heartfelt answer. Plus, Miss Martian is so hot. And he's back, Barry thought. A few days later. Aiden, Wally, you're up. Black Canary informed us. Oh yeah, I'm gonna show you all my killer moves. Wally stated, throwing the Snickers bar wrapper on the floor. Red Tornado will have your head if you leave that lying around. Connor told him while I stretched out my body. The thing about Kid is that while he's fast, coordinated, and has super reflexes, his mind is scattered, attention easily broken, and an absolute sucker for faints. I stepped up to the sparring floor. The floor itself was made with a light yet durable material that prevented grievous injuries while still delivering the same oath. One might expect in a fight. The cave's computer system operated a program that showed hit points whenever someone was successfully taken down while the combatants were both standing on the platform. How about you give up, dude? You might be strong, but I'm faster, and you know what they say, in a fight speed is king. He informed me in his usual arrogant way, but underneath that bravado, Wally was watching me attentively, showing me that he had no doubt learned from all our previous matches. I felt like rolling my eyes. Remind me, how many times have we fought, and how many times have you lost? Everyone chuckled. Do those don't count. The situations were completely different. What's wrong, Wallman? You looking a little distraught. Maybe you should get trot. Everyone around us groaned at the drop of my words while Robin chuckled. Well done, my young Padawan. He bowed towards me while I smiled. God, Aiden, I can't believe you would make such a lame. Now, the distraction was successful. The gust of wind I had been priming around me roiled around my body as an outburst of the air element occurred behind, pushing my body forwards at crazy high speed. Wally smirked and evaded my attack. I knew you would try something like that. He told me while smiling victoriously. I didn't say anything, electing to stay silent and instead attacked once more. Say what you will about Kid Flash, but he's powerful. All speedsters are. We traded blows. My punches shadowing his as he stepped back and evaded direct body hits, knowing that would take him down easily. He used his speed quite efficiently as well that even at an expert level in chi blocking I couldn't beat him easily. Anyone else from the team would be hard-pressed except for Superboy who could shrug off hits like they were mere love taps. I studied Kid's movements as we fought. My foot whipped out into a round kick that he ducked under, sweeping my leg out in the process. I used a hand to stabilize myself on the ground and lashed out with the back of my foot grazing him on the shoulder while I jumped back to my feet. Wally winced and rolled his hand. I'll get you for that. I beckoned him with a hand. The next second a whirlwind picked up as Wally decided to go all out in the speed department. I felt hit snake around my guard and land on my body from many directions. Just like I'd wanted. I closed my eyes and spread out my senses. Due to Wally's speed, the air was in a tumultuous state. My eyes were not yet powerful enough to keep up with the speedster, but I had been trying something else to combat them. Taking advantage of my ability to seemingly adapt to anything, I decided to start sensing the vibrations in the air and try to reconfigure an image of the scene in my head, effectively seeing without my eyes. A knockoff magic sense. Did he just close his eyes? Connor's voice reached me as I concentrated outwards. The progress in that skill had been minimal before. Then I got sound as a subskill and the progress had shot through the roof. There. It wasn't a clear picture, but I felt a body move through the air in a fast speed towards me. The air vibrated around the moving form, giving me a somewhat clear picture of Wally's movements. I slid to the side at the last minute while my foot snaked out and tripped my opponent. Wally slammed onto the ground and bounced out of the sparring floor. Winner, Maelstrom. The computer announced. Oh man. That makes it five wins for me and two for you, Wally. I gloated a little while giving him a hand. He grabbed it and jumped up. Dude, for a minute there, I felt this weird vibration all around me. That's what distracted me. A vibration, huh? Black Canary asked while coming towards us. I scratched my head and looked at her helplessly. She nodded, understanding I didn't want anyone overhearing. Okay, guys. This wraps up the spar. Onto the obstacle course. I want to see those personal records broken. She announced. The rest made their way to the course while Canary and I were left standing alone. I felt the same thing Kid Flash did. My med gene allows me the ability to create ultrasonic sound waves that can split apart organic or inorganic materials. That allows me to be highly sensitive to vibrations of that kind. She explained. And the vibrations I felt coming off you were eerily similar. It's a new facet of my air elemental abilities. As my control over the element increases I find myself getting access to what I have termed as subskills. The first was flight and recently sound. Canary whistled in appreciation. That's a nifty ability you have. I chuckled. Yeah, I guess. The problem is practicing them enough that I can incorporate each new subskill into my fighting style efficiently without throwing the whole rhythm off. She nodded in understanding. I think I understand. As a martial arts master, it wasn't easy combining all those different set moves into a unified whole, 
where my body could instantly react to a blow without conflicting styles coming in the way. I have an idea. Hope bloomed in my chest. I had debated actually asking her for some lessons, but here she was, about to do it herself. I could show you some tips on how to control your sonic abilities. I smiled. Thank you. I would appreciate that a lot. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this journey, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please drop a comment down below.